What's up guys? It's yo boy on the Sensei back with Reborn as the Ant King in MHA. Mecha X Solo Leveling, Part 5. If you enjoy my content, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. POV narration. Mirko didn't like the way that villain had escaped her. She was disappointed, but her will to become stronger was only ignited. She was even mad at herself for considering that waiting for reinforcements was a good idea. She was the type to act alone usually, but the amount of damage Barry did to their surroundings was what made her somewhat panic. And she regretted not just fighting him with all that she had. She realized that the man was about as powerful as her and extremely skilled. But she didn't expect his ability to shake off his pursuers was also that great. She genuinely couldn't even find a trace of him after turning a few corners. It was as if he had vanished in thin air. I mean, he technically did. That made her both mad at herself and interested in the new villain group that had just popped up in Japan. The news of their appearance spread throughout the country. Their bold heist and power were displayed for the world to see. But no one talked about the villains actively avoiding casualties. That was because villains were evil, and such a thing wasn't possible in the eyes of the public. Beru was a special case. But the police knew it. So did Mirko herself. They also realized that the villains wouldn't end their career with just that. As of now, they spotted two powerful individuals in that group. One being the presumed leader. He had a metal manipulation quirk that ruined quite a bit of the infrastructure underneath the ground during this event. And the other was the gigantification quirk villain. He seemed to be able to grow both his body and limbs to a greater extent than even Mount Lady. A hero with a very similar quirk. What was even more astonishing, his quirk seemed to allow him to have a monstrous amount of strength, to the point where he could equal the no.13 hero Mirko. The investigators weren't able to find anything about the group, but they could tell that they were foreigners, and they knew that said foreigners entered the country through illegal means. Otherwise, they'd at least have some profile for them. For now, they were just known as the foreign criminals. The media could also tell that the group was mostly comprised of foreigners, and they obviously reported on that. Citizens countrywide were shocked at the boldness of this attack, as well as the strength of the villains, but they weren't worried at all. They had the symbol of peace on their side, after all, not only that, but they also had a hero of about the same level of strength as the symbol. Beru was well recognized for his monstrous strength, he had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the symbol at a young age. And now, they knew for sure that he was on their side. Psych, the festival, however, continued. Toga had actually lost in the first round of the tournament. She had just answered a question from someone, and she was mind-controlled to walk off the stage. It was really frustrating for her. Beru just found it amusing though. She had already made it really far in his opinion, so he didn't care. He also knew how strong she was, her opponent just happened to be a bad matchup. Nothing really interesting happened in the tournament besides that. There were a few interesting fights, like Bakugo and Shoto or Izuku and Shoto. But, overall, he wasn't really all that interested in the tournament. 13 did chastise him for being away an entire hour. At first, Beru wanted to say that he had diarrhea or something. But Lunch Rush was present, and Beru didn't want to insult the man's food. So, he was forced to say that he got distracted on his way to the toilet. Which was a shitty, hard explanation, but it worked. The rest of the day also passed quickly. Taking Toga out for ice cream was also quite uneventful. The two of them just hung around each other for a few hours, and went back home to continue hanging around each other. But, after some time, Beru decided that he should visit his friend now. He also hadn't seen Kota in quite a while and he didn't have much else to do. EOV Beru. Damn, Nao's crib is just as great looking as I remember it. It's certainly been a few weeks. I'm sure Code has missed me. I knocked on the door with happy thoughts in my head. I waited around for a bit. I could hear someone dragging a chair around. Then I heard the door unlock. The door was opened by none other than Kota. Again. Why are you always opening the door to strangers? He never actually learns Uncle Beru. You're not a stranger. Please don't call me uncle. You're hurting me more than all for one. Could I guess people my age get sensitive about their age? It's understandable really, even a man child like myself would at least feel somewhat conscious about it. Come in. Mom and dad are taking a shower what? Together. With the kid at home? Well, I guess as long as they don't make too much sound, they can play with their water guns as much as they want still. Didn't know now was this sneaky. Is he giving little Coda a sibling? I could look and find out. But I do respect the privacy of my friend. Sure kid, let's watch some TV really loud cartoons or something. I walked in and sat on the couch with Coda. I have extremely good hearing, and the cartoons being loud will distract me from the muffled moaning. This time, I don't feel the need to raid Now's fridge. So I'll just watch some TV for a few minutes well. The few minutes turned into around 45 minutes. Are they practicing the entire Kama Sutra scripture in there? What the fuck? Well, I guess I'll speak to Kota a bit more, he's been pretty transfixed on his cartoons. But I'm sure he doesn't mind some distraction. So how's school been? Ash, I'm sure you've started kindergarten already. Kota looked at me with a smile. It's really fun. I get to play around with so many people. He continued to go on about his kindergarten adventures for a while. 
Apparently, he's making friends without any issue. Other kids actually look up to him since his parents are heroes. Eventually, Koda's parents decided to come out of the shower. They came down the stairs already dressed and speaking about making dinner or something like that. Now did notice me sitting on the couch though. He looked quite petrified. Um, since when have you arrived? He asked with a bit of sweat on his brow. Mayor, a few minutes no need to make him more uncomfortable. Oh, Uncle Beru has been sitting with me and watching cartoons for at least an hour. Koda doesn't seem to have the same inhibitions though. His father turned red and coughed a bit. Are we well? I hope you weren't too inconvenienced by that. Miss Izumi was also pretty embarrassed. I guess they both know that I have great is. Nah, it's fine, how's about dinner? No need to keep embarrassing them with this shit. Now and I spoke while Koda helped his mother make dinner. We chatted about random things and other things that we went through recently. I didn't speak much about acting as a villain though. Still, now felt the need to give me a little warning. Beru, I looked into the Public Safety Commission. I don't really like what I found. I know that you don't have all that many choices. But I advise you to proceed with caution. I already know that my partnership with this shady organization is a crapshoot. But even if things sour between me and them, they still can't do anything to me. But still, I will proceed with caution. If they ever end up threatening me with my friends though I might just commit a few crimes, one of them starts with Gino and ends inside. I'll be careful thanks for the concern, it's nice to have someone that cares about you. Moments like these remind you that you aren't really alone. The rest of the dinner went by uneventfully. I ended up leaving later in the evening, as I didn't want to bother them the entire night. I shook hands with Nao and walked away. Upon reaching my room, I could see quite the mess around. This implies that Toga once again forgot to fold her clothes, and she ran off to do something else. It got me a bit curious. I guess I'll look for her after cleaning up a bit, too big a mess can be bothersome. POV narration. While Beru was spending his time with Nao and his family, Toga was bored out of her mind. She wanted to do something productive with her time, internships were going to start soon, and she had the opportunity to enter the hero course too. She was not interning with anyone, but a teacher had volunteered to train her, to help her become a hero. She took that offer in stride. She realized that, while Beru was there for her, she would also need to deal with her own issues from time to time, which lead to her spontaneous decision to strive towards becoming a hero. Now, Toga wasn't exactly keen on the idea of being a hero. She didn't like the way some of them carried themselves. But, much like Beru, she didn't actually care all that much. She figured that she'd be able to draw blood from people quite frequently if she was to become one. So, it was decided that she was to be trained by none other than Azala, the teacher that had fought by her side during the USJ incident. He was a good fit for her because their strength was similar, and neither of them relied on their quirk much when fighting. Well, Izawa was still a bit stronger physically than her. But that was to be expected, he was an adult after all. Still, the difference wasn't all that great. For all of Beru's efforts to hold back and limit himself, he could never be a great sparring partner for Toga. Even if he didn't use any hardening quirk and limited himself, punching and kicking him felt like hitting a wall of steel. And injuries didn't faze him at all. Fights with him were satisfying for Toga, but she couldn't learn as much as she was learning with Izawa. Izawa sparred with Toga for quite a while. The both of them weren't only using their bodies, Toga used a dull training knife, and Azawa used his carbon fiber capture weapon. Their spa was quite one-sided at first, as Toga didn't really know much about his fighting style. But after a minute or two, she managed to catch on to a few of his movements. She was truly a fast learner, even astonishing Azawa with her perceptive nature and analytical style of fighting. She seemed to constantly adjust her stance to fit the opponent she faced. Izawa had seen that before while she was fighting Beru, and he knew of her strengths. Still, seeing her fight with Beru made him pity her. It was a really unfair bout, no matter how much the insectoid held back. That was Izawa's opinion anyway. Beru was, by all definitions, a force of nature. Izawa knew for a fact that nothing alive in their era could match him in strength. The only people that would have a chance to match him were the next generations. All of the teachers knew that. But, one would expect a person, especially a young man, with that type of strength to never bother training in a fighting style. Who would need one when you can end everything in one move? But that wasn't the case with Beru. Izawa had seen it himself, Beru seemed to be proficient in both boxing and grappling. He didn't even know where Beru had the time to become so skilled in those fighting styles. But, seeing as Beru had no formal education in anything, Izawa could somewhat understand where the insectoid would find such time. The teachers found his lack of education to be quite tragic. But Beru seemed to be able to read and write without much issue. He even knew English perfectly, which made some of the teachers think that he had received some form of private education. Although, all might really doubt it all for one would give Beru such privileges. Teacher, let's go again. Toga recovered her stamina much faster than the tired Azawa. Still, the man could only sigh and get back up. He had been the one that proposed the training. He couldn't just slow it down when Toga was making such amazing progress. So, he got back up, wiped his sweat, and prepared for another fight. That was when Beru finally decided to show up. Damn, why are you two so hot and sweaty? With his usual sense of humor and inappropriate comments, Izawa found him irritating. But Beru's mannerisms could still amuse Izawa sometimes. Especially when in coordination with a few other colorful characters, Midnight. Toga seemed pretty excited to see Beru. Mr. Izawa has been teaching me about heroes and sparring with me. 
She was quick to respond. Beru's obviously perverse jokes seemed to go right over her head, at least on the surface. She had spent enough time near the insectoid to know that such jokes were part of his daily routine. Toga jumped towards Beru and hugged him. Well, she also managed to hit her head on his chest, which made her a bit dizzy. Beru just laughed a bit and patted her on the back a few times. Seems like you've been working hard since when do you want to be a hero? Beru never expected someone with Toga's background to gain an interest in heroism, but he could somewhat guess her reasons. A steady supply of victims, villains, in this case, I guess, was something like a dream for Toga. Since yesterday, imagine all the villains I would be able to cut up. She gave Beru a sweet smile as Azawa just looked on with a weird gaze. EOV Beru. So how's Toga faring Azawa? This is kind of a surprise. She is very talented. I'd say she's learning much faster than I expected. But even that would be an understatement. Izawa, still bothered by Toga's sound reasons to become a hero, composed himself and answered, I must say, I am really glad to see Toga trying her best to live her life and fulfill her desires through legal means. In other words, not gutting random people on the streets, as I've said, I believe in her quite a lot. I don't think she's really fit for a life of crime. Or, I don't think it will truly be fulfilling in any way. Maybe the thought that she could cut up anybody and everybody whenever she wanted attracted her to that lifestyle. But that's not even true for villains. The vast majority of them trade their lives for a moment of pleasure. They live the rest of their pathetic existences in constant pursuit, and always end up in a cell. Or dead. I don't want something like that for her. I know that she can do better than that. At first, I was just thinking of this as a charitable act. Maybe the fact that I found her to be quite cute helped. But, I ended up actually caring about her. Strange how that works. I've never had any proper family, in this life or the last. Togo is the first person I'd consider family. She's kinda like a little sister. Brash and annoying at times, cute and sporadic. Oh, and absolutely insane. All of the qualities of a great sibling. All jokes aside, she has her flaws, obsessive nature. Not the blood thin G. And I have mine, too many to fucking list. But I still think this is the most perfect relationship I've ever had, not in the romantic sense though, she's still a teenager. Well I guess I can leave you guys to it if you want me to or I can just hang around and watch you two comma I said as Toga finally departed from me. She also seems to have somewhat recovered from hitting her head on my exoskeleton. She's done that a surprisingly few amount of times honestly. How about you actually get ready for your patrol? Did you forget that you're supposed to take Midoriya in as your intern? Izawa looked at me with a slanted gaze. Of course, I didn't forget now if you'll excuse me I turned around to leave. EOV narration. Beru obviously forgot about internships. So did the author cause he's a prick, shut up. I made you, narrator versus author battle. He quickly scrambled back to the dormitory, completely ignoring Toga's amused gaze that was directed at his back. She could also tell that Beru wasn't the type to remember appointments and other things of that nature if they didn't interest him all that much. She returned to sparring with Izawa, who could just sigh a bit at Beru's irresponsibility. So, Beru was left alone in his room, the shed room I guess, to contemplate exactly what a patrol is supposed to be. Did he need to walk around randomly on the streets? That was boring, and somewhat unproductive. And also, he needed some knowledge on the patrol paths of other heroes so they don't intertwine with Beru's leaving spots unpatrolled in the process. Beru quickly discovered that planning a proper patrol would take a while of learning a city in the streets that each hero was patrolling. So, he did the best thing he could, and something he was quite proficient in. Procrastination. Smart move, Beru completely gave up. His train of thought is, tomorrow's problems are for tomorrow me. He would later regret his lack of planning. But that was, again, not today Beru's problem. EOV Beru. Now, I guess I should be waiting for that kid to make his way towards UA. I mean, Toshi said that Izuku is his successor, and I did accept to train him. Maybe I shouldn't use the first day of the internship for a patrol. I think controlling his quirk should come first, and being in UA while that is happening might be the most beneficial. I mean, at least there's Recovery Granny here. I've still yet to try and copy her quirk, but I'll eventually. Maybe I'll coax her and cooking me some pie, and she'll leave a strand of hair in there or something. Toga is currently training with Izawa and that student that beat her in the festival. He seems really similar to Izawa, two peas in a pod, as some would say, same tired eyes and lifeless disposition. Well, at least the kid has some spark in him. Izawa seems to only find enjoyment in seeing the next generation of heroes improve at this point, and that's quite a bit tragic. I think she's quite excited about fighting me after she improves a little. I should expect a lot of spas soon. Sir, I've arrived. Hum. The green-haired kid bowed his head and looked back up in quick succession. Since when has this kid been standing here? Is he some kind of stealth master or did I really just don't pay attention to him? Great want a trophy. He looked down at the ground for a bit, seemingly embarrassed. I kinda wanted to see how he'd react to that. Now, my behavior might be a bit rude, but I want to know what type of person he is. And from that answer, lack of answer I guess. I can at least tell that he has some confidence issues, and is quite introverted. Well, the muttering to himself might also be a giveaway. As sorry if I was late apologizing for no reason to. I didn't even specify an hour if he showed up at midnight. I wouldn't even be able to complain. That's the fault of my lackluster planning and lack of interest. He sweated a bit, not really knowing how to respond to that. I need to do something about his confidence because I really doubt he will get far with that little trust in himself. 
Hey, kid wanna go pick up chicks? This is a method I'd often use to build up confidence for any newbie member that Vlad, old boss, assigned me to train. It worked well every time. I blew what? Weren't we supposed to be training my quirk? He asked in a panic manner. His red face says it all. Not much action. Huh? Well, I guess you're still young. He turned even redder at my words. Wait, I might have forgotten to take into account the difference in cultures here. I think standing near Namuri skewed my perception of how open the people here are to relationships. Um, he's really stuck I guess this isn't a great method of training him. Maybe he'll build more confidence as he gets stronger. Whatever let's go to Jim Gamma. I walked the both of us there. He stumbled and fell to the ground. I don't think he was prepared for that teleportation. Sorry. He quickly got up and looked around. I think he recognizes this place. Explain exactly how your quirk works, comma, I said as I sat down and looked at him. W.L., from All Might's words, it's a stockpiling quirk that gets stronger the more time passes, and the more people have possessed it, that's really bare bones. But I guess that would mean he has the potential to become stronger than All Might was, which is quite great. This also means that his quirk is really similar to All For Ones, which, by Kaidai's notes, is an accumulation type quirk. All For One accumulated strength by taking quirks, and Izuku's quirk accumulates strength the more time passes. That's interesting so you have trouble controlling that much power I assume. Why does he get ashamed so easily? Didn't Toshi say that he only got this quirk like a few weeks back? Hell, I barely knew shit about my quirk the first few years. He's already made a lot of progress by not breaking both his arms in that tournament. Yes, I can't properly use it without getting hurt. The issue of his self-confidence can be addressed at other times I guess. Simply put you don't know how to control the output of strength that the quirk has. He looked at me for a bit, then nodded. It's not that he can't use the quirk, he just can't control the amount of strength it gives him. And he ends up hurting himself in the process. Can't say I can relate to that but I guess I can help him gain some perspective. I'm somewhat of a quirk stealer myself after all. Well, he didn't steal it. But whatever, let's put it this way. Your body is a shot glass, and your quirk is a bottle of whiskey without a good pouring cap. He looked a bit oddly at me, but still nodded. The energy and strength your quirks gives you is the whiskey, and your body can only take as much as a shot glass can fit so. Try to test your limits a bit slowly pour out some power. Carefully and cautiously comma I said, as I waved my hands around a bit. Careful not to spill any whiskey. The glass might even break in your case. He looked a bit anxious. Nervous might be the right word, actually. W what if I fail? For fuck's sake just do it. Doesn't matter it's part of life, I'm sure you'll be able to pour whiskey like a professional bartender in no time if you believe in yourself. He still seemed a bit weirded out by my explanation. But he tried anyway. Don't bother with only one arm spread it out evenly in your body that way. You'll be able to draw a bit more power. He looked at me and nodded quickly. He closed his eyes and trembled a bit. For a split second, red veins spread around his body. But they instantly disappeared. I I can't do it if only I could roll my eyes. You did it for a really short time his eyes widened in excitement. I could see a bright smile spread on his face. I'm guessing he managed to draw a bit of power. But was afraid to draw more and hurt himself. There is also that strange sense of inadequacy that I seem to get from him. I think you have the wrong perception about something here. Though he looked up at me for a bit. His excitement that was already dying out got replaced by confusion. You don't really think of that quirk as yours do you? He trembled a bit. I could see his gaze return to the ground. His reaction is something I expected. I also had these thoughts at some point. Stuff like all these quirks aren't really mine. Stupid thoughts that will only slow you down. I got rid of them quite quickly. But that was because I frankly didn't care all that much. So what if they aren't mine? I still have them. I be well it's all might's kuo come on. None of that shit it's in you. It's yours now. As you earned that bottle of whiskey. No matter what your insecurities tell you. He scratched the back of his head with a bit of an awkward gaze. But I'm sure there might have been people that deserved it more than me. Kid none of that matters. No one gives a shit Toshi chose you. So it's yours. He still seemed quite unconvinced. But he's not really the same as me. I don't really have problems with my confidence. Look maybe it's a bit soon for me to change your mind. But you will change it by yourself in the future. Let's continue to draw on that power. Until you become more comfortable using it. He just nodded and closed his eyes again. This time, a green glow surrounded his body. Again, for a few seconds. Before it disappeared. I quickly rubbed my knuckles on the top of his head. Don't let go of it so quickly. He recoiled in pain. But I need to motivate him to hold that form properly. Try again. I said as I crossed my arms and watched him intently. We continued that routine for the entire day. And, surprisingly, by the end of it, he could hold that form for 10 minutes. It took me by surprise as he basically jumped from 10 seconds to 10 minutes almost instantly. But I guess he's been experiencing that feeling the entire day. So he got accustomed to it. Well then good job you can now minimally control your strength. It's not yet perfect. And it hasn't been tested in a fight. But it's huge progress compared to the beginning of the day. Actually, it's quite surprising. Makes me think this kid is a lot more talented than he lets on. He just had a relieved smile on his face as he blinked a bit and passed out. I didn't bother catching him. Falling on the ground out of tiredness is actually a pretty good feeling. I let him lay there for a bit. But I got curious about something. I plucked a strand of his hair and just ate it. I kinda want to see if my quirk acts the same with all accumulation type powers. And, after a minute of not noticing any change in my overall strength, I realized that it certainly didn't copy the built-up power that the quirk had. That fact didn't really bother me. 
I don't even want more strength. I mean, what am I supposed to do with it anyway? It's just a minimal boost at best. All Might in his prime might have been quite a bit physically stronger than me, but I am quite confident in my speed, which I've yet to meet someone to match. At this point, I can basically instantly kill anyone and anything that doesn't have godly regeneration, which I also have. Still, this means that taking accumulation quirks is quite useless for me. Not that I'm too interested in quirks at this point, it's just good to know about my own limitations. No quirk is supposed to be perfect after all. And, while I do have quirks to make up for just about any weakness, some things can't really be changed. Like the fact that my lack of care is probably going to get Toshi's successor to catch a cold. I really should get into the infirmary. But I really doubt Recovery Granny is there. Not that she'd be much help when considering how her quirk works. I guess I'll just put him on a bed in there or something. A purplish mist came out of my body and swallowed the both of us as I grabbed him and threw him over my shoulder. I walked us in the infirmary room and just put him on the bed. When I turned around, all I could see was a small, syringe design cane coming towards my face. Recovery Granny, going against all of my impressions about her age, had jumped a whopping one and a half meters into the air and smacked her cane into my forehead. She was about to fall. But I caught her and placed her on the ground, never harm the elderly. Why do you always bring people here? Gee, she's angry. Although some of her anger disappeared when I placed her on the ground. Sorry, but he's not injured, he's just tired. My answer calmed her down quite a bit. Then she studied the boy a bit more closely. Something caught my attention, and I realized that I didn't in fact escape this scolding. Beru, why would you put a boy, wearing a mudstained costume, on my clean white sheets, yeah? I'm not gonna hear the end of this. EOV Beru. After recovery granny finished nagging me, women Amorite, she told me to take Izuku to his house to rest, and told me to pay for the cleaning detergent. I won't do that. I ended up asking Toshi where Izuku lives and warping the two of us there. Thinking with portals, so, here I am, carrying the passed out Izuku over my shoulder like a sack of potatoes and ringing on the doorbell to his house. I did that for a minute or two before I heard a lock click and the door open slowly. I yes who is a short and chubby lady with green hair answered the door. She's 100% Izuku's mom. There's no question about it. Her eyes went wide, and she gasped when seeing me and Izuku. I guess she would be worried since her son's unconscious. I, Izuku Beru, what happened? Does she know me? That's odd. I don't really remember her from any weird. She does look somewhat familiar. Did I actually meet her before? Well, I'll ask about that soon. I should answer her before she dies of worry or something. Nothing happened just training he's tired, comma. I said as I waved my free hand around a bit, one of them is propping up Izuku. I, I see she looked relieved for a second. Oh, but look at me, holding you up at the door. Come in, please. Izuku told you to come over, right? She made way for me as she basically ran towards the kitchen. I looked at her as she quickly started taking out things from the fridge and preparing to cut some stuff up. I just walked over and placed Izuku on the couch. He didn't react at all. This guy is really a heavy sleeper. What are you doing? I never got an invitation. I just kinda carried him here to get recovery granny off my head. Hum. Why do you look so confused? Could it be that Izuku didn't tell you to come over? How can she tell that I am confused? I don't even technically have a face to read. He didn't tell me anything I just brought him home to rest. I'm actually training him. She looked like she just reached a moment of comprehension. Wait. So Izuku didn't tell you anything. She rubbed her forehead a bit. She looks a bit frustrated. Do you remember me at least? Damn. When she asks so hopefully it kinda makes me sad about not recognizing her think. How many people were kind to you in the past? Well, very few people come to miss it. She's that hot nurse from all those years back. How did I not recognize her? Well, a lot of time has passed, but she still left quite the impression on me. Yeah, you're that nurse from. I forgot the hospital, but I remember you Inko Yep. This was her name. I gotta say, good thing I have a good memory. Now I can see this relieved smile on her face. Still, it's no wonder I didn't recognize her, she changed quite a bit. So you do remember me, I could see her tearing up a bit. Why is she crying? Well, I guess she's Izuku's mother, that's for sure, sorry. Sorry for not being able to help you, hey? Come on now, I'm feeling embarrassed. I can somewhat guess the story here. I'm not that daft. I always wondered why no one ever bothered to adopt me. I mean, my case made waves for the mutant community. There must have been countless parents trying to gain custody of me. But I guess the government was interested in me for quite a long time. I guess Inko wanted to adopt me too. And, she was obviously unable. But what is a nurse supposed to do when the entire system is against her? You've nothing to apologize for. But if it makes you feel better, I could never blame you for anything that happened, it all comes down to specifics. I really hate seeing this kind lady break down crying. I can barely do anything besides patting her on the shoulder at this point well, maybe a hug won't hurt all that much. She kept muttering about being sorry and whatnot. She eventually passed out after a while. I guess she had a long day at work, coupled with the stress of Izuku being unconscious, and the shock of me suddenly reappearing in front of her was a bit much. I obviously didn't let her lay on the ground. I picked her up and carried her to her bedroom. It's not that hard to tell which is hers, Izuku really needs to get over his All Might obsession. I also grabbed Izuku and put him in bed. Now, I could leave at this point, but that would be a bit insensitive. I guess I can make something while the two of them are sleeping. I used to be a pretty decent cook back in the day. I've always cooked for myself after all. Past life only, who bothers to cook when even dirt is enough to satisfy your hunger? Now that I think about it, 
I've always kinda been alone, both in my past life and this one. I got close to that gang, but after getting over my obsession with fighting, I didn't see them as the same. I could easily act friendly and fit in, but I could see some of their choices as cold, needlessly violent. A perspective that I would have never had if I hadn't matured out of the fighting is my life stage. They were my friends, but they weren't ever actually friendly. Vlad was the worst in this sense. He could act just like me, friendly, outspoken. Then he could coldly look on as he commanded me to kill someone's children for his disrespect of our gang. He was a disgusting person. After I matured, I simply couldn't see any of the members of the gang as anything more than worms, insects. I wanted to hunt them down, to rid forward of them, but I simply couldn't bring myself to do such a thing. My past and all of the good memories I had with them prevented me from doing so. They were scum, but I am also scum, probably even worse than all of them. The only difference is that I became self-aware enough to notice that. In this life, however, things went a bit differently. Like in my last life, I got to experience unlimited power, but quickly got bored of it. Past life was having influence and being feared, people not even daring to look me in the eye. This one was pure, raw power. I was alone for a long time. The very first friend I had was Sama. Why? His innocence reminded me of what I didn't have. I thought that befriending him could make me experience something akin to childhood, maybe live a simpler life. A privilege that I never had, and never will have, apparently. But that doesn't matter anymore. Sama got taken by all for one, and the old villain became my target. From then on, everything went as it did. I got my revenge. I managed to make a few more friends along the way. People that I don't recoil in discuss when seeing. Hypocritical, but still, people. I can at least somewhat be comfortable around. Toga is special, she is just like I used to be. But even with all of her antics and obsessions, she doesn't disgust me. Maybe she reminds me of where I came from. Maybe it's because I know how drastic of a change she will go through if she goes down the same same path I did. Well, I want to be there for her. And, I will. All of this thinking and remembering got me really hungry. Good thing I've been cooking the whole time, not idly staring at the counter. I made burgers, classic American cuisine, not really, but they're simple to make. I obviously made three of them. If I'm gonna use their ingredients in kitchen, I might as well give them some food. Cleaning up is really quick using warp gate. Just portal the mess into the trash and wipe the stains off. I placed everything neatly on the table and looked at the stairs. I could see that both Izuku and Inko got up at this point. They were probably both a bit confused though. I could see, through the wall slash ceiling, the two of them meeting in the hallway and speaking a bit before both of them came down the stairs. They seem to have smelled the scent of cooked mince meat and are quite confused. Beru, are you still here? Asked Inko while coming down the stairs. Izuku was right behind her. As expected, just leaving after putting them to bed might have been a bit insensitive. Obviously, comma, I said as I stared at the green-haired family. Izuku looked at the table. He seemed to be both embarrassed and hungry. E, did you make the food? Oh, and thanks for bringing me home. His question was more of a formality, really. They both sat down and stared at their plates. Oh, what a poor host I am. Sorry, Beru. You even had to cook us dinner. Inko finally broke her silence only to apologize in Midoriya style. It's fine I wanted to do this. I don't really know jar complicated foods, though I was about to say that I don't know Japanese cuisine. It seems I've reached the height of my lacking intellect. My last three brain cells are struggling to keep up. I see still. I feel quite bad. I guess it's her time to look down in shame. Doesn't matter you'll get the chance to make it up to me. I said as I waved her concerns off and pushed her plate further towards her. Thank you for the food. They both said as they started to eat. Huh. I guess it's been a while since I've eaten my own cooked food. It seems I at least remember how to season the meat. The Midoriyas also seem too like the burgers. Now that I think about it. I think I've been here for like two hours. I can't really spend the night here. Toga might get concerned for no reason. The three of us ate slowly. We chatted a bit. Izuku only managed to get a few words in. Most of the topics were Inko asking me about how my life had been, and me asking how her career as a nurse has been. Overall, it was a nice experience. Inko is really an agreeable woman. She's also expressed quite a lot of concern for her son and his choice of profession, which is reasonable. I could also see that Izuku was getting quite embarrassed at that. My words seemed to calm her down a bit though. Well, he is training, he has potential. But that all comes with a risk, at least you can confidently say that your son is following his dreams. It wasn't the most sympathetic take for her situation. She could have easily said, so what if he's following his dreams? He is constantly in danger. But she just became silent for a bit. I guess my simplistic answer still gave her something to think about. Eventually, though, the time came for me to leave. It was already nearing midnight, and Izuku looked like he could fall asleep any second at this point. Inko let me off with a you're always welcome here. It was quite nice of her. Makes me think of what could have happened if she did manage to adopt me. Maybe I would have developed differently. Probably not by much. Well, that was about the way I spent my night. I walked myself to bed, and Toga did her usual cola hold on me as I drifted off to sleep. EOV Beru. It's already been two days of constantly training with Izuku. I've not really sparred with him all that much, only hitting him around a few times and telling him to dodge whatever he could. Izuku's progress is also quite quick. 
He seems to be able to properly use 5% of one for all, eventually learned its name, without any repercussions. But going over that percentage seems to be damaging to his body. He's been a bit hesitant at first, but I did manage to make him fight properly after hitting him in the head a few times. It's already the third day of the internship, and I've yet to do any actual hero work with him, and that in itself is a bit of a mistake on my part. Problem is, I've not really made it a point to look for patrol spots in Musutafu, so I'll have to go to a city I'm more familiar with. Today we'll be going on an actual patrol comma I said as Izuku arrived at the gates of UA, a usual meeting spot. Already what if I'm not ready to fight actual villains yet really? He's getting cold feet now. Dude the people you kids call villains are nothing more than glorified thugs you'll be fine. I waved his concerns off quickly. Whether he wants to or not, I need him to fight a few real villains. I mean, I can punch him around all day, but he needs some actual action, blood needs to be spilled, metaphorically. Hey, are you sure? I mean what if they are all just weak to you? Well, his concern is well founded. Don't worry too much I'm serious when saying that the vast majority of villains are street thugs. No joke, a lot of them are people I could have taken in my past life. I, I see he's clearly not all that confident about this patrol. And, honestly, I don't care. He'll get over it. Let's go. Kid, he just nodded as he watched the purple mist seeping out of my body and forming a portal. He just stepped into the portal with a shaky leg. I could see quite a bit of surprise on his face. I followed after him. We arrived in an alleyway somewhere in the middle of Hosa City. This is the city I know best after all. Beru, sir, do you have multiple quirks? Hum, I guess I never talked to him about that. Oh yeah, nothing special though I started walking out of the alleyway and Izuku followed right behind me. Shh, how is that possible? Jeez, no need to be so shocked and loud. I already told you it ain't anything special. I just shrugged at him. You can ask Toshi later I think we should continue with our patrol. For now, he still looked confused, but didn't press on. I guess he has enough social awareness to discern an obvious no when he hears it. The two of us walked for quite a bit. There wasn't much action to be found on the streets, at least not in this part of town. Izuku was walking beside me and looking around vigilantly. Our patrol's usually this quiet. How the fuck am I supposed to know? Never patrolled before, but I can bullshit my way out of this question. It depends on the day really villains aren't active at all times, comma I said with fake confidence. Ayo he was interrupted by his ringtone as his phone vibrated in his pocket. Sorry I should have put it on mute. He took it out and looked at it for a second, before his eyes widened in panic. What's up kid? I asked as I looked around the street for a second. The civilians were just going on about their days, nothing out of the ordinary. My friends are in danger. We need to go quickly. He instantly used his full cowl. How he named using Ofer all over his body, and jumped off on a building, continuing to run in front of me. Did he just go on without my permission? Wasn't I supposed to be the teacher or something like that? Well, whatever. I bet it's a lot more action than whatever we were doing here. Yeah, really responsible teacher. I mean, I do want him to fight some villains. I unfurled my wings and took off too. I caught up to Izuku almost instantly. I flew above him and looked down at him for a bit. I can somewhat see signs of fighting further ahead in one of the alleyways nearby. Then, I heard a large explosion to the side. A person flew right above me. I stretched my hand and caught said person. I instantly stopped in mid-air and looked at the situation. I held the person I caught above my shoulder. He was also facing the wreck in front of us. A short old man with a white beard. He wasn't wearing any hero costume, but he didn't seem all that injured. What the fuck? I asked the old man as he looked at the raging fire to the side of us. A villain attack. It was a bit too sudden for us to see you can call me Gran Torino by the way he said as I landed on top of the building right beside it. How many are there? Ash names Beru he sighed for a bit as he looked down. Out of the building poured out around 30 people all of them looked the same. They all look the same, tall, somewhat lanky build. They are the same age, black hair and strange purplish patches of skin stapled on top of their regular skin. Is this some sort of cloning quirk? I asked the old man. He just shook his head as he looks at the situation with a grave expression. Must be but this person seems to have a powerful fire quirk. All of the clones are capable of using it. Ooh, I see. So it's not just one villain. Gutted I jumped into the fray almost instantly. The concrete cracked underneath me as the shockwave pushed some of the clones back. A hero? ESK one of the clones complained as a bluish flame appeared in its palms. I could see Endeavor fighting around 20 of these same clones in the distance. Which means that this might be a bit bigger of a mess than I expected. I looked around a bit more and decided on the best course of action. I don't want to kill off any civilians, as that would further harm my public relations. Several concentrated streams of blue flames rushed me from all sides but I wasn't about to stand there and take it even with my decent resistance to heat. My arm quickly enlarged itself. I flew into the air right above all of the streams and aimed my arm at the ground. I fired off a half-charged air cannon right in the middle of all of the clones. I crushed at least 10 of them into the concrete street, collapsing it and sending the rest of them flying in all directions. I could see Gran Torino and a few other heroes struggling to evacuate and rescue all nearby civilians. Then a few more villains appeared, different from the fire one, but still apparent clones. A person in a black straight jacket seems to have the ability to infinitely expand his teeth or something. At this point, 
I can't help but be a bit annoyed at the situation. I also can't really do much to help Izuku. I have to help out here. But where would I even find the person making these clones? Are they even present at the scene? What about the originals of the Fire and Teeth villains? I can't see any of them nearby. But I really dislike the way things are going right now. Most of the Fire Quirked clones that I have blown away are already getting up to. And the Teeth Controlling ones are just starting to make their way towards me. I can see Gran Torino making circles around a few of them. He's really fast for an old man. No joke. I quickly decided to use a combination of quirks all around me. Out of my body. In every direction. I sprouted elongated tendril-like tails and pierced all of the clones surrounding me. All of them burst into a strange viscous liquid. I looked around myself warily and rushed to aid Gran Torino first. Endeavor seems to be able to handle himself just fine. I quickly kicked off from building to building. By the time I reached the side of one of the teeth quirk clones. I had enough momentum to kick right through its torso. While using minimal strength, it instantly dissolved into a puddle of viscous liquid. As I jumped and plunged my hand into the chest of one of the other clones, it managed to bring its teeth down on my back. But it dissolved before it could do any damage. Not that it would have. Are you alright, old man? I shouted at him as he looked a bit out of breath. He looked at me for a bit, looking somewhat defiant as he kicked one of the clones directly into the back of the head, cracking its skull, and making it dissolve into that same liquid. I'm not that old yet, he said as he bounced around violently taking down all of the clones nearby. I guess that after realizing that these were just clones, they kinda started going all out. I could see Endeavor burning the clones around him to a crisp. There was no discrimination whatsoever. The situation seems to be stabilizing. But there's no chance to find the copy quirk or the originals of these two villains. I doubt they were ever present at the scene. But, just as things started looking better, another person appeared. He was wearing a strange furred coat that completely covered his face. After him came a few dozen more people that looked the same. Another group of fucking clones. I said as I rushed them. And, just as I was about to reach the one in front, I was quickly encased in a large block of ice. At this point, I am getting a bit angrier. I flexed my arms and pulled them bringing my elbows down on my side and breaking the glacier that had built around me with my physical strength. Then, another wave of blue fire came towards me, as the ice quirked clones prepared to freeze me once more. So, I decided to stop playing around with them. I quickly jumped into the air. The wave of ice hit the gouts of blue fire, and created a blanket of steam that covered the entire district. I could still hear sounds of fighting within the steam, but visibility was definitely low for everyone but me. I quickly jumped into the steam. I cut up all of the fire quirked clones that my eyes could see. All of them being lacerated, decapitated, dismembered as soon as I passed by then. I left only puddles of viscous liquid behind me as I advanced towards the ice quirked clones. That seemed to be staying back to back, while visibility was low. They were all huddled together and prepared for attacks from all sides. But I doubt they were expecting an attack from above. My arm inflated itself like a balloon. I unleashed a fully charged air cannon right on top of their heads. Crushing all of them into the concrete and destroying the entire street. That extreme rush of air also cleared up all of the steam around us. Which revealed how shitty the situation was for the other heroes. Not that I couldn't already tell. Gran Torino had one of his legs frozen and seems to be in a bit of a pinch as a lot of clones are approaching him from his sides. There aren't any more fire quirk clones around, but the teeth ones and the ice quirked ones are still present. Endeavor himself managed to get rid of the ice clones around him, elemental advantage. But the teeth ones were a bit more annoying for him, one of them having pierced his shoulder and leg. I guess I should really bring this to an end. I also need to look for Izuku POV narration. The situation was extremely bad for Hosa City, and it was all because a certain group felt the need to make their presence known, and wanted to see how a few of their recruits would fare against heroes. The Meta Liberation Army was still acting as an underground force. They were not planning on naming themselves, and going completely public as of yet. But they needed to look into how their strength would fare against the hero community. Any casualty was just considered a sacrifice for the greater cause that they were trying to attain. A better society that relied on the strength of their meta abilities or quirks. It was a movement that aimed to get rid of a lot of the corruption that plagued Japan, as well as a way for Reed Destro, the current leader of the Meta Liberation Army, to achieve his father's dreams. The people they recently recruited were villains, and some of them seemed to be there for their own reasons. Darby, Magni, Moonfish, and the person that Reed Destro found the most agreeable, Twice. The meta ability of Twice was actually what even allowed this attack to happen. He had taken proper measurements of a few of the high-ranking members of the army, as well as the recruits, and created an actual army of copies. Reed Destro was excited to test out that ability against the heroes. He obviously picked a less occupied part of town to test it out. He sent the clones out to simply create some chaos. Not leaving any names or anything of the sort. Just fight and take out as many heroes as possible. The Meta Liberation Army wasn't yet ready to announce itself to the world. Trumpet, Reed Destro's right-hand man, was still trying to gain a political standing of decent relevance to further the ideals of the Meta Liberation Army, subtly to the wider populace. That process would take a while, and they weren't quite ready to act before they managed to sway the people's perspective and opinions to their ideals. Reed Destro had only sent clones of three people, Darby, 
The blue fire quirk Jung Man, Moonfish, the somewhat insane teeth quirk Man, the clones of Jiten, the ice quirk user who was also one of the leading members of the army, was sent to supervise the situation. He was currently watching the situation through cameras, and was quite pleased with what he was seeing. Although some heroes proved to be more trouble than others, Beru wasn't someone that the Meta Liberation Army wished to antagonize, but it seemed that it was fated for them to cross paths, and not in the friendliest of ways. Endeavor himself was not having the best of times. He was doing his best to fight off the multitude of Darby clones and Moonfish clones, that was sieging him, but he was having an extremely tough time. He couldn't really go all out either, as not all of the civilians had been evacuated yet, and he was afraid of harming them. Darby, however, seemed to remind him of someone too. He couldn't quite put his finger on it, but he didn't like harming Darby's clones all that much. He felt like he was burning part of himself. It was a distraction that he had paid for with a few injuries. Gran Torino was faring a bit better in comparison. Nothing was holding him back besides his old age, but he could still move around swiftly. The steam smoke screen had somewhat helped the aged hero, as he could somewhat maneuver around it using sounds and the experience he gained over decades of hero work. But things went downhill for him, when one of the Jeton clones managed to freeze his leg while it was turning into a viscous liquid. That slowed him down exponentially, and he was quickly cornered and pushed back, his mobility greatly affected, and his senses affected by the pain of frostbite. His situation quickly became worse as he didn't have the same energy that Endeavor did. And and the other heroes were all struggling to evacuate as many civilians as possible. He was forced to grit his teeth and keep fighting well, for three more seconds anyway. Beru looked at the large crater slash sinkhole his full-powered air cannon had caused in the middle of the street, and he quickly decided on a course of action. A purplish mist seeped out of his body and expanded into every corner of the battlefield. He opened up warp gates underneath all of the clones, and piled all of them up inside that massive hole. Even after all of that fighting, there was still over 100 of them inside that hole, and they still weren't enough to make the crater look cramped. The heroes were surprised by the sudden disappearance of their enemies. Endeavor, especially as an enemy disappeared right before his fist managed to reach them. He looked around a bit and finally found the source of the disappearance. He could barely see Beru's body due to the strange purplish mist obstructing his vision. It almost made Beru look like a purplish misty monster. Gran Torino just sighed in relief after seeing all of the villains disappear. The younger generation will always surpass the old. He wasn't even shocked when seeing the way Beru fought. He knew that someone capable of taking down all for one was already at the peak of the world in terms of strength. He could only smile as he looked at the mist retreat into Beru's body, as the young insectoid looked down at the villains in the pit he had created. They obviously weren't just staying put, they were all trying to escape through different means. But they didn't get the time to do so. Beru hovered above the crater and extended his arms towards the villains, pointing his palms straight at them. A tsunami of flames was released from his palms, instantly turning that crater into a fiery pit and melting down a lot of the infrastructure nearby. His attack burned the clones alive as all of them quickly turned to a viscous liquid. The liquid also melted and evaporated almost instantly. The Jeton clones tried to create ice walls to block said attacks, they were quickly turned into water, then into steam, everything was evaporated by the extreme heat of Beru's enhanced hellfire quirk. It was initially taken from Endeavor, but when combined with the numerous enhancing quirks in Beru's possession well, the result was almost catastrophic. An attack that he otherwise wouldn't have used if not for one thought on his mind. Fuck. I need to rush to that brat. I even told Inko that everything would be fine. He just wanted a way to end it all quickly. And this was the fastest solution that caused the least damage to his surroundings. Luckily, there were no civilians in the immediate vicinity. The only close person was Endeavor, and he could feel the heat was extremely discomforting even for him. He was far enough for it not to harm him though. Beru stopped his flames after sensing that all of the clones were dead. It had already melted most of the cars nearby, as well as whatever poles and signs were still standing. That was insane. There were civilians in the area. Endeavor was quick to shout at Beru. Endeavor approached him, disregarding the searing heat. He didn't have the same perceptive capabilities as the insectoid, so his worry and desire to hold back was well-founded. He also hadn't known that Beru had a fire quirk, but he already knew that Beru was stuffed with well over a hundred different quirks. So there was no way for Endeavor to tell he was looking at his own quirk in action. Don't worry, no one was close enough to get hurt, Beru said as his body released steam. It was slowly cooling down, but the use of Hellfire easily boiled the blood in his veins and injured his insides. He regenerated instantly. However, so there was no need to worry for him. But he also didn't have any time to worry about these things. He quickly unfolded his wings, blowing away the steam that was continuously releasing from his body, as he started flying in the same direction that Izuku took. Endeavor was even forced to take a step back due to the shockwave of his rapid departure. He was a bit annoyed, but he didn't have the time to complain as he quickly got to looking for any civilians in the area. Well, right before checking out the crater that Beru had made curiosity was there after all, the entire interior of that crater seemed to be melted, almost like lava. He could feel the extreme heat on his skin still. It made him gulp as he heavily sweated. It was either due to the heat or fear. What if such an attack was directed at us, the heroes? Who would be able to stop it? He quickly shook off those worries though. Beru was also a hero. Such thoughts were just foolish. But there was also another grim thought it's impossible to tell if any of them was the original. There isn't anything left to confirm or deny that. He just shook his head and started looking for civilians to rescue. He was still a hero after all. EOV narration. While the 
battle was raging on the left side of the town, the right side was also proving itself to be quite eventful. Izuku had received the coordinates of his friend's location through that phone message, and he had run off without thinking too deeply about it. All that was on his mind was the fact that his friends were in danger. He was almost thrown off his feet when hearing that explosion to his side, but he couldn't stop. He cared about his friends, and he was scared that Yida had done something drastic. His brother, Ingenium had just been gravely injured by the hero killer Stain, and Izuki could tell that his tall classmate wasn't planning on letting that event pass so easily. This was, after all, the city where Stain was said to be most active, and where Ingenium had been taken down in the first place. Izuku could obviously tell that Beru, his momentary mentor and trainer, had stopped to deal with the situation at the side of that large explosion. But he didn't stop. He disregarded his lack of hero license, and went forwards even without Beru's permission. He arrived at the location relatively quickly, but he wasn't going to have such a good time. The hero killer was already fighting one of his classmates, while Yida was already on the ground, injured. Shoto, the one that had messaged the entire class with the coordinates, was just cut slightly on his cheek by the tall and somewhat skinny built hero killer. The bloodthirsty idealist believed himself more than justified in harming and even killing teenagers. Izuku managed to intervene in time, delivering a powerful punch to the villain's side, sending him into a wall, and making him drop the blade that he had used to cut Todoroki. Izuku, you got here in time Shoto was clearly pleased to see his friend appear in such a timely manner. It was obvious even through his usual lack of emotions. I came as soon as I saw that message. This isn't good Izuki gulped as he looked at the hero killer. That was slowly getting up at this point. His quirk can immobilize someone that he licks the blood of we need to be careful. Shoto instantly in case the stains drop katana in ice. He didn't want the hero killer to be even more armed after all, another brat has come. Why are you two even bothering to save that fake? Shoto and Izuku were both stunned to hear the hero killer speak out like that. He is nothing but a selfish little brat. He didn't even care to save the hero on the ground beside him. He was just out for blood. The bloodless coming out of stain seemed to unnerve the two. Izuku immediately looked at Yida for answers but all he could see was the class president staring at the ground in shame. It doesn't matter. We will save our classmate, no matter what. Izuku still managed to respond with enough resolution to impress Stain. Shoto just nodded, his silent nature prevented him from being as outspoken as Izuku, but his intentions were the same. And the message was clear. A fight is unavoidable Shoto Todoroki didn't like the current situation, he had been out patrolling with his father, when they received a distress call from a region in the city. Shoto didn't hear the entire conversation, but he heard there were many villains. His father immediately told him to stand behind, while he rushed to deal with the situation. He managed to find Yida by sheer luck, he heard his struggle against the hero killer, and immediately moved to help him. But by the time he arrived, Yida was already taken down. He was pushed back, but still managed to give his location to his classmates through the group chat on his mobile phone. Now, both Izuku and Shoto were separated from the people mentoring them and from any other outside source of help. The two needed to rely on themselves. And Izuku wasn't feeling confident about the situation. Stain quickly rushed the two of them, but his path was cut by a wave of ice. That forced him to dodge to the side. He threw a small knife towards Izuku, who panicked and stumbled backwards, the knife barely missing him. Stain rushed Izuku almost instantly, like a wolf pouncing on its prey. But he was once again pushed back by a glacier, of bigger size this time. He was forced to jump back. The distance between him and the two students being wider was not a good thing. Shoto could wear him down from a distance. But, now he happened to be close to Yida, and he could definitely take advantage of that. He rushed towards the already downed Yida, and was just about to bring his knife to the student's neck. But something unexpected happened. Stain heard a large crashing sound, then something flashed green to his right. He reacted in time to bring his blade back to block the incoming blow but he was still sent flying by it. Stain crashed into a wall and raised quite a bit of dust, his back cracking the concrete wall of the alleyway. Izuku had acted without thinking when seeing his friend in danger. He breached through the ice wall that was separating them, and immediately reached the villain's side, kicking him away from Yida in an instant. But, he had also gotten cut on his leg, something that had happened in a slight second, when the villain was sent flying. He immediately realized the severity of the situation, he was about to rush Stain to get the bloodied blade away from his hands. But, something distracted everyone, a large bang followed by a tremor that made Izuku and Shoto fall of their feet. The entire city shook due to Beru's air cannon, such an effect was to be expected. But the timing simply didn't help the two students. Izuku looked in fear as Stain used that distraction to lick his blade. The green head student felt an unnatural force completely paralyze his body. He just limply fell forwards. He looked on in shock as Stain stood up and looked at Shoto with a sadistic smile. It seems you're the only one left the two of you. I going through so much just to save a fake. He said as he slowly walked towards Shoto. Shoto himself was sweating heavily. He couldn't use his quirk properly out of fear of endangering the other people in the narrow alleyway. So he was left to just try his best to survive long enough for more backup to come his way. But he didn't stand idly for long. The villain attacked him with venomous spite. He kicked through the ice wall that Shoto had raised to defend himself, and rushed by his side. Shoto could feel something wet touch the cut on his cheek. At that moment, he knew it was over. His body stopped listening to him as it fell forwards. You two were quite troublesome. I won't kill you though. At least your intentions were good, but maybe I should teach you a lesson. He slowly walked towards the downed Izuku as he brandished his blade. I can appreciate heroism, but defending a fake isn't something I can commend you for. I won't cripple you or anything, 
But you should experience some pain, Stian said as he towered over the unmoving Izuku. His blade was quickly plunged deep into the young green head boy's right leg. It pierced through his calf and into the ground. Izuku screamed out in pain as the villain looked at his reaction. He didn't seem to take pleasure in it, but he did it nonetheless. He took out the blade and plunged it down one more time, this time into Izuku's torso. He made sure to avoid any organs. He didn't wish to kill the young hero prospect in front of him. Even if he hadn't seen much of the young man, he could tell that his intentions were pure. But he didn't like the fact that he stood in front of him, stopping him from purging some revenge-driven fake. Izuku screamed once more. He gritted his teeth as he did his best to withstand the pain. Yida looked on, horrified at the way his friend was being injured. And, worse of all, Yida knew that it was all his fault. Why did I try to do this alone? Why did I allow myself to be this blinded by revenge. These were both questions on his mind, but they would have to remain unanswered for now. Shoto was no better. If he was capable of using his body, his flames would have probably melted Stain's skin off. But he was forced to watch in anger as his friend suffered. Stain just looked at the heterochromatic teen, and started slowly walking his way after carefully taking his blade out of Izuku. Don't worry. Your turn is next. Something seemed to cut him off. It was something only he could feel. All of his senses were telling him to turn his tail and run, a blasted instinct that he managed to resist. But oh boy was that a mistake a second after that feeling. Something else happened. A chilling murderous intent seemed to cover the entire alleyway. It raised all of the hairs on Stain's body. He could feel cold sweat instantly cover his back. The feeling of sheer dread that he felt in that instant made him tremble. He completely stopped in his tracks. The murderous intent was so vile, so crude and ravenous, he felt like a little rat in front of a tiger. And the tiger was angry, beyond any reasonable doubt. He had never experienced something of that nature. He was used to being the hunter, the killer, the one shocking people with his intent and actions. Something bad was coming, and his body was too frozen in fear to even begin to react. What you exclamation point exclamation point question mark number at sign exclamation point number dollar a distorted voice accompanied that intent creepy and unnerving to all of the people in the alleyway. Stain, as if awakened by that distorted voice, finally regained his bearings and prepared to jump away but it was far too late. A towering being appeared by his side, a dark exoskeleton covered its body. Its back was hunched, and its arms were bulkier than Stain's entire body. It was Beru, and he was enraged. I took my eyes off Izuku for five fucking minutes. And this dipshit injures him like this with the thoughts going through his head at that moment. All notion of holding back disappeared at that moment. Beru extended his arms and grabbed Stain's shoulder with one hand and his torso with the other. He slowly pulled, Stain tried to struggle but it was simply impossible for him to do anything. His arm was ripped off painfully. It was almost like he was a small doll in Beru's hands, getting his limbs detached. His pain screams were all that the people in that alleyway could hear. Beru then threw the villain into the wall to his side. The villain passed through that wall almost instantly. It was unknown how many walls he had passed through. But Beru still walked in and dragged him out back into that same alleyway. At this point, there was no bone left unbroken inside Stain's body. He looked at his attacker with fear. Through his pain, he managed to speak up. Abu, what are you? There was no trace left of his previous confidence. Stain was physically broken down, and his mental state was in no better shape. His question seemed to wake Beru up from his murderous rage. EOV Beru. Shit, maybe I shouldn't brutalize this cunt too much in front of the children here, I mean. I can but I don't like killing in front of children. And dragging him away to do so is no better. I can just leave him like this though. No chance in this godforsaken world that this dude survives for more than a minute. So I guess I can answer his question. Maybe he'll amuse me. Izuku doesn't seem to be severely injured upon a closer inspection. What am I? Ash, that's rude. I'm a hero. Obviously the shining beacon of righteousness or whatever the fuck you want to call it. I don't care. I think my answer displeased him. A hero. Capable of this. A yo. Jeez, what is he? Some type of follower of the hero religion. Shut up hero is just a title it always was and always will be to some. It's just a job to others. It's an honor who cares. The dying idiot looked up at me with wide eyes. I you should have been my target not them oh. Whatever I've heard of you. I think that guy that complains about how heroes are today. Dash what part of your mission had anything to do with torturing and killing fucking kids. Beru looked down at the man. You're no better than me. I licked a bit of his blood off of my hand as I started heading for Izuku. Jeez, I have a lot of shit to deal with now POV narration. All of the people in the alleyway were shocked and terrified by Beru's display. None of them was expecting something like that to happen, and they didn't know whether to be happy or not. Manual, the hero Yida had interned with was also quite shocked by the way Beru took down Stain. The brutality of it surpassed what most villains were capable of, but none of them could really complain. Stain was torturing children in an alleyway. His death wasn't exactly a regretful event in Manuel's eyes. But Izuku, Yido and Shoto were completely shaken by it. They weren't seasoned heroes. They weren't used to brutality. Stain's torture of Izuku was already a lot for them to handle. But seeing a perceived hero rip a villain apart was a bit much for them. Yido almost vomited even Izuku was too in shock to even respond. Shoto was faring a lot better than them. But he still found that crunch sickening when the villain's bones snapped. But what had shocked him more was the way Bear reviewed heroes in general. Only he and Manuel were paying enough attention to hear the insectoid's conversation with Stain. It was a strange feeling. It was almost as if Beru looked down on the notion of a hero. Maybe it was due to his upbringing. Or maybe it was due to his undercover work. Shoto couldn't tell. 
but he knew that it wasn't that peaceful of a view on the world. I may have taken that too far, remember kids holding back is a virtue that a hero should always have Beru's statement was basically do as I say, not as I do. And it somewhat brought all of the other people in the alleyway back to the present. It also reminded Shoto of how Beru usually is. Even after committing such acts of brutality, it was as if nothing had changed at all. It was unnerving for the heterochromatic teen. Beru arrived at Izuku's side and kneeled for a second. He looked at the injured teenager with a bit of pity. Kid, what a mess you've gotten yourself in, don't worry though. You aren't too seriously injured. His attempts at pacifying the young man were quite unsuccessful. Izuku seemed to still be in shock. But that was just an appearance. It was hard to tell due to his paralyzed body. In actuality, he was responsive enough to give a basic answer. Iberu. Why did you? Kill Hai Izuku has somewhat regained his bearings, only to ask a question that Beru found quite confusing. Why would that matter? The villain was just trying to kill Izuku. From Beru's point of view, such aggressions should never be left unanswered. Well, he was trying to kill us too. If he was stronger, he would have Beru's answer made Izuku think for a second. The pain of his injury seemed to vanish momentarily, as light green energy seeped out of Beru's palm, and covered his entire body. E, but we're heroes W we are supposed to capture them. Give them a chance at rehabilitation Izuku's speech voiced the concerns of all three of the students in the alleyway. But Manuel knew the reality of the situation better. When you are a hero, there will always be people that you cannot save. People that don't wish to be saved. It was a fact that all pro heroes needed to come to terms with eventually. Beru wasn't aware of it. To him, killing someone that threatened the safety of those near him was normal. What was he supposed to do? To praise said person for trying to kill his friend slash temporary pupil. Manuel, however, saw his actions as a representation of that unspoken rule of heroism. Even if Beru seemed to act on his rage, it was not taken out of proportion, seeing as Beru was completely calm at the end of it. Therefore, Manuel found Beru's actions justifiable. We can talk about that later. I should get all of you to the hospital. The insectoid just sighed as he picked up Izuku. Three large tails then sprouted out of his back and cord around all of the living people in the alleyway. After making sure he had a good enough grip on all of the students as well as the hero that was down with them, Beru started flying off to the nearest hospital. The flight took only a minute, and the hospital employees were already quite busy due to the strange villain attack. But the hospital staff still acted quickly, and grabbed all of the injured people off of Beru's hands. Beru then made a call on his smartwatch to get the police to collect Stain's body. As he walked over and sat down in a random waiting room, he could have gone back outside and seen if there was something to do to help the rescue effort. But, from what he understood, everything was under control. So he didn't see a reason to make an effort to do anything. All he could think of currently was, How the fuck do I explain this to Inko? EOV Beru. I hope my previous overreaction wasn't that badly received by the kids in that alleyway. I mean, I may have acted out of anger, but I probably would have done the same even if I was completely calm. Still, I kinda forgot about Stain's existence. I did hear some stuff about him from both the teachers at UA and Wyoma. Wyoma just mentioned him as somewhat problematic in passing during one of our last meetings, she didn't speak much about him. But the teachers at UA did mention something about a student's relative being injured by him, and that he was supposedly active in Hosu City. I made a mistake in even bringing Izuku there. But I guess some good things did turn out of it. I got to meet quite a few interesting villains, as well as that old hero. And, if I hadn't come here, then Izuku's classmates would have been in actual danger. The doctors already told me the extent of all of their injuries. Manual, the hero that was with them, was injured the worst, Izuku a close second, E to the third. And, to my surprise, the fourth and least injured student was Shoto Todoroki. Endeavor's son. I already saw Endeavor rush into the hospital with a concerned look on his face. I had to calm him down a bit, and then the doctors took him to see his son. It was pretty strange to see him so riled up about something. He did always try to look tough and all while on the field. But the second his son gets into trouble he panics and paces around the room like a concerned mother. It's kinda funny to watch really. Would you stop snickering? He can even shout at me. She calmed down Jude everything is going to be fine. He barely got injured anyway. Endeavor, or Enji Todoroki, finally sat down on a chair by my side. Yes, I know. But he faced a highly dangerous villain. While he was supposed to be under my supervision, it was my job to protect him. He stared at his fist for a bit. His usual flaming beard receded. Don't stress yourself out the situation was pretty grave in that place, comma, I said, while stretching my legs a bit. I guess so and I haven't forgotten what you've done. That was completely reckless. He fled up a bit. But he doesn't actually seem all that mad. I wanted to finish things quickly. I knew the interns were in trouble, comma. I sighed a bit, while hoping there won't be any further issues to come out of that attack. The two of us kept speaking for a bit, all until the doctors came and said that it was okay for us to go in. Izuku looked fine, but he still seemed a bit shaken. He seemed quite surprised when I entered the room. He didn't make any eye contact though. Yida also didn't seem to want to look me in the eye, not that I care about him or anything. But Enji's son seemed quite normal, stone-faced. In a true idiotic fashion, his dad didn't show him any of the concern he had while in that hallway. Izuku, how are you feeling? I asked while standing beside him. Well, I am quite fine. I'm not in pain. The doctors said that I recover in a day or two. He said while looking around the room randomly. It's pretty clear that he also doesn't want to speak to me right now. Or look me in the eyes. Are you going to stay here for now? I asked while crossing my arms. Endeavor was speaking to his son in the background. At least for tonight, yes. 
Jeez, I guess I'll visit Inko and talk to her. She surely got a phone call from the hospital. I don't really look forward to explaining things to her, but at least I get to see what she's up to. Then a man in a uniform walked in. I don't really recognize him, but he had the head of a dog. Wait, I think Toshi spoke about a man like that being the chief of police. I guess it would make sense for him to show up. Well, I'll be going swift recovery kid. I got up and prepared to leave. I'm quite sure they won't get in any trouble for what they did. Even if they used their quirks unsupervised, they did so while saving someone's life. So it's excusable. Wait for a second, said the chief of police as he looked at me. I was just about to walk myself away. But it seems he's got some stuff to talk about with me too. What question mark I said while looking at him for a bit. The state you left the villain in was not something a hero should do. I'd advise you to watch yourself from now on. He said while giving me a side eye and turning back towards the kids. He started speaking to them, preaching about some stuff that I wasn't really paying attention to. NG also left the room while the chief spoke to me. I just rolled my eyes and walked away. I can tell that was the only thing he wanted to tell me. So there's no need to stick around. Izuku will get better. And he needs some time to get his head out of the gutter. I mean, they're kids, but with the profession, they've chosen they better get used to people being injured and killed in front of them. I'm sure Izuku will regain his bearings after a while. For now though, I'll go speak to Inko for a bit. I walked myself at her front door. I didn't even get to ring the bell twice before the door swung open, and a concerned Inko stared me in the eyes. W what happened? The hospital called me a few minutes ago. I was just about to go there. She seems beyond stressed out. I just put my arms on her shoulders and started walking towards the couch, dragging her with me. Jesus calmed down already. Ash didn't the doctors tell you how Izuku is doing? I asked while I made her sit on the couch and opened up the TV. The woman on the phone told me that he wasn't too badly injured, but still. I can't stand the idea of my dear Izuka getting injured in any way. I could see her tremble a bit. He's chosen this type of profession it can't really be helped. I wasn't expecting him to come face to face with a villain so quickly. I looked at the television as they reported on the situation inside Hosa City. The identity of the attackers is still unknown. But the authorities assume that they are part of a much larger group or villain organization. Thankfully the heroes acted fast enough apostrophe it rambled on about the situation. Saying a lot, yet not having much concrete information for anything. Say, weren't you supposed to help him? I understand that you want to train him. But he was injured. I can pretty much tell that she's doing her best to not snap at me. Your misunderstanding I was held back by something I tried to avoid her gaze for a bit. I awkwardly changed the channel. The recently announced underground hero, Beru was also present for this event. He reportedly took down a lot of the villains alongside the NR.2 hero Endeavor and a retired hero Gran Torino. It seems this new station does go into specifics. Inko also stared at the television for a second. A group of well over 100 villains were held back by the three, while the other heroes managed to rescue and evacuate any nearby civilians. This station didn't speak at all about the casualties. I'm pretty sure at least a dozen people died that I've seen with my own eyes. Many were injured too. I, I see so the situation wasn't all that great. She looked at the ground for a bit. It happens this one took us by surprise. I was originally patrolling with Izuku, but I decided to deal with all of these villains without him. Inko looked a bit embarrassed for a second. Sorry for blaming you, I'm just I'm really not feeling well shit, she's crying again. How exactly do I do this? It's fine I don't mind part of the blame does rest on me sometimes. It's better to have someone to blame when things go wrong. It seems Inko is quite ashamed to have blamed me for this incident. The two of us stood there in silence for a while. Then we started speaking again. I ended up taking her to visit Izuku and even coaxing the hospital into letting him off already. His injuries were already gone. Healing quirks made his recovery almost perfect. A few scars left. He was only being kept for observations anyway. And just like that, the stain incident was over. At least momentarily. EOV narration. Re Destro could just sigh as he watched all of the clones get burned to death at Beru's hands. Well, only the parts he caught. Some of the security cameras he was tapping into had melted due to the flames. That was something Redestro found quite terrifying. But he already knew that Beru was monstrously powerful, so he composed himself quickly enough. The test had been a success in any sense of the word. The Meta Liberation Army managed to cause that much of a scene, and could have potentially taken down many heroes, too, if not for Beru. And they didn't even lose anything, as the clones were expendable soldiers that their new member, twice, could produce endlessly. But, while the implications and results of the situation were extremely pleasing and highly in the Liberation Army's favor, Re Destro didn't like the way the situation had concluded. Beru dispatched that many clones too easily. Even if they weren't as strong as the originals, it was still concerning. Beru was someone that the army would have to face after all. And Re Destro didn't think their chances looked all that bright at that moment. As he watched the insectoid, he realized something else Beru seems to be especially busy. Why is he in such a hurry? He watched as the insectoid took off and tried to follow him. He tapped into all of the security cameras he could, eventually reaching the one where Stain was torturing the students. He found the scene very distasteful. 
but he didn't really let it bother him all that much. What truly caught his attention though, was the way Beru dealt with the villain. Well, it didn't really bother him, rather, it pleased him. He recorded the footage of Beru ripping a villain's arm off, and throwing him through a building. The camera, unfortunately, didn't register any sounds. But he could tell that Beru wasn't exactly being kind to the villain, just by the expression of said villain. He then watched as Beru took all of the injured and flew off, leaving the dying villain behind. Re Destro almost couldn't help the mischievous smile that reached his lips. Releasing this to the press might help us in the long run, but it also might not. He was contemplating what to do with the video that was currently in his possession. On one hand, this video would certainly harm Beru's reputation a bit. But, at the end of the day, it wasn't going to do much to Beru himself. But it would make the people more skeptical about the way all heroes treat villains. There were already many similar cases. And, making this video come to light would certainly weaken the trust that civilians have in heroes, at least slightly. What exactly was the problem then? Well publishing that video would also mean that he'd have to hasten the movements of the Meta Liberation Army. If he just published it now, by the time the army was ready for action, the public would have already regained their trust in heroes, making their operations more difficult. Also, he needed to somehow warm the public up to their ideas quickly enough, which was simply impossible. Therefore, he decided to hold on to that particular video. He was certain he'd find a use for it. For now, he needed to focus on strengthening the Meta Liberation Army and swaying the public to their ideals. Time skip one month. EOV Beru. Dan, it's already been a month since this whole internship incident. Gotta say things are progressing quite well. Well, I haven't spoken much with Izuku or Inko since. Just the occasional phone call with Inko. That brat seems to be avoiding me, understandable. But I was also quite busy myself. I spent a lot of time watching television and hanging out with either Toga or the teachers. But I also had to participate in those stupid heists. I now always take that guy's appearance. This time I ask, and make sure that they follow the contract. Lady Nagant has yet to have been spotted though. The heist I will be attending tomorrow is the 5th. And to be honest, I have a really bad feeling about it. I mean, Wolfram and his group have already gained a lot of attention. From now on, heists would obviously get progressively harder as more powerful heroes will show up. At the last three heists, there was no one of notice. I didn't run into that rabbit hero again. And, I don't really mind. She may have been hot, but she was really annoying to deal with. I mean, I can't really go all out against any hero. So it's much easier when all of them are weak enough to not even be an issue for me. I mean, she wasn't all that strong. At least compared to all for one. But going easy on her was still hard. I also kinda force myself to only use that specific gigantification quirk, because regular people should only have one, and I don't need to attract even more attention to that group. Two strong villains being part of it is already enough, me and Wolfram. We have been hitting different cities in different parts of the country. I had to take down quite a few helicopters that were pursuing us, pulling them down by the tail usually. It's kinda hard to not kill anyone, especially in a fight, but hey, it's manageable. And, I am not an idiot that lacks the self-control to not mindlessly start killing people. I mean, what's the use of power if all you do with it is kill people? I could do that with guns too. That's why I learned to cook food using that flame dude's quirk. I can make some pretty crispy hot wings using my perfect temperature control. Although Lunch Rush wasn't happy to see the mess my first attempts had left in his kitchen, imagine getting kicked out of a high school cafeteria. Ha 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 ha. Toga has been training every day for this entire month. Now, she seems to be able to go toe to toe with Azawa pretty good. She also tried to fight me. I don't really need to articulate how that went out, nothing changed. I mean, she did get a few cuts in. Even with me holding back. I was still able to punch her unconscious. I felt bad afterwards though. I also managed to get Recovery Girl's quirk. It was an amazing adventure that saw me. Well, I just kinda asked for a bit of hair. She didn't even question what my deal was. She just kinda gave me a strand and told me to leave her alone. Mission accomplished successfully. I've already used it a whopping one time. Apparently, using it on an exhausted target is kinda dangerous, might kill them, so I couldn't even heal Toga properly. Thankfully, I stopped immediately and took Toga to the clinic, where, you guessed it, recovery girl came me again. Toga stayed in bed for a day or two, but didn't really blame me, mainly because she didn't know what happened. So yay, what other stuff did I get up to while wandering about? Well, not much really. I didn't really speak to Namuri in private a lot. We just kinda hang out with everyone else too. But we do all still get along. Although some of the teachers didn't really like the way I handled the stain situation, Izawa specifically said that I shouldn't have acted like that in front of the students. That I might give them a bad impression of how a hero should act. I assured him by reminding him that they weren't children. Also, the kids weren't really mentioned for fighting stain at all. I think it's because they would have gotten in trouble or something. The only reason Izawa knows is that Yida told him about me killing stain. Damn, what a snitch. I've not done much else. Currently, I'm just getting ready for the raid tomorrow. How exactly? By researching an elaborate method to help the group escape from heroes well. Not exactly, I'm just watching TV. But that's close enough. The television is filled with stuff about heroes. Might as well call this research, although not everyone would agree with that. Well, there isn't much to do anyway. It's evening and Toga keeps trying to make me walk in on her while she's using the shower. She's been in there for two hours already, and I honestly find it amusing. I wonder how long she'd stay in there. I mean, I did get worried and checked up on her, with thermal vision, 
but she just seemed to be staring at the door intently. So I guess I won't be using the bathroom tonight. Oh well, I'm sure Namuri wouldn't mind if I borrowed hers or something. EOV narration. Wolfram, against all of his judgment and suspicions, had yet to flee the country with his group. He was currently coldly staring at a table in the middle of the warehouse. On it was a large map of Japan, circled in red, were the places that they needed to rob, crossed with the ones they had already been to. No member of his group was captured yet but he knew it was just a matter of time. And he didn't know if his people would be able to resist interrogation. The second one of them was caught he'd have to move bases, and likely leave the country. Even worse, the only reason none of them was in jail yet was because of someone he completely detested. He always came in different forms, and took the form of the same person during the heists. The person in question became more of a reserve member, being left behind in the warehouse or being made as an escape driver. Beru was not a topic Warfram liked to talk about. Besides changing in form taking intruder, was the exact reason his skeptical mind was screaming at him to leave Japan. He was always there to supervise them when the time was right, seemingly appearing right in between them. It was frustrating for Warfram, but he was far too greedy to leave yet. They had already gotten a lot of money, but there was so much more to gain just from continuing that seemingly meaningless contract. What exactly is the goal? Wolfram had asked himself that question many times during the last month. Why were they being paid to create all of that chaos? There was simply no one to answer those questions. The organization that had hired them didn't even take a cut from the robberies. Wolfram didn't like the idea that he was being used. So, with that in mind, he had finally made a decision. This will be the last heist. We will have to flee the country right afterwards. But something was making him anxious. How exactly would he go about getting rid of their shape-shifting intruder? Beru seemed to always be present, always appeared by their side when a heist was ready or in motion. Wolfram was sure that the man was sent to look over them at all times. So, he was going to have an extremely tough time getting rid of him. It actually sounded almost impossible if they were to get rid of him by themselves. But we don't have to do that, do we? As that thought surfaced in Wolfram's mind, a plan was quickly concocted as a sickening and crazed smile appeared on his face. And so, the partnership between Wolfram's group and the Hero Public Safety Commission was about to come to an abrupt end. And Beru was the one to be caught in the middle of that. EOV Beru. Damn, it's already the day of the heist. I predict it to be excruciatingly boring and extremely predictable. But I still have that nagging feeling that it will all go to shit. It's already the fifth heist. And I need to think of how to deal with all of the heroes that will show up. I mean, not that I'm expecting there to be an army of heroes, but they should still be really on guard now. The good thing is that they have no way of actually knowing where we are striking next. There is no actual pattern to the banks that are targeted. One attack can happen in a city, the next can happen on the other side of the country. But they will happen, and I have to be there. So I guess I'll warp myself to them well. I'll first transform into that bloke. It's a decent form to take. Like all of the gunmen in Warfram's group, a gas mask perfectly covered my face. And my suit covers my body perfectly, not a formal suit, combat suit. The Kevlar and other things aren't really important. The only distinctive feature this form has is the red hair that sticks out a bit. It's awfully convenient. This way, I have an established identity with the authorities. So I don't bring even more attention to the group. If I play a different guy every time it will give people the impression that this group is crazy strong or something like that. I arrived at an alleyway near the place that was about to be robbed. This time it was a larger bank, one that was bound to bring more attention to Wolfram's group. I stepped forwards, crossing the road with large steps as I entered the bank. The sublime sound of people screaming and shots being fired ringed into my ears and made me quite irritated. Nothing grave was happening, obviously, the robbers were just scaring people into submission. Although, something strange did happen. A lady with long white hair was running towards the entrance, which I found quite strange. She was wearing a blue tracksuit and somewhat baggy clothes. Even then, it was quite obvious that she was curvy. I guess Wolfram's people aren't used to larger banks yet. Anyway, Anyway, I am right in front of the entrance, so I might as well be the one to stop her. Where do you think you're going? I asked as I enlarged my plan and placed it in front of the entrance, covering it entirely and cutting off her path. But, to my surprise, there was no fear in her features. Upon closer inspection, I could see a sharp-toothed smile stretch on her face. She jumped almost instantly, she mounted my head and locked her legs around my neck. Luna Tajeras. She shouted out with force as she was about to start spinning in the air. Such a move would most likely decapitate a regular person. But I'm not all that normal of an individual. I quickly turned my hand into its normal size, and grasped her thighs with both of my hands stopping her from moving any further. I looked up to see the rabbit ears of the tanned woman looking down at me. Her smile was still present even though her sneak attack had failed. In that instant, I realized who she was. That rabbit hero from the first high stand. It seems that she's not alone. My movement was swift, my reflexes top-notch. But I still failed to react to what happened next. Maybe it was because I was distracted by the rabbit lady. Damn, she's hot. From my side, a large familiar figure appeared and punched me square in the ribs. I let go of the rabbit hero, not wanting to take her flying through a few walls with me. I know the feeling of this punch to think all might of all people would be here. I guess he did take two days off from teaching. I crashed through the wall of the bank and arrived in the middle of the street. I spun in the air and made my hand large enough to dig into the concrete. I halted to a stop and stared at the bank. This time, my x-ray vision was on. I looked through the walls as the civilians all seemed to get up quickly, some of them ripping their casual clothes to reveal their hero costumes. 
And Wolfram's group was still there. Untouched well then, if we have to play it this way. Villain, if you stay put you won't have to get hurt further, shouted Toshi as he also walked out of the building. Rabbit Hero and two, out of the bank followed all of the heroes, as well as Wolfram and his group. Toshi probably thinks his blow dealt a lot more damage, he's always considerate. Either that, or he doesn't want to fight all that much. But he shouldn't have much to fear. I could see even more heroes popping up from the buildings nearby, as well as a lot of police. Some faces I even recognized. I didn't know Endeavor had this much free time, so that's how it is. I slowly got up as my hand returned to its original size. Again, if I show off too many quirks, things can get troublesome. But gigantification should be enough at least when coupled with my strength. Just give up you dolt. You have no way of escaping this. So much for you being a caretaker hard huh? damn. That rabbit lady is quite savage. I would have to agree with Rumi here. You have been caught, just like a mouse in a trap. Wolfram also walked forwards a devious smile on his face, as he looked at me with a strange sense of satisfaction. I should have expected something like this, comma, I said as I looked at the encirclement that was formed around me. They may all be gathered, but that means that I can at least go ham without any issue. They must have evacuated every building in this district. You have a lot of questions to answer, I would recommend you give up. You have no chances of escaping this predicament. A person dressed like a ninja spoke up now. He should be a high-ranking hero or something. I'm sure I've seen him before. You guys shouldn't get too confident we haven't even started, I didn't move. But my words still made the heroes and policemen around me get into their stances. So it's gonna be this way. Huh? The rabbit lady did her best to sound disappointed. But her smile is certainly not helping her credibility still. This is such a mess. I can't wait to complain to Wyoma about it. EOV. Narration. Wolfram's plan was quite simple. He could provide evidence of his group being just mercenaries. By doing so, he'd be able to take away attention from him and his men. He'd basically be feeding the authorities information and directing all of the blame onto that shady organization that had hired them. Of course, Wolfram had no way of knowing said organization. But he did know one of their employees slash associates. The shape-shifting intruder that had played at being part of their group for every single heist. The heroes that heard of this were feeling quite odd. They didn't really know what to make of the situation. Especially Mirko. She was quite interested when hearing that the group was actually actually not of criminals. But she was visibly disappointed when hearing that the only person she found interesting in it was the actual enemy. The others were just weaklings in her eyes. She had seen Beru, in disguise, clean up after them repeatedly in every heist. He was basically the only reason the mercenary group could always escape perfectly. And, now, he was the target of the entire police force. The mercenary group, that was now working with the police, and a large coalition of extremely powerful heroes. She was also part of that group. She specifically asked to join, as she had a score to settle with the strange man. Although, Mirko did detest the guts of their leader, as he dared to also call her by name. She wanted to decapitate him then and there, but she held herself back. Currently, she had bigger fish to fry. Part of that group was also Edshot, Endeavor, and even the symbol of peace. All Might. How exactly did this random villain catch the attention of the authorities to that extent? Well, not only was he part of a mysterious organization that seemed to want to cause chaos randomly, but he also seemed to have ties to someone else. That person clearly had two different quirks. That unnamed gigantification quirk, and that quirk that he used to change appearances. This made a few speculate that this organization had some ties with All for One, which meant that there would be many members with multiple quirks running around. They needed to immediately catch this one person for interrogation. That's why they needed to go all out. All Might immediately agreed when Night Eye told him about the details, and Dever agreed after seeing that All Might agreed. The rest of the heroes were drawn in by the fact that the No.1 and No.2 heroes were joining hands to combat a villain. At first, the team was supposed to have around 20 pro heroes, but with the addition of these two, there were now 60. An astronomical number of highly trained heroes all prepared for combat. The entire part of the city where the heist was to take place was quietly evacuated. And Beru arrived exactly as Wolfram speculated. The heroes didn't really like working with Wolfram, and the police were also preparing to arrest his group afterwards. But, at least for now, they had a common enemy. And the person that they were surrounding was the only clue they had to find out of its identity. Dan, they got me pretty good, was the only thought on Beru's mind currently. Still, he should have expected no less from a band of thieves. Although, they did manage to take him by surprise. Usually, criminals wouldn't really work with the authorities. But there he was surrounded by both a band of thieves and highly respected heroes and policemen. The first one to rush in was the rabbit lady, who Wolfram called Rumi, Beru, would refer to her as such. She made large strides and appeared in front of Beru. She tried to send a kick straight into his abdomen. Surprisingly, Beru did manage to catch the attack, making his hand larger and simply grabbing her leg. Rumi just stared at Beru with wide eyes as she tried to retract her leg. Afraid it ain't gonna be so easy Rumi Beru's voice sounded almost melodic. He quickly made his arm even larger and longer. He raised Rumi in the air and threw her into a crowd of heroes. One of the heroes with strength quirks stepped in front and caught her, managing to avoid her injuring any of the other heroes. All Might, who was on a time, didn't really have the time to spare right now, so he rushed in quickly. His speed was a few levels above that of any other hero present. By the time he was in front of Beru, his fist was already cocked backwards, preparing a powerful smash to send the villain flying. Beru was forced to gigantify his other hand, 
and put it in between him and the hero. Toshinori's punch connected, the shockwave sent everyone nearby flying away. Only Endeavor managed to hold his ground, as well as a few others. All Might felt his punch connect, yet he could tell that the villain didn't receive much damage. He saw how the muscles on that gigantic arm trembled and absorbed most of the shock before it reached any bones. Then, taking him by surprise, Beru swiped him to the side. All Might was sent flying through quite a few buildings as Beru's hand also ruined the surrounding ones. Beru was about to turn around and jump away but his path was quickly cut off by a stream of flames, one that he took head on. But what he didn't expect was someone to use that opportunity to appear above him. Rumi had already recovered from the shock, and she was even angrier than before. She jumped in the air and appeared above Beru as he was inside Endeavor's flames. She delivered an axe kick into his head, sending him flying into the concrete street. His landing wasn't a pleasant one, the force and momentum of his body hitting the concrete managed to fracture it entirely, as well as push some of the debris from the collapsed buildings away. Nice one, she shouted to Endeavor, who just huffed a bit. As he looked at the crater, where Beru Beru was already getting up. To the surprise of the two heroes, he seemed to be completely fine. All Might also appeared back onto the field, climbing out of some debris, and looking at the situation with a bit of shock. This is getting quite annoying. That was all the villain said, after taking a hit head-on from the symbol of peace, Endeavor, and Mirko. But they could tell that he wasn't unscathed. Rumi saw that he was a bit unstable when getting up, meaning he was only playing around at appearing unharmed. Shem PH. Don't think you're getting out of this alive. Wolfram was the next one to act. He was among the people that managed to resist getting pushed away by All Might's punch. His hand was already connected to a piece of metal, which he had connected to the underground pipe system. Beru's body was quickly entangled in steel wires and encased. The heroes didn't believe the situation was over yet. They all gathered around in preparation. Slowly, the metal started fighting Wolfram's control. As he shouted, he's getting out. The metal cage he had created was immediately blown open. Beru grew in size exponentially, becoming around 36 meters in height. He was standing taller than all of the nearby buildings that were still standing. How did he achieve such a result? The gigantification quirk of his could only allow him to grow to around 22 meters. But, when combined with a few enhancing quirks, that limit could be slightly raised at the cost of stamina. One of the nearby heroes also grew in size. It was Mountain Lady, she grew at around 20 meters, and tackled the gigantic villain. At least, he tried to. The villain simply pushed her away. He grabbed her leg, and proceeded to use her as a bat to swat away all of the nearby buildings and heroes. That all happened in less than 3 seconds, she didn't have the time to undo her gigantification. All Might was the one to stop that, he jumped up, reaching Beru's head, and punched with yet another smash. Beru was forced to let go of Mount Lady, she was thrown off, and she reduced her size. Another hero caught her as she was about to crash into the ground. Beru, however, still didn't manage to block the hit. It made him fall to the side, with his head tilted in that direction. While in that motion, Beru landed a slap onto the hero, swatting him into the ground like he would a fly. Beru quickly reduced his size as he twirled in the air and landed on the ground, where he edge shot quickly extended his fist and punched him into the stomach. A punch Beru just took, he grabbed the hero's fist as he threw him away into the distance. Damn, can't you guys just let me go or something? Beru asked as he looked at the heroes that were gathered around him. I'm afraid that isn't possible, All Might said as he wiped the blood from his lips. That previous hit had gotten him quite good. Yeah, you're clearly dangerous said Mount Lady, she was salty because she was used as a bat. Oh, come on I was basically just sent to make sure there were no casualties, comma, Beru said while waving his hands around. Yes, but we need to know who sent you. Why? And what is your connection with All for One? All Might said as he clenched his fist. Wow, haven't heard that name in ages. Didn't that bloke die or something? Ash, I don't know much about All for One. Beru was about to give the heroes some bogus answers to distract them. A perfect plan. Then would you like to explain why you have more than one quirk? Asked one of the heroes present while staring at Beru. Everyone was quite confused as to why Beru would start talking so suddenly. There was this doctor forgot his name he basically gave away extra quirks for research data. He was an associate of all for one, at least I think so. Beru just gave them some basic information about Kaiadai. Just as the heroes were about to ask another question, he jumped away. He traveled from building to building, but some were right on his tail. His distraction had only worked momentarily, and some didn't fall for it at all. Villain. Stop right there. All Might had already reached him. He was about to deliver another punch to the villain, but the villain just made his leg larger and kicked him in the side, sending him flying away. That move did slow him down though, allowing Endeavor to catch up to him quite quickly. But his stream of fire was promptly ignored as Beru still jumped away. After turning a few corners, he ran into a sorrow and walked himself away. EOV Beru. Damn, that was pretty intense. Fighting with that many people while not wanting to seriously injure any of them is really difficult. I had to be careful with my attacks constantly, even then, I'm pretty sure I broke a few bones. Sadly, I didn't get to tear Wolfram's head off, but I'm sure I'll get more chances later. So that doesn't matter. Well, time to talk about this with someone. I turned back into myself and directly walked to Ayama's office. She was looking at the news with anger. I'm guessing you don't need me to explain all that much, comma, I said as I sat down. She promptly ignored the stench of soa that came off of me, and just sighed. I'm sorry for this. Our organization should have been more careful. She bowed her head a bit as she looked at her desk. Her apology was worded out nicely, but her eyes are still pretty cold. No need for that. But now the authorities are looking for some non-existent organization or something like that. 
I said, while waving my hand around. She just apologized, so if I just rub it in her face that would make me look quite rude. We'll let them look for now your appearance and fight under good thing. She said as her cold eyes peered into mine. I couldn't just teleport away the staff at UA know about me having that quirk comma. I said while staring back at her, matching her gaze. She'd really love to blame some of this incident on me. But this hasn't gotten much to do with me. If she had paid a more trustworthy mercenary group, none of this would have happened. We'll talk more about this another time. For now, I've got quite a few calls to make. She said as she waved me off. I guess the property destruction was also not all that appreciated. Oh well, she can suck it. Not like I injured any civilian. I quickly walked into my shower, and a feminine gust surprised me. It seems I did walk into Toga in the shower in the end. Sup comma I said as I also got in. She stared at me with wide eyes, before she narrowed them and smiled mischievously. I don't actually plan anything, but I really don't want to stink up the room. If my room smells of sewage, then that would be a bit hard to explain now, wouldn't it? Oh, you're so bold I knew you'd come in eventually. Calm down kid, you're years off from seducing me. Not my fault stop monopolizing the shower. I just ignored her and started washing the sewer off me. She just pouted. So you're really not gonna do anything? What did she expect? That I'd turn into some horny teenager or something? Get out if you're done comma I told her as I continued ignoring her. No need to be mean. Not like I have anything to do. She said as she walked out of the shower. Well I had a pretty shit day I said as I continued to scrub my wings. Yeah, I can smell it okay. That's pretty rude. Her words burn harder than Endeavor's flames. Don't mention it fuck off the day continued normally after that at least for me. I'm sure I caused quite the panic for everybody else POV narration. The day did indeed not progress normally for anybody else besides Beru. All of the heroes that were part of the capture team were left in a daze. As the villain escaped right from their grasps. It was an extreme embarrassment to all of the heroes present. Many now saw this event as a sign that Japan was in danger. And many didn't know what to do. It was quite clear that the heroes failed to catch even one of the members of the organization that endangered them and the public. This all became public knowledge. As the entire fight was broadcasted on television. And many saw the way Beru had managed to shrug off several punches from All Might and other top heroes. The police didn't really waste any time though. Using all of the manpower that was present they apprehended Wolfram and his associates. They pinned half of the blame from the heist on them. So they made that arrest publicly to appease the masses. Wolfram's men all received reduced sentences and Wolfram himself was only on house arrest. This was also part of Wolfram's deal with the police. The mercenary leader was not foolish enough to believe that he could escape so simply. But he also had different plans in his mind. He wasn't exactly the type to just wait out his sentence after all. All Might was left in shock as the villain had escaped right from his grasp. He didn't understand how a person could be so resilient. After all, the villain was certainly injured quite heavily throughout the fight. And it was clear for all to see. Sometimes his movements turned sluggish, other times he seemed to take a step in the wrong way. He certainly had some broken bones in his body. Moko was quite impressed at the man's pain tolerance. She was quite shocked to see him get up from so many hits as well as block punches from All Might himself. She wasn't big on idolizing others, but she could tell when someone was strong. And she knew that All Might didn't get his title just due to popularity. That man was definitely strong. So, the rabbit hero decided to make catching that villain her new target. Not to mention she found him to be quite interesting as a person, he was also more than capable of a fighter. The best thing about him was that Rumi wasn't really sure if the man even classified as a villain, or if the organization behind him was even villainous in nature. What type of evil organization sent someone to protect the civilians and law enforcement at the places they raided? It simply didn't add up, and she wasn't the only one with these questions. The head investigators taking care of this case were also quite stumped as to how to categorize this new organization. They simply had nothing to go off of. Beru's escape through the sewers was also unexpected. It was pretty clear that the villain knew the sewage system perfectly. It was likely how he had always escaped from the scene. This also meant that he had done a lot of research on each of the locations raided. This was all speculation on the investigators' part. They had no way of knowing that Beru was just teleporting away when turning corners and outside of the view of cameras. Overall, the situation left many of the public dissatisfied, and many of the heroes that attended the event were ashamed. One of those was also Mount Lady. She had been used as a bat to injure and ruin a few buildings. She had also gotten a concussion from being smacked into every building in front of the villain. But it was pretty clear to everyone present that the villain was holding back. It was in his job description after all at least the one he gave Mirko, to make sure that nothing too serious happened. Mount Lady was left with a bruised head, and she hadn't even managed to do any damage to the giant villain. She was even reprimanded by her team. She started holding a grudge for the shapeshifting villain. She vowed to hunt him down too, to get rid of her shame. Many heroes that were present that day made similar vows. Their pride had been harmed by the way Beru had swatted them like flies in his giant form. The shapeshifting giant was immediately called an S-class villain, but there was no picture to put up of him. They had no way of knowing his actual identity. So, the news just presented him as an unknown. It was just the duck silhouette of a man with a question mark in the middle of it. But his quirks and abilities were explained in detail. Has the ability to take the form of others, conditions unknown, and turn into a giant recorded up to 36 meters in height. Suspect seems to retain the strength of one, even when his size is normal. 
That was all they had about the villain. But the heroes weren't discouraged. They knew that this organization would pop its head out again eventually, and they certainly couldn't have all that many powerful villains. So, they all remained vigilant. Now, the day was also a bit exciting for someone else. Toga was always doing her best to gain Beru's attention romantically slash sexually, but she always made zero progress. Thoughts like am I not pretty enough, or is he interested in someone else, always popped up in her head when he was in the room, but Beru would always be warm to her, the circumstances didn't really matter to him, she would always receive a head pat and a compliment or two, but now, Beru had finally done what she had wanted him to do for a while, he had walked in on her while she was showering, she developed a habit of taking showers frequently for something like that to happen, but she didn't expect anything to actually come out of it, one could imagine the excitement of the slightly obsessed girl when Beru teleported inside the bathroom, although it was by accident, he was there nonetheless, and he didn't leave. His actions after he realized she was there were also exciting to see for her. But, when seeing that he wasn't even budging when she was trying her best to make him look at her, she gave up. It took her a while. But she finally had realized something. He isn't interested in my body. She didn't really know what to make of that revelation. On one hand, she knew that Barry cared about her a lot. It was evident by the way he acted with her. He didn't seem to allow others to take many liberties with him. But she was always allowed to do anything. So, while this realization left her a bit disheartened, it also gave her a warm feeling. Because it confirmed something that had been bugging her a bit. Beru's care for her had absolutely no ulterior motive. His love for her was pure. It wasn't tainted by any desire or ulterior motive. Even if it was purely platonic, there was always this question at the back of her mind. Does he really care about me? She always had the nagging thought that he was just there for something. But she just couldn't understand what that thing would be. Barry didn't have anything to gain out of helping her. Besides her body that is. Or, at least that's what the infatuated girl's mind brought her to. She didn't mind it though, she genuinely loved Beru after all. And if he wanted to have her body, if that would make him stick around and not abandon her, well, she was more than willing to give. Beru was not entirely aware of this. He always thought she was just playing around with him. But he could also tell that some feelings were there. He did his best to subtly shoot them down when possible. But he didn't want to see Toga hurting. And he specifically didn't want to be the cause of that pain. He had already decided to help her through everything. But he didn't want her to consider him everything she had. He wanted her to become her own person. To grow up beautifully. Happily, surrounded by people that she could trust. Not villains and crooks. His convictions were strong. And his will to see her succeed was great. He hadn't mentioned this to anyone. But Toga was a large part of his decision to remain in Japan and partner up with the commission. He wanted to be there for her. And doing so while on the run would have been difficult. He couldn't even think of a feasible way to do so. Fleeing the country wouldn't have been difficult. Sure, he would have had to forget about everyone that he knew. But that wasn't really hard for the insectoid. He had done so in the past, although for different reasons. But he knew that he wouldn't be able to help Togo if he did something like that. So, he decided to just partner up with the commission. Even if they were shady. Even if he knew they smelled of nothing but trouble. What else could he do? Teach Togo about the excitement that normal life could bring while being a fugitive. But, he was quite satisfied with his life for now. There was only one thought nagging at the insectoid's mind. It was banging on the back of his head. A question waiting to be answered. But one he was afraid to seek the answers to. What happened to Salma? But fear wouldn't be able to hold Beru back for long. He was soon going to look into his old childhood friend. Even if he had to rip apart a few scientific institutes to do so. EOV Beru. Now, how do I go about finding where Salma was taken? I could ask Wyama. But that would just make me owe her a favor or something, and I want none of that. Asking Nezu might be a much better alternative. So I guess I'll do just that. I walked myself in front of his door and knocked a few times, until I heard a faint come in. I opened the door, and I was quite surprised to see Toshi was also there. I haven't really spoken to him in private after the whole mess with the internship, but I could see him look at me oddly a few times. I think Izuku must have told him some things about my way of handling villains. Or maybe it was my view on heroes. Oh well, maybe he was just busy. EOV narration. Both Toshinori and Nezu were a bit surprised to see Beru standing at the door. They had been inside the office speculating on where exactly this new villain organization originated from. They were both quite confident that it had some ties to All for One even if they were no longer under his control. All Might was obviously a bit worried, but he was still confident in catching that villain. As long as there was no one nearby and he could go all out, then he was sure that he was capable enough. Even with his waning strength, he was still the symbol of peace after all. There were still plenty of problems though, such as what exactly was the objective of that organization. Nezu did come to a few conclusions. He noticed that there was no monetary incentive, he knew that they weren't interested in actually hurting anyone. So, he managed to theorize a few things. The organization seemed to be trying to catch the attention of someone. And by the reaction of that agent that the organization had sent, it wasn't a person in that particular group of heroes. Nezu knew that the heist could have been done for a variety of reasons. But this was the most probable choice. He was in the middle of discussing his theory with Toshinori, when he heard knocking on the door. Nezu knew that the teachers couldn't have been the ones to knock, they were supposed to be at their classes currently. Barry hadn't really visited Nezu all that often after his deal with the Hero Public Safety Commission, although the two would still speak on occasion. And Toshinori didn't really know what to think about the young hero. On one hand, he knew how positive an influence he had on the people around him. On the other, he also knew that Beru was extremely brutal with villains. 
It certainly didn't help that Bera's ideology seemed to be somewhat skewed. All Might attributed that to the young insectoid's troubled upbringing. But, in actuality, Bera's upbringing was only one of the many factors that formed his character and ideology. His actions in the past shaped him into what he was currently. Laid back, cynical and somewhat ruled by base instincts at times. Just like he was when he was after all for one, just like he was when he ripped off Stain's arm. Bera was by no means a villain. But he was also far from being the perfect hero that the younger generation saw with their starry eyes. To All Might, Beru was now the embodiment of all the injustice hero society was capable of outputting. The symbol was admittedly afraid that Beru would one day just snap, as there was simply no way for anyone to hold him back. He could only hope that the next generation of heroes was better than the last. Even then, Beru was only going to grow stronger. Toshinori was always worried for Beru. But the incident with Stain and the account of his pupil solidified that worry. He could no longer consider Beru a safe individual. Nezu himself was oblivious to his friend slash employee's misguided thoughts. He was currently just answering a few questions from Beru as the two just sat around and spoke calmly. So do you have any idea where they might have been taken? I made sure that they were raided and captured. But I have no idea where they ended up. Beru's voice did eventually break Toshinori out of his daze. Finding him would be difficult depending on who we ask. I might have to contact the chief of police for this to be smoother. Nezu sipped from his small mug as he looked a bit confused. Nezu knew better than to ask why Beru was interested in one of the gnomas that had been captured. He didn't know Beru's full story. But he could tell that the Nomu might have had some connection with Beru in the past. All for one did adopt quite a few children on the same day that Beru had vanished. From the same orphanage that Beru had lived in. So Neza could easily guess Beru's reasons. What exactly will you do with this information? I'm just curious. Nezu asked while looking at Beru seriously. He didn't want Beru to go on a spree there. He was well aware of what the situation with the Nomus would be. There was nothing they could have been used for besides research. So, Neza needed to know whether or not Beru was planning on anything unsavory. Although, he was quite unsure if he was even going to try and stop Beru. He could somewhat understand the situation after all. I want to know where he is. I don't really plan on doing anything now. I can't really undo his transformation by myself. Beru's words were quite calming to the principal. He knew that Beru was quite honest with him. So he didn't worry much about it. Still, there was something else weighing on his mind now. What if the researchers aren't really trying to fix the Nomus? It was pretty clear that the Nomus were perfect soldiers. And Nezu knew how the government would react to having that type of knowledge. There was a high chance that the facilities were currently trying to create more Nomus. But he had no way to back up his claims. They would just remain as worries for now. I'll look into it for you. I'll get back to you. Hopefully soon. Nezu said after letting off a large sigh. Thanks a lot. Nezu we should really go drinking more often by the way somewhere legal this time. Nezu just chuckled a bit as Beru left the room. See you too Toshi. I'm sure we'll get more chances to speak comma. Beru said as he walked out. All Might also muttered a goodbye, as the young hero closed the door behind him. EOV Beru. That went surprisingly well. I was expecting Nezu to probe into my motives a bit more, but I guess he's always been perceptive now. What exactly is up with Toshi? He seems really on edge all the time. The dude looked almost constipated earlier. Well, I guess he'll tell me if it's important. I doubt Toshi of all people would have something against me. It's probably just my paranoia sneaking up on me again. I've always had that problem really. My senses aren't always right. But I can sometimes spot out some unusual behavior. These moments seem to have become more prominent now that I have all of these powers. I guess my base senses are enhanced greatly. Regardless, I don't really get why Toshi is acting the way he is. But he is genuinely looking concerned sometimes. I guess all of it will come out in time. Right now, I don't really have much to do though. Toga is in class, and most of my friends still do have jobs I could use a walk honestly. Or a fly, I guess, maybe I should go fly around somewhere of nothing planned right now anyway. POV narration. Lady Nagan had been doing her best to go around unnoticed. She went from a loved hero and a hopeful member of society to a fugitive over the course of working for the Hero Public Safety Commission. The missions she did with them took a toll on her psyche. She simply couldn't look at her fans with a straight face. She could no longer smile as brightly as she could. Especially when knowing the truth. She knew just how feeble their society was. There was a thought at the back of her mind. For the cogs and gears of their modern hero society. For all of the safety that it promised. The fate of many innocent people within that system was to be consumed by the system. People that didn't conform to the usual standards. Those that were deemed as villains or terrorists. Heroes that would use their power to take advantage of others. And, she had seen it firsthand. The struggles would never be recorded in any books, never reported on by any media. The people that were deemed to be a threat to the commission weren't always villains after all. They also chose to get rid of corrupt heroes. It was a practice that the commission had employed for many years. And she had been one of the people doing their dirty work for them. Taking orders, she closed an eye and accepted the commands she was given. Eventually, her hopeful nature disappeared entirely, replaced by a depressed state of mind as the bleakness of their hero society started becoming more and more apparent with each mission she took on. So many heroes she had killed so many people, just to preserve the fragile image of their happy world. All until she simply could no longer stomach it. She snapped when the previous chairman of the commission had threatened her, due to her unwillingness to carry out yet another mission. After killing so many people, putting a bullet into the chairman's head was by no means difficult. Her escape from their HQ was a bit more difficult though. 
The instant she shot the chairman, she jumped out the window behind him, which had shattered due to the bullet she had aimed at the man's head. She managed to escape her pursuers eventually. She immediately ran away from her hometown, only collecting a few of her belongings, and walking off from province to province. She didn't truly have a fixed home. She just drifted around the country for a while. Eventually, she also caught wind of Barry's situation. His life wasn't a story that she was unaccustomed to. His case was very high profile. Most pro heroes knew about him, but that was the first time she had heard anything about his connection to the Public Safety Commission. She was quite confused at first, but then she realized that this story was likely an agreement that they had come to behind the scenes. After all, if Barry worked for the commission, she would have definitely been one of the people to know of that. Still, the news somewhat saddened her. Yet another young man caught in the webs that the commission had planted. He was promised a clean reputation, but she knew that the commission wouldn't have given him a nice deal for that promise. She had no way of knowing that a 17-year-old, actually 40-plus, was devious enough to both understand his position and negotiate terms evenly with the commission. To her, Barry was just another victim of circumstance. Although an extremely powerful one. Now, he became another worry for her. After all, she knew that the commission had no plans of letting her go. She knew that every step she took would prove dangerous to her if she was not careful. She didn't even know if she was going to be captured alive or not. But she didn't like the idea of finding out. She was currently spending her time in a remote village. She couldn't afford to be seen in any major city for fear of video surveillance, so only secluded places were suitable for travel to her. She had heard of the weird series of heists that spurred up not long after Barry joined the commission, but she didn't look too deeply into it. Although she did come to the conclusion that the situation had some ties to the commission after more information on the situation came up, such as the fact that a single organization is responsible for all of it, and their goals being hard to discern. She was able to tell that it was an attempt to lure her out, although she found said attempt quite laughable. Currently, she was strolling around a small village. She was a bit away from the main road as there was some festival currently happening in there. She didn't really wish to come to face with anyone and run the risk of them recognizing her. But she was quite unlucky today as she ran into someone she didn't really expect to run into. A random silhouette walking around the forest right by her side. A tall, mutant, quirked individual covered in a black exoskeleton, leaving marks into the soft soil with his claws with every step he took. This was no doubt Beru, the young man that had been part of the commission for a month or two at that point. Lady Nagant could only hope that Beru hadn't noticed her. Although, her hopes were shattered almost instantly. Oh, someone else is here. The insectoid looked straight at her with curiosity. The fugitive just gulped, her eyes widened in worry. How exactly was she supposed to escape from this man? He was far stronger than her, and they were basically in an open field where he didn't need to hold back at all. The trees might as well not have been there. She quickly brought her palm to her neck, sprouting a rifle out of her elbow, and shooting Barry Square in the chest. She didn't want to be caught, so she decided to be the one to act first. Quite a lot of dust was raised when her shot connected. She coughed a bit as she looked at where Barry was supposed to be. She could only slightly see his unmoving silhouette. Well, that was rude, comma, Barry said as he waved his hand once, creating a shock with only powerful enough to disperse all of the dust around them. It also made Lady Nagant take two steps back. She took another gulp of her own saliva as she saw that Barry was completely unharmed. He was looking at the bullet she had used curiously. He had caught it in between his fingers. By now, despair was somewhat etched into her features, and Beru finally noticed who he was looking at. EOV Beru. I certainly wasn't expecting to meet Nagan all the way out here. How exactly did I end up near a village in the middle of nowhere? Well, that's a bit difficult to explain. I used my geographical skills to roam around in the air, but I ran into a bit of a complication. I was forced to come down after almost crashing into a plane. Then I almost crashed into a flock of birds. I landed on the ground near that village, and I wanted to see what the deal with the festival was, so I started walking through the forest for a bit. Well, I could have just walked there, I had already seen the village from up high, but it's really been a long time since I've walked through a forest, so I figured it wouldn't hurt. I also ran into this woman out here. I thought she just got lost or something, but I guess she's actually just hiding in the area. Lady Nagant has been a curiosity of mine ever since the commission started talking about her to me. You can't really help it. A huge organization trying and failing to catch a single person for the better part of a year is really amusing. I was also curious about her personality. They say she shot the previous chairman unprovoked, but then they go on to explain how she was actually a hero and a loyal member of the commission. So yeah. I don't really buy much of the story the commission told me. You know you don't have to panic all that much, right? I decided to speak out since this lady looks stressed out to the point of collapse. It's weird to have this effect on people. At this point, there isn't really any enemy of mine that acts any differently from her. Well, maybe some villains cry in fear or something, but that's not any better. Having people fear you is nice and all but it's really tiring. It would be nice if she got over that fear, so we can actually carry on a normal conversation. I can't really help it. It's been a good ride, but I guess they finally found me. She just sighed and looked at the ground for a bit. I guess she's given up after seeing that her bullets are ineffective. What are you on about? Does she think the commission has found her or something? Those guys were pretty far off from finding her. I think Oyama is currently trying her best to cook up another scheme to capture Lady Nagant. But it will take a while. She already has to clean up the entire heist incident. Well, you are working for them, right? The commission. They are the only 
only ones after me she said acting all sad and shit. Well, guess telling her about my deal with the commission doesn't really matter. EOV. Narration. Nah, I'm more of a private contractor I don't really care for their orders all that much. I'm more interested in you really. Lady Nagant raised an eyebrow in confusion at Beru's strange attitude. Now then my name is Beru, such a pleasure to finally meet you. I've been quite curious about you ever since I've heard that you splattered the old chairman's brain juices all over the walls. After seeing that she wasn't specifically comfortable with that topic, Beru quickly switched to some other topics. Like the oddity that was tax payments and how to avoid them. Or the way child support worked in the United States. The sided conversation left Lady Nagant quite flabbergasted. Beru kept talking on and on about random things. At first, she was quite confused, obviously WTF. But she managed to at least calm down. Well, my name is Shiro Makoto, although I'm sure you already knew that. She finally managed to get a few words in. At this point, it was quite obvious that Beru had no interest in capturing her. Beru instantly became an interesting thing in her eyes. How come he was able to escape their control? Or is he just lying? She wanted to find out more about his situation. The scene was set, the atmosphere was decent. All that was left to do was to talk. EOV. Narration. Wait, so she just took all of that without complaining? Asked Lady Nagant with a confused expression. Her previous downtrodden expression was replaced quite quickly. She was currently speaking to Beru casually, as the two of them sat down on the grass. Obviously if she steps out of line she will be breaching a contract, and that wouldn't be too good for her. Beru's confident words gave Lady Nagant quite a bit of clarity. She had been somewhat confused at the way he talked about the public safety commission, but it seemed that the young insectoid didn't even see them as a threat. Rather, it was the other way around. Wyama, the current chairman, was the one basically walking on nails while around him. They had signed a contract, but they didn't hold equal power at all. At least not in reality. Wyama must have realized that after signing it. Because there was simply nothing she could do to make Beru do anything. He had gotten his payment up front. And taking back their words if he was to breach his contract would completely ruin any credibility that the commission had. Beru had completely played the government-funded organization. And they had no way of doing anything about it. They were simply forced to accept any whim that Beru might have. Just like how Wyama couldn't complain when Beru brought her a few encyclopedias worth of documents to look through and find actual blackmail material. This entire situation was making Lady Nagant quite happy. To see that the commission was being somewhat undermined after everything they made her go through was somewhat cathartic. You should have seen the look on her face. Dash, she was trying so hard to not let her cold face crack. She didn't even look me in the eye. Beru said while laughing and holding his abdomen. I can somewhat picture that. Lady Nagant said with a smile. One that she immediately suppressed. For a moment, she managed to forget all of the things she had done. All of the people she had killed, the fans she had disappointed. For a moment, after such a long time, she was able to momentarily enjoy herself. All because of someone very similar to her. Then, a question arose in her mind. How do you do it? She asked while looking at Beru. Beru immediately stopped laughing and looked back at the former pro hero. How are you so cheerful after taking so many lives? She had a hard time wrapping her head around the situation. She knew what Beru had gone through. All for one must have made him kill people quite often. That was her train of thought. She wanted to know, how exactly was Beru different from her? How was he able to be so happy, so glad to be alive? There weren't any traces of insanity in the mutant quirk young man. Well, that's difficult, it depends, I guess. Ash, most of the people I killed deserve to die. They don't even cross my mind a second time. But there are a few innocent people that I killed. Beru's words made Lady Nagant widen her eyes in shock. His perspective was tinged with a strange sense of melancholy. One of a man that had seen many things. One of regret and acceptance. Not something that a 17-year-old should have been capable of showing. Villains, kingpins, gang members, criminals in general. My sympathy doesn't extend to them, except for a few rare cases. But the faultless ones, innocent people that died because of me or were killed by me, they are the ones that weigh on my mind. Barry gazed into the forest with a wary gaze. His eyes narrowed and as some steam came out of his mouth. Lady Nagant was simply left with no words. His words kept appearing in her mind. To not care about their lives at all was she truly capable of that. She had a hard time keeping the facade of a hero while taking all of these lives. But she didn't know if she was actually capable of taking human life and not caring at all. She had lied to her fans, to the people that looked up to her. She pretended to be someone pure, a righteous hero. But she was actually a murderer. I don't know what you've gone through. But I want you to remember, so long as your gun isn't pointed at those you're supposed to protect, then you're not doing anything bad. Beru's words made her break out of her self-pitying spree. She looked at Beru. Her lips trembled a bit as she started speaking once more. I have killed people hundreds of them while working for the commission. I was their enforcer. Lady Nagant slowly started venting out to Beru. She told him of how she simply couldn't take it anymore, and that the old chairman's threat to her was simply the last drop in the bucket for her. She told him of how she could no longer face the children that were idolizing her, of how ashamed she was of who she had become, and of how mad she was at the fragility that hero society had created. Its foundation was built on hopes and dreams, and people were endlessly suffering to make sure the illusion wasn't broken to the rest of the public. I see. 
Dash heroes have always been a strange topic to me. When I heard of them at first, I thought that the concept sounded quite nice, but then realized that most of them were just walking billboards. Ash it was strange. Lady Nagan also stared into the forest as she listened to Barry recounting his experience with the title of hero. Then I learned more about them, and it became somewhat clear most heroes just go on to become idealistic puppets that dance for the press. Ash they exist to calm down the public, and to give an illusion of peace bearer's words, seemed to have some sort of effect on Lady Nagan, she was somewhat aware of how bleak things were. But it was weird to hear it from another man's perspective. Barry was speaking as if he was an outsider looking in. And, in all fairness, he is exactly that. He wasn't originally a resident of this world. He was observing things from a different point of view. It was as if a person that lived in a democratic state moved into a communist dictatorship, to give an example. They would obviously see things differently from the natives there. Well, we can't really act all gloomy about it. This world has a lot of beautiful things. This shouldn't completely invalidate it. No matter how you put it, heroes are still there to protect people. And that's what matters in the end. Um, you have a strange way of speaking. Are you truly a teenager? Lady Nagan couldn't really help but ask that question after hearing Beru speak in such a manner. Mayor don't think too much about it. Beru's response seemed awkward, but Lady Nagan decided not to inquire too much into it. Well, this has been quite interesting. It's honestly been a pleasure to get to talk to you. I'd have to leave now, though I'm sure we'll meet again, though Beru slowly got up. The former pro hero also got up with him. Indeed, it's been a decent talk. I think I needed someone to vent to. Thanks for listening and for telling me about your experience too. This time, Lady Nagant spoke with a smile, one that she didn't really bother to hide. It was a bit strained, it wasn't completely natural, but it was there, and it was a beginning. That much made Beru happy. Till next time take care of yourself, a purplish mist seeped out of Beru's body. It slowly started swallowing him. You two said Lady Nagant as she watched the young hero disappear. After he left, she continued walking through the forest. Not long before she heard a few bangs. Looking in the sky, she could see the fireworks from the nearby festival. Her eyes glowed a bit as her smile became a bit more natural. EOV Beru. Damn, I wasn't expecting Lady Nagan to be such a troubled individual, but I guess I should have expected that to some extent. Not everyone is absolutely comfortable with killing people even if they're criminals. Still, the state she was in at the beginning really made me feel bad for her. It makes me want to help her now. Problem is, I don't really know who to reach out to if I am to do such a thing well. Nezu might be a safe option, but I've kinda been reaching out to him every time I have an issue. And I'm starting to feel a bit ashamed about it. I guess I can look for other ways to help her. Not like Nezu is the only person I know POV narration. While Beru was talking with Lady Nagant, someone else was also thinking about her. More specifically, thinking of a proper way to apprehend the hero. Wyama didn't like the losses that the commission had sustained. While trying to catch Lady Nagant, trying to find any more alternatives became somewhat redundant to her. It also became clear that Beru wouldn't really be of much help with this issue. While he was the strongest man alive, it was still quite a bit for him to find her randomly. It was worse than finding a needle in a haystack. Especially since Lady Nagant was especially skilled at hiding her tracks. Therefore, Oyama decided to do something more drastic. Something that would affect her more. Take someone that she cared about hostage. Lady Nagant was still a child at some point currently. Her only living relative was her mother. And Oyama was going to take advantage of that. And, thankfully for her, she already had an identity she could use to do this hostage situation publicly. The police were still looking for that mysterious organization. So all things could be blamed on them. She would soon call Barry to inform him of her new plans. And, even if he decided that this matter was now beneath him, the commission had enough agents that could take care of such things. But she still hoped that Beru would accept to help her with the plan. Having him was basically reassurance that nothing would go too wrong. Like how he managed to easily escape the encirclement of a lot of pro heroes, including a few of the strongest in Japan. Sure, that might have undermined the influence of heroes for a bit, but it still proved how efficient he was. Oyama couldn't really be mad at him for that. Wolfgram and his group betraying them was something she should have foreseen and prepared for. It was a failure on the part of the commission, and Beru had been forced to escape due to them. Oyama was at least glad that Beru didn't actually start fighting the heroes seriously and defeating them. That would have been a much tougher blow to the reputations of all pro heroes countrywide. Oyama was planning on telling him to release a broadcast, giving Lady Nagan around one week to show up to a certain place to retrieve her mother. She was planning on having that secret organization hijack every monitor in the country for a few minutes every day. That in itself would make some people distrustful of the security that the government could give them. But all of these problems could be fixed in time. Lady Nagant was currently the most troublesome factor to the commission. She held far too much information for them to allow her to move freely. Summon Beru here. I have something to talk to him about. She spoke to her secretary through an interphone. The secretary simply gave a positive response and got to work. EOV Beru. Who the fuck is calling me now? I just arrived on top of this building. I also just figured out who to contact if I want to help Lady Nagant. I looked at my smartwatch to see that it was none other than Wyoma's offices. Great. Now she wants something from me. I wonder what it is if it's related to Lady Nagant, then I might want to know of it. I didn't even respond to the call. I just teleported in her office. She almost jumped in her chair when she saw me suddenly appear. What? Is all I asked. 
I don't think I need to elaborate since she's the one that called me. I really hate formalities well that was rather quick. Yay, it's called teleportation, get to the point. I don't have all day. I do, but not for you. Well, anyway, I called you here to discuss our next course of action regarding the Lady Nagant situation. She said as she looked me in the eye. I can kinda guess that she seems to be your biggest issue currently. Although I don't think she's going to be revealing any secrets anytime soon. If she was planning to do that, it would have happened long ago. Probably before you even partnered with me. I need to somehow convince Oyama. That Lady Nagant isn't this big a threat. I need to make her a bit less of a priority in the eyes of the commission. I am aware of those things. But she still has the possibility of doing that. And it's not something that the board of directors likes. Of course, it's always due to somebody else. I bet the commission is just but at that Nagant didn't listen to her commands. Their leaders seem to be very replaceable. So I doubt anyone is actually mourning for that guy. Lady Nagant became a rogue element for the commission. And they don't like that. I am also a rogue element but I'm a bit too strong for them to deal with. So they can't really do anything other than hope that I keep helping them from time to time, and that I don't start killing them, which I won't for no reason. Okay, so what exactly is your plan? I need to know this if I want to help Lady Nagant. Knowing this organization, it's probably something morally dubious again. You see, we've recently managed to find where her biological mother is living, we plot POV narration. Oyama was immediately interrupted by something strange. It wasn't a sound, it wasn't any physical cue that Beru didn't enjoy hearing that plan. It was something else. A feeling of pure, Condensed dread. She could see Beru just staring at her. His cold gaze seemed to be cutting into her flesh, flaying her skin. It made her gulp. I is something wrong. Her cold and commanding demeanor disappeared completely. She was terrified for her life. Not a thing please continue his voice was calm. The feeling of dread in her heart vanished as Beru tilted his head innocently. Oyama had somewhat forgotten about it. She had somewhat gotten accustomed to Beru being laid back and quite relaxed at all times. She forgot just how dangerous he was. Not just on paper. He wasn't just strong. No, he was a frightful individual in all aspects. An actor, a manipulator. He could play with his own emotions like it was nothing. His laid-back demeanor only served to subvert people's impression of him. She should have been more careful with her words. All those were her thoughts. In truth, he was a good actor. But he didn't bother acting when he was around his friends. Not in this life. Beru was a very calm person. He was quite difficult to anger. But, since he had just gotten to know Lady Nagant, and he knew what the commission had made her do, and the effects they had on her psyche. Well, let's just say he wasn't pleased. His empty eyes gazed into hers. She could see his antennas dancing around a bit as if happy. But she knew, she could feel it in her bones. He wasn't happy. Abu well she continued to explain the plan to him. This time, the feeling of dread had lessened greatly. And Beru was acting like usual, responding like usual. But Oyama still didn't find the situation normal. There wasn't any gesture in the previously extremely animated Beru. He wasn't the type to stay idle. He would always move his hands stretch in the middle of conversations some would find that rude but it was just how he talked well all of that was missing here bearer was almost completely unmoving only moving his mouth to respond in his antennas from time to time the only thoughts on his mind how am i supposed to help lady nagant now a few solutions were lining up in his mind he could kill everyone present in the commission including the board of directors but he was sure that he wouldn't be able to escape persecution if he did that. His efforts to get rid of his criminal record would be washed away just like that. Not only that, Lady Nagant would still be on the run. So he wouldn't even be able to permanently help her. No, he needed to talk to some people. Getting rid of her criminal record was simply impossible. Therefore, he needed to find a way to lessen the charges waged against her, get her a reduced sentence. And, to do that, he was going to have to contact a person he had met before. One he didn't even know the name of, the chief of police. Well, that is the plan we have come up with, say, will you help us? Wyama spoke a bit calmer, having somewhat regained her composure. Although she was still just as vigilant, Beru was brought out of his thoughts by her. Sure, I can handle most of it myself. Beru knew that dissuading the commission would be difficult. So, he decided to just do it himself. He would make sure no harm actually came to Lady Nagant's family. And if she showed up, he would need to be prepared for an arrest. He needed to prepare to reduce her sentence already. You can send me the details on where to find her family later. I have a few things to do for now. I'm sure we'll meet again until then Beru then walked away. He headed directly for the police station in Musitafu. He needed to get in contact with that chief of police as soon as possible. And, right after he left... Oyama released a sigh of relief. Then she quickly started to contact a few people POV narration. The dog-headed police chief Kenji Tsuragami looked at the figure that was sitting on the chair in front of him with quite a bit of anxiety. The police chief wore a neat and unwrinkled black suit with his usual Dalmatian-themed tie. He had just finished looking through some cases. He was preparing to assign some of them to different detectives inside the police force. At least until he heard a small knock on his desk. Looking up from his files, he could see the dark and brooding figure of a white-haired man with a large toothy smile. To the side of the room, he could see an open window. The man in front of him also wore a black suit, much in the same style as his own. The chief of police was shocked to see the way this person just appeared. Who are you? Kenji asked as he prepared to press the small button underneath his desk. That would alert the entire police force and all of the heroes inside Musutafu of a villain entering his office. 
But at the same time, something told him that this situation wasn't a dangerous one. If the man in front of him wanted to kill him, he would have died already. No, the white-haired man likely wanted to strike a deal with him. I believe you should know me quite well, comma. The white-haired man said as his appearance seemed to shift. His white hair became a bit longer and turned bright red, his toothy green was covered by a familiar gas mask. His classy suit transformed into a suit of combat Kevlar armor that mercenaries often used. It's you Kenji muttered as he watched the change happen in front of his eyes. Kenji did not doubt his identity in his mind. It was clearly stated that the man had a shape-shifting ability besides his gigantification one. There was only one thing on his mind. Kenji didn't know what to think of it. His logical mind told him to simply press the button underneath his desk, but a small part of it also wanted him to hear out what the villain had to say. There was simply no evidence on him and his organization and he didn't have any illusion that the villain would be caught by them. So, the best he could do was to listen and look for clues about the identity of the organization. Indeed you can somewhat guess that our organization doesn't mean you any harm. Kenji just nodded at the villain's words. It was pretty evident that their organization wasn't a violent one. This representant of theirs had even held back against dozens of heroes, making sure that none of them would even get seriously injured. But the villain continued. We are currently working against some part of your government. His words made the police chief raise an eyebrow. A part of a government. That doesn't sound exactly well-intentioned. He said, giving the villain a fearless and skeptical glare. Well to be exact it's a government funded organization I'm sure you know of it. The Hero Public Safety Commission. Kenji's eyes widened when he heard that name. He was obviously knowledgeable about the commission. He wasn't ignorant to the way their hero society worked. He knew that the commission was tasked with making sure the wider public remained somewhat ignorant to the otherwise bleak reality that was the rising villains and crime rates across the country. They had many roles, but they were basically the arbitraries of all heroes. Any public action that a hero would take would be reported to them. If it was one of greater significance, then it would even be reported beforehand. The commission's wrongdoings were also something that he had been trying to look into ever since he was seated as the chief of police. Kenji knew far too well that the commission wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but he still needed to know more about the reasons of the organization seemingly working against them. And why exactly is your organization against them? Kenji asked in an attempt to bring out more information about this strange organization that seemingly appeared out of nowhere. It's quite simple due to some information we have found on them a while back. We have deemed them as dangerous for the safety of many members of the public. Our organization was formed with the very purpose to bring those facts to light. The villain's words intrigued the police force chief. The villain's words made sense. Every action that the organization had taken served to undermine the image of heroes in the eyes of the public, and by extension, the influence of the commission overall. He had no way of knowing that those actions were actually just the commission shooting themselves in their own feet. So he took the villain's words as the truth. Believing a villain wasn't something that the chief of police was prone to doing. But he also knew that the man in front of him was not a villain. At least not in the traditional sense. He was by no means a threat to the wider public. Hell, he wasn't even a threat to heroes and policemen. He was more of a vigilante than anything. I see so your organization aims to undermine the commission. Why? That question was still important. Kenji was hoping to coax the entire reason out of the representative in front of him. That, my friend, is something that you can find out if you help us. His words made Kenji sigh. It obviously wouldn't be this easy. He wanted to know what the commission had done to spur out the creation of such a powerful organization. But, are you proposing that I join you? He wasn't willing to go so far for that information. He was regarded highly by all of his peers. Joining hand with a villainous organization wouldn't look good on his resume. God, no, you are a man of status. I wouldn't propose something like that to you. I am merely here to ask for a favor in exchange for that information. The villain's words rang into Kenji's ears. He instantly realized something. I've been played. He was lured in by his curiosity. He was basically told that someone had their hands on a piece of information that he needed. One that he had looked for the better half of his career. Then, just as he was about to hear of it. Just as he was about to gain an outline of the sins that the elusive commission had committed, he was stopped in his tracks and asked for payment. A favor. It could be anything. It could mean anything. The notion of it made the chief feel quite strange. It won't be anything major of that I can assure you we wouldn't ask for anything unreasonable. The villain's words sounded genuine. But they still didn't help relieve a lot of Kenji's anxiety. This might be the only lead I could ever get on the commission was the thought weighing on his mind. I am willing to hear out what your organization wants from me. But I won't make any promises. Kenji spoke eloquently. He perfectly hid his interest. Unbeknownst to him, the person sitting in front of him, who is obviously buried by the way, had this on his mind. Hook, line and sinker baby. A certain person will soon be arrested. We are looking to see if that person could receive a reduced sentence. His words made the chief raise an eyebrow. That doesn't sound quite as tame a request as you have previously put it. He said as he looked at Beru. This person is the most important to us. She is the key to bringing to light the atrocities that the commission has committed. She is their old enforcer. She also used to be a hero. Going by the name of Lady Nagant, the chief once again raised an eyebrow. Lady Nagant. I've heard of her case before. It's said that she murdered the old chairman in cold blood. Although that was never confirmed to the public, Kenji spoke while he stared Beru in the eyes. You haven't heard everything about it, there are many things at play here. And she is the one that will be able to tell you everything. 
But you can't let the commission get their hands on her, Bearer's words got through Kenji quite quickly. A reduced sentence is it really necessary for this case? His question was valid. After all, he could just question Lady Nagan after she was captured. That woman has suffered enough. We can assure you that she isn't a danger to anyone if she was. We wouldn't have bothered to talk about a reduced sentence. Kenji once again raised a skeptical eyebrow at the words of the villain. Don't look at me like that we all strive towards the same goal creating a safer world for people to live in. Once you learn of what the commission does through Lady Nagant, you will understand this better after saying that, Bera got up. I believe this talk has been quite fruitful, but I'm afraid I must leave now Kenji you have a week to think about this. She will be apprehended in a week I hope you choose right, comma. Beru said as he jumped out of the window. The chief of police was left staring blankly at the window. This guy acting as if I have a choice so devious and manipulative. They must have looked into me beforehand. They likely know that I am after the commission he stared back at his desk. How am I even supposed to turn this down? I am basically a puppet to them now. I will do their work for them and reveal the commission's deals to the world. Meanwhile, they can just look through the shadows at the way things occur. This even knowing that. I can't just refuse to take this chance. The commission is something I've been aiming for a long time. I guess I'll have to see about Lady Nagant's sentence too after hearing her story that is. I can give her the minimum punishment. But she will still likely serve two or three years in prison. What have I gotten myself into? As Kenji was thinking and analyzing his situation, Beru had gone for a victory drink. He could tell that Kenji would help him. He had no idea of the chief's desire to find out more about the commission. But he could just tell from the man's voice and tone. He had gotten him in the bag. And, just like that his partnership with the Hero Public Safety Commission was slowly coming to an end. POV Beru. Damn, that was really close. I almost ran out of that guy's blood. I really need to find a few more faces to take if I want to continue this whole secret organization charade. Oh well, I have a week to waste. I don't need to bother thinking about it now. Thankfully, I can somewhat take the appearance of the people I consumed the blood of before I even got Toga's quirk. So, I decided that it would be funny to take on all for one's appearance at the beginning there. Unfortunately, the chief of police couldn't tell who I was, so that prank fell apart quickly. Still, I have somewhat managed to get a deal for Lady Nagant. Now, I just need to get her to testify against the commission. Well, I need to tell her about my plan, so that she can somewhat play along with it. But I'll do that later. I've already met her once, and now I also know where to look for her. I sat with her for an hour or two just speaking. I can probably just track her smell. Now that I think about it, if I just went to her apartment or something, and managed to get a whiff of her scent, I probably would have been able to track her quite well. But I guess that didn't really cross my mind at the time. Whatever, I met her already, no longer important. Um, what should I do for today? I still have quite a lot of free time even with all of these developments. Nezu should be somewhat busy with my requests hey, why don't I go ask Namuri out? It's been a while since I've spent some alone time with her. I'm sure she'll appreciate it. I doubt her class is all that interesting anyway. EOV narration, a purplish mist enveloped Beru, and the next instant he was in the school premises. Looking through the walls, he could see that Namuri was teaching her class in peace. Most of the girls were asleep, the boys were all preoccupied with ogling her to make any noise. Beru immediately walked in front of the classroom door and opened it. He, what's up with this dead atmosphere? He immediately spoke up, his tone immediately woke up everyone in the class, as they all looked shocked at his entrance. Namuri just sighed and looked at the door. Hey, I'm holding my class here, she said with some degree of exasperation, although it was quite clear that she was bored out of her mind. Yay, that's great say, have you ever been to an amusement park? His sudden question made all of the students look at the situation with interest, especially the girls, obviously, but I don't see how that's real as she was interrupted almost instantly. He, that's great we can go now it was as if he didn't even hear her answer, which made her sigh. I'm a teacher you no, she asked, still thinking about her job while looking at her students. What do you teach? Beru asked while crossing his arms and looking at the students. He could see the boys in the class foaming at the mouth with jealousy. Something that gave him quite the smug mental smirk. I teach modern hero art history. It's a complicated class that she was about to start a monologue about the importance of her lecture. That was more for the students than Beru. She wanted them to actually pay attention to her from time to time. Well, maybe it would have worked. If only Beru didn't interrupt her again. Great, let's do that at the All Might themed amusement park. Ash surprise field trip. Beru didn't give her any more time to refuse. He teleported her, as well as her entire class to an amusement park in the vicinity of Musutafu. Hey, what's this supposed to mean? She asked with a fake angry tone. She was trying to put up an angry face in front of her students. But she was quite glad that Beru brought her to have some fun. Eight kids me and Namuri here will go do some adult stuff. You brats can have some fun around here, each of you gets 20,000 yen. Ash spent it responsibly Beru walked away for four seconds, then returned with a bag filled with money. He walked the money, which was achieved through totally legitimate means, totally not walked out of a bank, into the hands of each respective child. Not gonna spend my own money on this was his thought process in this case. But, in truth, Beru had a long way to go before he finally became unaccustomed to crime. They all seemed quite excited at the weird turn that their somewhat boring class had taken. Now, they all ran around looking for things to spend their allowance on. That's highly irresponsible and extremely reckless. 
That's what I would say if I was Azala. What do you want to do now? Namuri said with a playful tone. By the way, what type of adult stuff are we doing? I didn't see any hotels nearby. Her playful tone was much in line with Barry's expectations. Oh, all types of stuff. What do you want to start with? Dash, we could try some foreplay on the water slide ride or maybe for penetration on the hero landing slingshot. Ash, oh, I know how about a blow job on the All Might inflatable castle. All of Barry's suggestions were completely refined and well-intentioned. Not one innuendo to be found in them. Yeah, sure, his suggestions made Namuri laugh out loud. The surrounding people also looked at them weirdly a bit, some of the girls turning a bit red. Namuri held her stomach as she took off the mask from her costume. You should have told me that you were planning something like this. I would have dressed up a bit. On Beru's mind, this phrase appeared. Planning. What is that? Can I eat it? The very notion that any of this was planned was a mistake on Namuri's part. Since when does Beru plan these types of events? But his answer would obviously not be idiotic, like his thoughts are. Don't worry I have yet to see you look bad in anything. But I guess I should take you to change into something more comfortable. His comment instantly made Namuri flush red. She was quick to recover though. As she spoke up a bit. Yeah. That would be nice. She said, her cheeks still slightly red from earlier. Beru just nodded as he created another warp gate. This one leading directly into her room. Do try to hurry though we only have like two hours before Nezu gets mad at me for abducting a class comma. Beru said as Namuri just giggled and entered the portal. While Namuri was off changing, Beru received a phone call. Watch call. How does one name this? It was from Nezu. Yeah. Ashi answered with a bit of uncertainty. You know I still have surveillance in all of the classes, right? The principal's emotions couldn't be discerned from his tone. Um, I mean I obviously knew that Beru's tone certainly didn't help to convince Nezu. You hum so, I'll say this. You are completely responsible for the students while they are on that trip. And I want them back on school premises before all classes are over. Unharmed. Nezu's words were calm and collected. He didn't sound angry, just slightly frustrated. Probably because the school would get flack for their injuries if something were to happen. But, at the same time, Nezu also greatly trusted Beru. If they aren't safe with him they aren't safe anywhere was his train of thought. Of course Jude. Ash I'll call you when I teleport them back also. We totally need to arrange another employee drinking party. Beru was relieved when hearing that Nezu didn't insist on cancelling his fun time. Hopefully not before a workday this time. Anyway, I'll leave you to it. Be careful. Nezu said as he hung up his phone and continued with his work. This was a common case of speak of the devil. Beru was somewhat taken by surprise, with the way Nezu had been so nonchalant about him taking a class away randomly. But he obviously didn't complain. Namuri didn't take long to come out of her room. She was wearing a yellow summer dress. It was somewhat low-cut revealing quite a lot of her cleavage, and it was also short in skirt length, which somewhat showed off her long legs. For shoes, she wore a pair of matching yellow sandals. All of that was paired together well with her purple rimmed glasses, to match her beautifully combed hair caught in a ponytail. All of that was done in less than 15 minutes, leaving Beru quite stunned. Her current getup was a lot less risque compared to her usual wardrobe, which meant that she likely didn't wish to attract much attention. Big mistake, Beru was not exactly an unrecognizable face. This whole ordeal was quite a pleasant surprise to her. Her lack of one-on-one -on -one interactions with Beru the past few weeks had been quite frustrating. She didn't even realize how much she enjoyed spending time with him before he started always being away doing other stuff. Well, she did know that she liked spending her time with him. She just didn't realize she'd miss him so heavily. She did get to speak with Toga more often in that time. Her last lunch with him had left the best possible impression it could have. She still wasn't sure if what she was feeling was truly love. But she was 100% sure that she wanted to spend more time with Beru. Seeing him waiting for her in the middle of that crowded carnival was quite pleasing. Excitement was growing within her as she wondered what Beru had in store for them. And to her surprise, the day turned out to be even more exciting than she first expected. Exhibit A. Their first adventure was while waiting for tickets for a random ride. An old woman approached them and started preaching to them about public decency and the way young people would dress nowadays. Namuri was oh so close to putting that old woman to sleep. Well, not really. She had self-control. But she was being annoyed to no end. But Beru's response was somewhat unexpected to her. Ha, huh, Dash, you pervert. Ash, just because I've not been wearing clothes you've been ogling my body so intently. He covered his chest with one arm, while the other swiped his own antennas backwards. The old woman recoiled in fear and walked away with a scowl. Pervert. Ash, don't come back here. Beru shouted at her back as he turned back to waiting in line. Almost as if nothing ever happened. Although the people in line all certainly heard the exchange, some of them even filmed it. Namuri was left giggling to herself as Beru continued acting as if nothing happened. The day went on in that tone. Exhibit B. Beru also ended up learning more about the procedures at that carnival. Wait, so I'm supposed to hold on to this with all of my strength. He asked while staring at the employee. They were currently on a ride called Hero's Slide. It was a flat platform with chairs around it that tried to make the riders slide off of it by spinning at great speeds. There were some bars at the edges to prevent actual serious injuries. The last person standing up straight would get a reward, a large plushy bear. Yes sir, don't worry. The metal has been made to withstand the grip of those with strength quirks. When Bearer heard that he gave a fake sigh of relief, walked over to that bar and started holding onto it with force. The metal bent around his fingers as Namuri watched the scenes with a wry smile. She had been the one that said the bear looked cute, it was partly her fault. The ride spun at great speeds, everyone had been knocked off their feet by the end of it. Only Bearer was still standing. 
looking around with quite a bit of dizziness. He hadn't even moved one bit from his position, still holding onto that bar. When he let go of the bar, it was very clearly bent leaving the employees quite flabbergasted. Still, they were unable to blame it on him, as they told him specifically that the bar would hold him up. Namuri's time with Beru consisted of such happenings. They spent a total of four hours at that amusement park, all until Beru had to go and gather all of the students, and walk them back to their class. In the end, it turned out to be quite a fun day for everyone involved. Namuri was left quite disappointed that it ended at all. Still, she was left standing around alone with Beru, in front of her apartment. This time, she was completely lucid, and a thought appeared on her mind should I invite him in. EOV narration. Should I invite him in? Namuri didn't have anything planned once they went inside. She just wanted to spend more time with him. It was still early too, so she was sure Beru wouldn't get the wrong idea about her invitation. After all, they weren't really at that stage yet. Namuri looked at the tall insectoid with a questioning gaze. Say, wanna come in for some tea? It's still early anyway, so I doubt you have much planned. She was somewhat right about Beru not having anything planned. And he didn't really have any reason to refuse her invitation. Sure, I'm pretty much lazing around the rest of the day anyway. He just shrugged and they both walked into her apartment. He looked around a bit, it was quite neat. It had just about anything a single woman would need to have. A bathroom, a kitchen, a living room and a single bedroom. It was a decently sized apartment and Beru quickly found his place on the couch. While Namuri ran to make some tea and maybe bring some snacks. What kind of tea do you have anyway? Ash does it have alcohol? Call. Beru shouted while he turned on the television and looked a bit at the news. A small sum of money has seemingly vanished from the Tokyo National Ban apostrophe. Beru proceeded to change the channel to some cartoons. A bit of sweat was present on his brow. What? What tea has alcohol in it? Asked Mimuri with a confused voice. There are plenty my favorite was the Zentinus comma he said while channel surfing. That's a cocktail you actual re you know what? You do you. She said as she walked in with two steaming cups of tea on a tray. Even though she was about to insult him, the warm smile on her face was quite pleasing to the eyes. Thanks for today. It's certainly been one of my most memorable ones. She said as she took the first sip of her tea. Her smile somewhat rescinded at her own words. She was somewhat forced to remember that she was quite a bit older than Beru. Even if the insectoid didn't look, speak or feel like a teenager, she was still reminded that she was older than him. Stop speaking like an old woman, you'll have plenty of memorable days to come. I'll probably be in plenty of them too, comma. He said as he also started drinking his tea. And just like that, her lips raised once more. Is that some type of proposal she looked up at Beru and asked with a playful tone. Kinder early for that tuts, we've just had a first date you're not getting any ring for that comma. Beru said with a bit of a chuckle. Ooh, so that was a date, huh? She asked with a raised eyebrow. She was likely trying to embarrass Beru to hide the redness in her own cheeks. Obviously what? Do you think I'd just go out to amusement parks with beautiful women randomly? Beru turned his head towards the large bear plushie he had won at the park. His straightforward comment managed to shut her up for a bit. Sue, are we a thing now? Beru could somewhat hear the uncertainty in her voice. It would have made him raise an eyebrow, if he had any. Well, we can be, but there's no need to put a label on what we have for now. That would complicate things quite a bit. Beru tested the waters with this comment. He was obviously implying that the two of them were a thing with his earlier comment. But he didn't want to cause Namuri any discomfort. And he saw something that he didn't quite like. As Namuri also nodded on reflex. She instantly regretted it afterwards, but the thought was still there. Beru already knew this about himself, but wasn't expecting the Muri to be the same. They were both extremely afraid of commitments. For him, it was something that he had attained throughout his life. Maybe it was a result of his early life. Maybe it had to do with the fact that he was never the type to fall for anybody. Maybe it was because he found it hard to trust others with his feelings. To say you love someone is to leave yourself vulnerable to them. And Beru didn't like that one bit. In this life, the only person that had given him that feeling of vulnerability was all for one. But not due to love, obviously. Still Still, the feeling of helplessness was what drove him to grow much stronger than all for one. It wasn't quite as easy when it came to affection. Beru could obviously show others affection as seen with Toga, but he was somewhat reluctant to admit it. So, it leads to this awkward situation. Namuri's case might have been different. Maybe she fell for someone wrong at some point. Maybe she couldn't really bring herself to fully trust someone so easily due to that. Regardless, these aspects managed to put quite a damper on their relationship, at least for now. Maybe this wouldn't have been the case if Beru was as straightforward with his feelings as he was with everything else. And Amuri would obviously be able to tell that she had basically rejected Beru. This is why she instantly regretted nodding her head. Well by the way, how come you became a teacher? Beru asked in an upbeat tone, somewhat ignoring the failed confession that had happened earlier. He wasn't really the type to let himself get all sad over a rejection. Oh, that's a pretty amusing story Namuri kept talking about things. But her mind just told her why did you change the subject. She didn't vocalize that thought. She probably hadn't realized just how sensitive Beru was to the emotions of those around him. That ability of his was what made him change the subject in the first place. That and his desire to not inconvenience Namuri. Their conversation continued for a while, with the two of them talking about a few random things. All until Beru got up and took his leave. 
leave. The subject of their relationship wasn't brought up even once after that. Namuri didn't know how to bring it up, and Beru didn't want to make Namuri uncomfortable. The second Beru teleported away Namuri slapped her own face a few times. Why unfortunately for her, this small misunderstanding of theirs would take a while to be addressed, as Beru was bound to have a few busy days ahead of him. In the end Beru ended up spending the rest of his night raiding some shady bars. He had this amazing strategy of raiding criminal owned bars to be able to confiscate the merchandise drink freely. And so, his night continued as if nothing happened. By the time he got home Toga was also done with her training. She now also had one of those capture weapons that Azawa had. Although she didn't really know how to use it all that well yet. The night passed quickly, and the next morning started in force, as Beru received a phone call from none other than Nezu. I wonder if this is about Samor and the rest POV Beru. It's unusual enough for Nezu to call me so early in the morning. I mean, he's barely called me at all as of late. So this can only be about one thing really I answered the call with a sigh. Morning Nezu glad to see you reach out to me. No reason to greet him with any tone other than friendly. Indeed. Sorry to bother you so early, Beru. But I think I managed to find what you were looking for. Nezu's voice sounds somewhat tired again. This guy should really learn how to take a break from time to time. But I guess that as long as I don't insist on it, he also won't do it. That's nice and all, but how much sleep did you get? I said with a bit of concern in my voice. I only got a small chuckle as a response. That and well. I don't need a lot of time for rest. The last few weeks have been somewhat busy too. At least he's responded. If you don't get a full night's sleep tonight, I will knock you out for the entire day tomorrow. This is the best solution I can think of right now. I'll check on him in the morning. If he's tired, then I'll put him to sleep forcefully. Haha, <laughs> I hope you're joking. But anyway, I found out where the Nomis were taken after the police raided Dr. Kayadai's old hideout. He got to the point quickly. I guess he's got some stuff to do after this. They are currently being held and researched at Japan's greatest and most advanced laboratory. They are being personally overseen by a scientist called Goda Yori. Um, that name sounds somewhat familiar. You might know him, since he's one of the people that used to be interested in you. Currently, it seems that he is still completely focused on the Nomis. Nezu seems to have looked into this quite deeply. I guess this Yuri guy isn't really all that secretive an individual. Or maybe Nezu's information network is a lot better than I previously expected. Regardless, at least now I have a location. That research institute is somewhere around Tokyo. Outside the main city, but still somewhat close. I see well, I'll probably end up paying him a visit, comma, I said while twirling one of my antennas with my finger. Well, he's probably going to be expecting you. He's the one that gave me all of this information. After realizing I was looking into him, Nezu sounds a bit concerned with good reason, I guess. It seems this guy does actually care about his privacy. And it also seems that Nezu is recognized as my representation by the government. This makes some things a bit difficult. I thought Nezu wouldn't be seen as such since I'm really great friends with the commission. But that farce probably didn't fool anybody in power. Sounds a bit shady what's the chances this is a trap. I don't really buy that his interest in me died down so suddenly. If anything, him gaining Kaidai's research files on me should have made him even more interested in me. I'm afraid the chances of this being a trap are quite high. But I'm unsure as to what type of trap he could have prepared. How exactly would it be able to hold you? I guess the only reason Nezu isn't as concerned as he's supposed to be, is that I'm strong enough to take care of myself. Sounds like a fun way to spend my afternoon. Maybe he'll even bring out something that interests me. My words seem to make Nezu quite nervous for some reason. Beru please try not to kill him. He is currently the brightest mind in the country. The government won't let you go this time. Don't give them more wood to put on the fire. I guess his concern is well placed. One can only get away with murder so many times. It's pretty clear to everyone ever that I was the one to inquire about the location of the Nomis. If this guy suddenly died it would 100% be blamed on either me or Nezu even if not officially. And that would be a bit annoying ah, uh, politics, if only brute strength was the answer to everything. Well, it might be, but it doesn't lead to a satisfactory outcome at all. Killing off an entire government won't really be beneficial to me in the long run. I also just started living a seemingly normal life, throwing that away so quickly would be a bit of a shame. So, I guess I should just seek him out for a conversation. Well, I doubt he'll do anything major during a first meeting. Don't worry I know how to hold back, there's not much he can do to threaten me anyway. My confident tone must have calmed down Nezu, at least slightly. Do be careful though if things look bleak, don't bother holding back at all geez. This guy is still concerned about me. Sure you should get some sleep while I go deal with that comma I said as I proceeded to hang up the call. EOV narration. Beru was quick to start heading for Goda Yori's laboratory, right after the call had ended. He walked himself in the middle of Tokyo and flew the rest of the way. Yori's laboratory wasn't all that hidden, but that was because, unlike Kayadai, this one was completely legal. Beru didn't really bother going through the entrance, he simply looked at the building for a bit and decided to warp himself where the doctor was. And, he happened to be near on the main floor of the laboratory, surrounded by Nomis and other scientists. They seemed to be testing the reactions of some of the more powerful Nomis. Since they were separated from anyone that would give them orders, they weren't quite as responsive as Yuri would have liked. Yet, he couldn't bring himself to feel disappointed as of now. Why? 
because something much better than all of the Gnomas was currently making its way to him. He didn't really know when Beru would arrive, but he knew one thing, research will be much easier with him. Yori was currently looking into what Kaidai was before his death, creating a body capable of taking in as much quirk factor as possible, and he believed Beru to be the biggest asset to his research. At least he hoped so. He knew that not even the brilliant Kaidai Garaki managed to crack what exactly made Beru's body so special, but he hoped that he would be able to, using more modern technology. You can imagine his elation when Beru appeared in front of him. The rest of the scientists that were gathered on the main floor were scared at the sight of an intruder. Yori on the other hand, all of you, fuck off. He quickly shooed them away, ignoring the fact that there were many respectable figures among the world in that crowd. Yori was never the type to care about politics. No, he only cared about one thing, advancing the human race. And, in his eyes, Beru was the key to that. Damn, I kinda like that attitude not gonna lie Beru's first words to him were already to his liking. Yori was by far, one of the more eccentric people of higher standing in the Japanese government. Well, I can't let their stupidity spoil our very first meeting. I've been looking forward to finally meeting you. Yori immediately shook Beru's hand with a burst of energy. It weirded Beru out a bit but he didn't complain. Yori didn't show any hostility to the insectoid, so there was no reason to antagonize him. Yay, that would be a bit of a bummer comma, Beru said as he took his hand back and stared around the laboratory. He could see that the Gnomas were all unresponsive and staring into the void. Not much progress in fixing them, huh? His question somewhat shocked the scientist. Well, that's true. But that's because I'm afraid that doing so is impossible. Yori's words immediately made Beru's head snap at him. What? Beru's voice was calm. It didn't express the amount of anger that was inside him. Beru could control himself. But that was just because this was the expected outcome to him. I have made a few experiments until now Yuri started walking, signaling Beru to follow him. Even after stripping them of their quirks, they seem to be the same. Even if their bodies somehow recover, their minds are lost. Yuri's answer was plain, it was emotionless. But that wasn't out of a lack of care. No, the scientist did his best to undo what was done to the Gnomus. But it was simply not feasible. A very specific quirk was needed to repair mental damage. One that simply was not spotted in Japan to this point. And looking for it in the entire world would consume resources that the Japanese government was otherwise unwilling to spend. Yuri's hands were basically tied in that aspect. He could no longer progress with the undoing of the Gnomus. The two of them walked all the way to a more secluded zone of the laboratory. There could be seen a few Gnomus that looked slightly different from the rest. They had somewhat regained their human appearances, at least in some places, but they were much the same mentally, staring into the void, lacking any conscious thought. This is the result of my research. Yori looked at the room with shame. A failure was not something that he enjoyed showcasing, but it happened nonetheless. How did you even manage to take away the quirks? Beru's question made the scientist smile. Oh, I'm glad you're taking an interest in this. It's actually quite simple really. If you'd follow me once more, he gestured for Beru to follow him once more. This time, they walked a bit more entering an underground section of the laboratory, otherwise hidden by a trapdoor. That hidden section was made out of only one room at the end of a small corridor. Inside that room was something very familiar to Beru. In a glass filled with a strange concoction of liquids, supported by a strange mechanism, was the body of none other than all for one. Beru was shocked to see it. But the shock didn't last long, as the excited scientist started explaining things once more. You see, with Kaidai's notes, I learned how to copy Quirk Factor through DNA, something I had thought inconceivable before. Yori looked at the body of all for one with a smile. This part of my research has been kept as a bit of a secret from the government. I don't really like them snooping in on my business. Yori said as he looked at Beru with a smile. Beru didn't really know how to respond to that. He didn't really care for all for one's quirk being passed around. But it seemed that the doctor wasn't planning on arming the Japanese government with said quirk. What's your objective? That was the only thing Beru could say after being given that small tour of Yori's laboratory. Well have you ever heard of quirk singularity? The scientist's face became serious as this topic came up. Beru was about to learn a few interesting things. EOV Beru. Have you heard about quirk singularity? Yori's words sound familiar to me quirk singularity. Where have I heard of this before? I see the term sounds familiar to you. Well, it was a theory of Dr. Kaidai Garaki. You might have encountered it when reading his research at some points. Yori's words immediately reminded me of it. I didn't actually read it, but I did run into a few documents that briefly mentioned it. I have heard of it, but I don't actually know what it consists of. If you would be willing to clear that up for me, that would be nice honestly. I see no reason to be anything other than polite to this guy. He's been nothing but cooperative. He's even shown me his efforts in fixing the Gnomus. I didn't really see Salma between any of those. But there are many Gnomus. He's probably keeping some in different rooms. I wasn't expecting him to actually be this cooperative. I was prepared for a trap of some kind. But it seems this guy is more interested in talking to me about his research than anything else. He really looks like your usual Japanese middle-aged man. Black hair, wearing a suit and a lab coat. He has no special features about him but, for some reason, I can't get this thought out of my head. I think he's aiming for something. And I can't really tell if he's a good person or not. He's been keeping all for one hidden from the government, which I find really good. But he's technically been keeping it to himself, which can give off some massive red flags. 
I guess I should hear him out more before making up my mind about him. Quirk Singularity is more of an idea Kaiad Igaraki came up with it quite some time ago. It basically theorizes that with each generation quirks grow stronger. And slowly, the quirk factor will become too much for our human bodies to handle. Yori took a short pause and breathed in a mouthful of air, before continuing. We can already observe that quirks are getting stronger by generation. I think we only have a few dozen years left. Before we start seeing the adverse effects of excess in quirk factor, he looked at all for one's body this time. Quirk factor, for your information, is the collective physical and genetic traits that compose a person's quirk. And through all for one's research, we know that all humans have a limit as to how much they can contain. Yeah! I already knew that. I pretty much know most of all for one's research into Nomus. A lot of things were talked about while I was standing around pretending to be brain dead. POV narration. Yori's expression was quite grim as he explained to Beru the inevitable fate of humankind. Yori didn't quite want to believe that theory at first. But slowly, when looking around himself, he realized that, just like Kaidai had theorized, quirks only grew stronger and stronger with each generation. It slowly became clear to him that Kaidai's theory was happening right before his eyes. The end of the world was slowly creeping on them, and quirks were to be the sole reason for that abrupt ending. He knew that, at this point, it was only a matter of three to four generations before cases of quirk factor overload, as the doctor decided to name them, appeared. They would manifest rather simply, either causing unusual and harmful mutations causing the death of certain organs, or simply reaching a state similar to cerebral death. Yuri could see the end of humanity right around the corner. Yuri didn't report his findings to anybody. Kaidai's theory wasn't a state secret or anything. It was publicized scientific research, and it was not taken seriously at all. After all, how could quirks be bad for people? The over-reliance of the populace on heroes and quirks lead to them not believing that theory at all. And, by extension, they were blind to the swiftly approaching end of mankind. It was a depressing thing to witness. Yori didn't consider Kaidai a good man, not in any aspect with one exception. The man was simply a genius, a revolutionary. That much was simply impossible to deny. Even Beru, who loathed Kaidai with every fiber of his being, couldn't deny the fact that the old sadistic scientist was intelligent. Yori continued speaking after thinking for a while. There are exceptions, people capable of supporting a lot more quirk factor than your regular person. But you are by far the most advanced example of this. From Kaidai's notes, you can support quirks endlessly with no repercussions. I think I know where this is going was the only thought to be found in Beru's mind currently. I have basically lured you here for that reason. It's not that I have something against you, but I think you are the only hope humanity has Beru silently stared at the Yori, as the scientist gave him a speech. Your body is the only thing capable of endlessly containing quirk factor, if somehow, by chance, I can replicate that, then humanity might actually be saved. Beru could see the excitement in the man's gaze. He could see the hope, the desperation. There were a few things he didn't know, like how the scientists first planned to try and capture Beru, before scrapping that concept entirely. If all for one and Kaidai couldn't keep him contained what are my chances? His train of thought had been somewhat affected by the excitement of seemingly finding a solution to mankind's imminent doom. Yori was clinging onto a small hope his research on the Nomus also continued Kaidai's to some extent, as both of them tried to find a way for humans to gain more quirk factor without repercussions. But there came the issue. Kaidai couldn't find anything about me. What makes you think you'll be able to? Ash I find your goal to be quite noble. But success is anything but a guarantee Beru's words were rational and realistic. Yet it painted a bleak picture to the hopeful scientist. I I don't I can't assure you that this would succeed. But there is simply nothing left. What else am I supposed to do? The scientist was shouting at Beru this time. Under normal circumstances, Beru would have been a bit more aggressive when seeing a man shout at him randomly. But this man was not normal. Beru could see it clearly. The man was shouting not out of anger, but pure desperation. The situation became quite clear to Beru. The scientist was trying his hardest to prevent humanity's extinction, all by himself. All of that stress on the shoulders of one person. It simply wasn't healthy. Not for the mind nor for the body. Quote Yuri, I can give you some information. I will tell you something that I would have never told Kaidai. Not even on the mad scientist's deathbed, Beru stared into the eyes of the middle-aged man without any emotions. Yori's eyes widened as he scrambled to recover his composure. His shouting at Beru was a mistake that he quickly regretted. Thankfully, the insectoid didn't seem bothered by it one bit. My original quirk it is the one that gives me the ability to hold all of these other quirks. This is something that Kaido likely found out on his own. But I will tell you what my quirk actually is. Beru's words made the scientist quickly take out a small notebook. Yori looked at Beru with great expectation in his eyes. My quirk is inherently a mutation like you can guess but, it comes with several other abilities. For one I am capable of taking the properties of anything I eat, be it the toughness of iron or the softness of cloth. Yori looked at Beru with quite a bit of admiration. Such a powerful ability don't tell me. His eyes widened a bit as he realized something. From your face you might have realized it. But I can also copy quirks by consuming human DNA, be it a drop of blood or a strand of hair. My digestion is much quicker than other humans. So the effects are almost instant at that point, Yori dropped his pen. Nothing happens to the people that I copy quirks from, and nothing happens to me due to copying them. Beru's explanation needed there. He didn't go into greater detail about some aspects of his quirk, like how he wasn't even capable of speech before eating a parrot, or how he could perfectly combine quirks in a way that even all for one thought impossible. 
S, so you're telling me that your original quirk was already this powerful? Asked Yuri giving Beru a fascinated gaze. Indeed, but that's also why I am not of any use to your research. This body of mine isn't even human anymore. Kayadai's notes should have told you at least. That much Beru's words were like a bucket of cold water to Yuri. Especially after the excitement of learning of the insectoid's quirk. Ah yes. But there might still be some answers. What if we manage to replicate it? Yuri's voice was once again hopeful. That's not possible Kayadai was human trash. But he was smarter than you and me. Both even he couldn't even begin to wrap his head around what my quirk actually did. Let alone copy it. Beru really did crush Yuri's hopes entirely. But Beru wasn't exactly the type of person to do this for satisfaction. What you're doing it's a great goal. But I recommend looking into other ways of achieving it. I will help you. Obviously I will even get you two quirks to help you with your research. He decided that, in the end, helping Yori was in his best interest. Living a normal life for around 40 years, then getting to witness the death of mankind, wasn't exactly something Beru planned on. You'll help me. But how? Don't get me wrong. I don't doubt your intelligence, you'd be great help regardless. But what else is there to test on? Yori's voice sounded quite depressed. But he slowly seemed to become motivated out of nowhere. No, there are still chances. Your quirk might have not been what I've been looking for, but we might one day find that quirk, or we might be able to make one. We can't just give up now. We still have time. Beru watched with a bit of a wry smile in his mind as the scientist just cheered himself up. This time, the eye became a wee. It seemed that Yuri took Beru's offer to help seriously. Beru didn't know whether to find that annoying or reassuring. Oh, and what quirks did you say you'd give me? Yuri asked after circling a few times in renewed excitement. Well, I'll tell you after actually gathering them for now. You should wait around for a bit. Ash, continue your tests on the Nomus. Maybe you'll find something. Yuri just nodded resolutely at Beru's words. For now, I'll be taking my leave. I'll see you soon, Yuri. A purple mist seeped out of Beru as he spoke his last sentence. Yuri also said, I'll be waiting for you to contact me. Thank you for everything, Beru. Yuri waved at the disappearing insectoid. And so, Beru's first meeting with Goda Yuri had concluded. EOV Beru. I don't really know what to think about all of this. I can somewhat tell that Yuri isn't a bad person, but some of the stuff he's shown me still oaks me the wrong way. I don't really care about him having all for one's quirk, that's not horribly important to me. But his final goal is actually what I find more interesting. But I need to first personally look into what quirk singularity is. If I find out that Yuri lied to me, well, let's just say Japan might find itself in need of a new research leader. But even if his theory is a lie, I will still prepare two quirks for him. Which quirks exactly? Well, I plan on giving him life force the original quirk of Professor Kayadai, as well as a special quirk that a friend has. High spec is likely the most powerful intelligence boosting quirk out there. I've yet to hear any other like it overseas. At least not to that extent. Sometimes, Neza tells me about how his mind is more akin to a supercomputer. He can formulate countless calculations and build strategies almost instantaneously. His speed of thought is likely much greater than my actual physical speed. Sure, that's quite the claim, but Nezu can basically predict the moves of most of his enemies, if he were to fight. The only thing holding him back is that he is somewhat weak physically. He can't really fight at all. Someone with his quirk, even with the strength I had in my last life, would probably be deadly. I will also take that quirk for myself. I wish to help with the research that Yori will be doing in the future, and that would mean that I have a lot to learn. High spec would basically have me become a genius overnight with enhanced thought comes photographic memory. And that means that I can just skim through all of the books possible, and be of more help to Yori, than carrying heavy things around the lap. Well, if anything he said is even true, I have not grown to completely trust everyone instantly yet, probably never will. But his emotions, his desperation and hopes were pretty obviously real. I may not be the best judge of character. But I can at least read such basic emotions. Well, he did Kinder wear his heart on his sleeve. He didn't seem to bother hiding the fact that I was his only hope. I felt Kinder bad breaking his hopes like that. But it Kinder had to be done. Yori should be aware of it. If Kaidai wasn't able to replicate my quirk to the point where the mad scientist didn't even want to call it a quirk, then Yori doesn't have many chances. Even if he could, it's unknown what effects my quirk would have on others. That's something that would need to be tested, and some may die in the process. I also wouldn't really be willing to become a research subject again. It was quite annoying the first time, to say the least. Now, how exactly should I go about gaining Nez's quirk? Well, I could always steal some of his hair. But that would be quite dishonest. If anyone deserves to know more about my powers, then that's Nezu. I already told Yuri to get him to back off and not try anything funny with me. So the cat's already out of the bag. There wasn't any reason to hide it in the first place. What would Slash could they do if they knew anyway? It was just my paranoid nature getting in the way of me speaking the truth. Now, I guess I should walk to him and ask a few questions. Upon teleporting in front of his office, I could feel him sleeping inside. I instantly backed off. The dude's barely been getting any sleep, partly because of me. I would feel like the stinkiest piece of shit in Japan if I woke him up now. So, I decided to teleport to my bedroom. Classes are currently going. So I don't have much to do. Well, I guess I can go and talk to Lady Nagan about things POV narration. Beru immediately started looking for Lady Nagan after that thought. He started where he had met her previously. Her scent was still present for his enhanced senses. It should be mentioned that Beru didn't originally have a nose. 
but two small holes did appear somewhere in the middle of his head underneath his eyes whenever he tried to smell something. That transformation only appeared after he had devoured a wolf. He used his enhanced senses to track Lady Nagant by her smell. The insectoid found her track rather quickly. His land speed was greatly diminished because he needed to track her. Therefore, it took Bear around four hours to catch up with the runaway pro hero. Lady Nagant was currently walking through a forest calmly. She was admiring the smell of nature, looking for places to rest. It was still early. So she wasn't actually tired, but she still wanted to explore more of the mountain. And she didn't plan to remain in the mountains. She wanted to go back to the cities eventually. She had thought about what Berry had told her. She had decided to try and see exactly how beautiful the world she had been protecting was. She wanted to see just what had she been giving her sanity away for. She knew that depending on where she looked, she might become even more depressed. But there were also times when she remembered other things. The smiling children, the laughing elderly, the fireworks. She knew where to look to cheer herself up. But she wasn't yet prepared to forgive herself for killing all of these people, she wasn't like Beru. She wasn't a cold-blooded person. Beru, inherently, also was never cold-blooded. But his life and choices led to him becoming like he was. Lady Nagant thought she knew a bit about Beru's childhood, at least the documented parts. But the more she thought about his words, the more she realized that she didn't know enough about his childhood. After talking to him, she realized that she knew Beru as a person, but she had no idea what he had been through. What was written down could have definitely been fabricated. His words told the story of someone that had gone through many things, and she didn't believe them to be lies. The advice he gave her was sound, it was what made her try and move forwards. She certainly wasn't expecting Beru to appear in front of her again. Beru, what are you doing here? She asked while tilting her head. It hadn't been all that long after their first meeting. It was just a day prior after all. Looking for you, his words made Lady Nagant raise an eyebrow. What has happened? Did the commission find out about a meeting? Although she wanted to believe Beru that the commission didn't hold any power over him, she still feared them. Nah, but they're planning something it's pretty bad Lady Nagant could already guess what was cooking up in Wyoma's head. Beru's grave tone already gave her a foreboding feeling. She knew how the commission operated after all. I, I see. She instantly understood what the commission was planning. The only thought on her mind was, I guess that's it then I didn't get to witness much Lady Nagant didn't want her remaining family to be harmed. And she didn't know what to do now. She knew that, with her crime, the commission was going to pull some strings, as to either get her a death penalty, or life imprisonment. They were likely planning on giving her numerous charges after all, and they were definitely going to stick. Don't look so mopey I managed to talk to a few people I might have a way out of this for you. Beru's words immediately made Lady Nagant snap her head at him. Her eyes widened in surprise Beru was going against the commission for her. She didn't even know how to respond to that. B, but they have a lot of influence she still argued. Her knowledge of the commission's influence was the main cause of her hesitation. She didn't want Beru to harm himself trying to help her. And a lot of enemies I already paved a way for you to get a reduced sentence. Your case isn't all that well known to the public. But you'll still have to do a year or two in prison. The former hero's eyes widened once again. It seemed that Beru had come to her already prepared. In five days time you need to go to the chief of police in Musutafu. I will warp you there if need be. You need to testify against the commission. Beru's words were like a song to her ears. She had already lost hope in living a normal life with what she had done. But it seemed that Beru wasn't the type to give up so easily. Abu, when did you plan all of this? Won't you get in trouble? She asked, somewhat concerned for the young man extending a hand to her. I used a secret identity. The organization that ordered these heists is now an enemy of the commission in the eyes of the police. If Beru had any lips, a wide and devious smile would have been present on them. E but didn't the commission prepare those to lure me out? She asked in a confused manner. It took a second for what Beru had said to click for her. Yep, and the result of these heists led to so much damage to the commission that they would never be suspected as culprits. It was really easy to make the chief of police believe such a lie. Lady Nagan gained a bit of an amused smirk at those words. The commission fumbling on its own ideas was a huge factor of what made this plan possible. It meant that the commission inadvertently played a big part in the plan to get her a reduced sentence. She wanted to laugh, but there were still a few concerns on her mind. Abu, what about my mother? She didn't want her only living relative to be dragged into that mess. I'll protect her. I'll stall the commission's plans for a while, until the chief of police has built a case against them. At that point, you'll be the least of their worries. Beru looked around the forest for a bit. You should find a place to stay for now, so that I know of your location. Lady Nagan had a hard time figuring out how to respond to Beru's kindness. She also had something else on her mind, something she decided to vocalize eventually. Abu, why did you help me? Not that I don't appreciate it, but I want to know why. She looked at Beru while rubbing one of her shoulders. We're friends, right? Dash, that's what friends do if that's not a satisfactory explanation for you then let's just say I felt like it. And leave it like that she looked at Beru. This time, her eyes were a bit wet as a smile spread itself on her lips. She was thinking of her opinion of him now. On their first meeting, she had learned a lot about him. And he had learned a lot about her. She didn't know if she was supposed to call Beru a friend. She certainly didn't expect Beru to not even give it that much thought and call her one. She wanted to tell Beru about how she felt to express her gratitude once more. Just as she was about to open her mouth before Beru interrupted her train of thought by the way. 
Do you know how to build a cabin out of wood? She had closed her eyes for a few seconds, and she could now see that the forest around them was missing quite a few trees. She could see Bera making his hands larger and cutting up logs in different shapes. I've seen some stuff on TV. But I've never actually built one after she heard Barry saying that. She just sighed. She decided that burying him in thank yous wasn't the answer Barry wanted. So she stopped trying to do so. The two of them continued hanging out for a bit, figuring out how to build a house. Barry didn't want her sleeping on the ground after all. He even ended up going to a store and buying her a mattress and a few things for the house. In the end, the entire process took around 5 hours. It was already midday when Barry decided to leave. And Lady Nagant now had a beautiful cottage in the middle of the woods. Well, the two of them had it. Lady Nagant told Barry that she'd be expecting him to drop by from time to time. And so, Barry got back to his other assignments. He was a busy person after all, and Lady Nagant well. Lady Nagant continued relaxing in the cottage for a while, stealing herself for what was to come. EOV, Beru, I didn't realize building a cottage in the woods would be so fun, but I guess it was fun because it wasn't hard at all. If I swipe my claws with a bit more strength than necessary, I might end up making a deforestation company jealous. It was easy to cut the wood to split it into logs. It was a bit annoying to make the logs a bit better to walk on barefoot, for a regular person anyway. But hey, nothing a few tools I walked in couldn't fix. Still, Lady Nagant was a lot better this time. She didn't seem quite as depressed as the last time I saw her. I can't say that I mind, she's a pretty nice person to hang out with too. Well, she doesn't seem to be all that talkative. But hey, she does try to add things to the conversation from time to time. So, in the end, I managed to help her out too. Well, at least I hope so. I don't think the chief of police would betray a deal. He gets his dirt on the commission, and Lady Nagant gets her reduced sentence and immunity from the commission itself. I need to find a way to put her mother in a witness program of some kind. I will have to speak with the chief of police about it again. But I need a few more forms to take if I want to visit him. I'm kinda running out of transformation juice, other people's blood. Well, I guess I'll visit a villain den and refill it or something. I do want to leave this life behind me. But I still have a lot of things to fix before being able to live peacefully. The commission itself is something I need to fix. I can't act like a barbarian and go killing everyone. That would be a bit moronic of me. But I can fabricate information, actively plan against them, and seek allies to take them down. These are also things that seem to be working perfectly, so I see no reason to resort to violence as of now. As for right now, well, I guess I'll have to visit Nezu and talk to him about my quirk, and the way it works. I'll ask for two strands of his hair afterward, one to clone his quirk in the lab, and the other to use myself. Actually helping Yuri get more quirks relies on the fact that he's already got an all for one inside him, so his body should be capable of gaining more quirks. It would be inadvisable at best, a crime at worst, to give quirks to regular people. I know very well what stretching one's limits looks like in that regard, and I don't want to create any gnomus by mistake. So this will be the only instance where I will be helping anyone get more quirks. EOV narration. Barry teleported himself outside of Nez's office door. This time, he could clearly see that the principal was awake and working, sorting through some files. He politely knocked on the door before entering, and Nezu raised his head to greet Beru with a smile. One filled with energy. Great to see you Beru. I was so glad not to hear about anything bad happening to that scientist. Beru just stared at Nezu for a while before he started talking while approaching a chair to sit down. Oh, your lack of trust pains me greatly exclamation point. What am I to do if even one of my greatest friends doesn't believe in me question mark Beru's playful demeanor came as no surprise to Nezu who just looked on as Beru sat down. The two of them talked about random things for a bit. Beru explaining how he ended up building a cabin in the woods, he left Lady Nagan out of it though. Nezu talking about spying on students interacting with each other. All harm was fun. So, what's wrong? Have you come to call another night out? Or did something bad happen? Nezu did decide to get to the meat of the conversation. The principal could tell that there was something on Beru's mind. So he decided to press for it eventually. Well, I kinda want to ask you for something. It's not something hard really. And I also want to tell you more about my original quirk. Beru's words immediately made Nezu gain a serious expression. Gone was his relaxed smile. It wasn't the time for it, after all. I see how come you're willing to part with this much information. It always seemed to be a taboo for you Nezu's words weren't wrong. Beru always diverted any attention away when it came to his quirk. Not saying anything besides the fact that it made him stronger and more durable, besides the appearance change. But he would never mention more about it. He never talked about why the doctors, after he reappeared from the forest, failed to even tell if he was human. It was a strange thing to see. The ones doing the experiments said that his DNA was constantly changing, as if it was evolving in real time. It was simply impossible to get a good look at it before it changed again. Nezu was well aware of those discoveries, but he never pressed the issue with Beru. The principal didn't want to make it seem like he was trying to pry into Beru's personal issues. First of all, I don't only have one quirk, this is my personal discovery. By the way, one of them turns me into what I am, a mutant quirk that turns me into an ant but allows me to keep a somewhat human shape, Nezu nodded his head at that. Many had surmised that Beru was born with multiple quirks, and saying that he had one mutation quirk, would be like saying that the sun is bright, plainly stating the obvious. Woke the other one is what I didn't quite talk about at all. A quirk that allows me to permanently absorb the properties of anything I consume, gaining the toughness of metals, the venom of snakes, the poison of a mushroom. I can constantly transform my body to use the things that I've devoured. Nezu looked at Beru in shock. 
That wasn't quite what he was expecting to hear from Beru. The quirk Beru explained to him was simply amazing, but there was something else in his mind. Did that extend to taking the abilities of humans? Quirks. And, when I consume the DNA of any person I can shift my DNA to match theirs. Copying the quirk factor in the process, a single strand of hair, or a single droplet of blood, is all I need to permanently copy someone else's powers. Beru's explanation only made Nezu more and more shocked. And given training I can perfectly combine quirks well. Not all quirks only those that work together. But you get my point Beru's even told Nezu of this detail. Something that he had kept from Yori. Why? Well, Nezu was someone Beru knew that he could trust. If he was to come clean about his ability, then why hide this from him as well? That that's a lot to take in. Nezu finally responded to Beru. He still looked shocked at what he was hearing, but he wasn't shocked at Beru's ability. Beru's quirk was unheard of and extremely powerful. It was a lot better than all for one in many aspects. But there were still other quirks similar in nature, that copy slash take quirks. Simply knowing of the existence of such a quirk, would never have caused such a reaction out of Nezu. The principal was, after all, an extremely composed individual. But there was something else that was shocking to him. The absolute lack of superiority that Beru seemed to feel over others. A person with a quirk similar to his, all for one, would quickly believe themselves to be chosen by the universe, becoming self-entitled, and doing their best to make a point to everybody that they were superior. But he had seen none of that in Beru. Beru acted with maturity as if all of that overwhelming power was nothing but a tool to him. And, in a sense, it was the truth. Beru didn't consider power to be something that should define one's character. That was one of the reasons he grew to loathe All for One as deeply as he did. All for One was the exact opposite of Beru, in both characters and ambitions. Beru's ambition was simply to live a happy and fulfilling life alongside his loved ones. It was pure, and some would even call it a lot to wish for in his situation, especially when he had a propensity for getting in trouble. But All for One's ambitions were much grander. He wanted control, supreme power, and he strived for it with every fiber of his being. The man was so infatuated with his own powers that he had named himself the same he had named his quirk All for One. To Beru, that was simply a pathetic existence. What was someone even supposed to do with all that power anyway? What was the use of it in the end? A feeling of satisfaction at having achieved it was a guarantee. But what about afterwards? It was a foolish endeavor. Simply a waste of time. All of that satisfaction would dwindle in time. And it would eventually turn to madness as the person in question realizes the actual lack of meaning that their existence had. All for one was the very person that Beru loathed. But he was also just like Beru used to be. A person driven by desires, ambitious, always trying to get stronger for no particular reason besides being stronger. And, it should be mentioned that Beru considered himself to be scum. So all for one reminding him of himself wasn't a good point. Not like it was with Toga. She was the same as the current Beru in many aspects. She didn't wish for world domination, she just wanted to be accepted as she was. The only thing that she had similar to his was her obsession. And he couldn't really bring himself to hate her for it. Even if he really tried to, an obsession wasn't something easily controllable. But it was something she could overcome. All for one, however all for one was a lost cause. And, right now, as Nezu thought more and more about the way Beru carried himself, the happier he was that it was him, and not someone else to gain that ability. I am truly happy that you've shared this with me. What is your request by the way? Nezu finally said with a smile as he regained his bearings. Oh, I kinda need your quirk for something I want to help that researcher look into something Beru's words made Nezu raise an eyebrow. While the principal was happy to hear Beru be honest with him, it was still odd to have someone ask for your quirk. I only need two strands of hair really. Beru said while rubbing the back of his head. It was quite obvious to him that Nezu wasn't quite on board with the request. What exactly do you want to look into with that researcher? I'm assuming you want to help him too since you've asked for my quirk. Nezu face was serious, but he had somewhat recovered. Beru hadn't forcefully copied Nezu's quirk, so it was obvious that Beru cared about the principal. So, there was no actual reason for him to be mad at Beru. Say, have you heard about quirk singularity? Beru opened his mouth as an entirely new conversation started. POV narration. So basically, you and that scientist are both trying to prevent the downfall of mankind by yourselves. Asked Nezu with a raised eyebrow. It wasn't that he didn't believe Beru. But he just found the situation ridiculous. He had known about Yuri for a while, and many of the connections he had spoken of the scientist as a madman. They usually called him demented and other names. Nezu did find it a bit mean to the researcher, but he never made an effort to actually learn about the scientist. Yuri was a controversial figure in the field of science all over the world. He was somewhat well known for his strange beliefs, and he was thought to be one of the most mentally deranged individuals that were put in power. Nezu was quick to notice that Beru's description of the man was completely different. Beru spoke highly of Yuri, although there was some suspicion in Beru's tone from time to time. He never spoke badly about the man's character. It was bizarre even. Nezu had certainly not expected this type of outcome out of Beru's visit to that laboratory, but he notices some strange parts in that story. For one, this was the first time he had heard of the Curic Singularity Theory. But, after a bit of search on the internet, he found that it was simply an extremely unpopular theory due to its implications. Beru also looked at how easily Nezu found the theory and sweated a bit. He didn't think simply looking it up on the internet would work. But it seemed like the theory was as public as it could be. Much like Yuri, Nezu quickly noticed that a lot of the theory was unfolding before their eyes. I see I may have heard about this before, now that I think about it. But I think I dismissed it, like most other people. Nezu glanced at his monitor deep in thought. 
Can't really blame it on you, no one really talks about it. It's easy to dismiss it one, and forget about it. But, in all honesty, it seems to be pretty dangerous, Beru's words didn't make Nezu feel any better. Nezu now realized the implications that quirks, the thing people nowadays venerated to no end, could bring about the extinction of mankind. I hope the events envisioned in this theory don't unfold, but I think it's best to take precautions. You can copy my quirk. Two strands of hair, was it? Nezu said as he opened up a drawer and took out one of his brushes. He handed it to Beru, who just plucked one hair and put it in a small Ziploc bag. Then he plucked another one and simply ate it. Nezu watched, he was a bit fascinated by the process. He looked for any changes in Beru's demeanor. Wow hell this is how you see the world. Beru suddenly said as he looked around the room. The insectoid looked at his surroundings. It was as if everything was moving slowly. But, in fact, his thoughts had sped up greatly. He looked outside the window, and he could see that things moved so much slower. The leaves on the trees barely fluttered, the birds in the sky seemed to be lagging. It was bizarre to Beru, who was quite used to a regular world. It is normal to say that Beru was never slow in thought. He was actually thinking much faster than normal people already. That was due to the one or two quirks that all for one had to enhance thinking. But those didn't even come close to high spec. It was a different world altogether. Well, that depends. If you concentrate hard enough, time will basically stop for you. Well, not really. But your thoughts would flow so quickly that everything else would stop. Vera was quite surprised at how powerful Nez's quirk actually was. Having a supercomputer for a brain would obviously change your perception of the world. It might take a while to get used to this, Vera spoke as he looked around the room. Well, I'd assume so, most people would go insane from using this quirk. But I'm guessing you can actually turn it off, at least from what you've told me about your powers. Vera nodded at Nez's words. He concentrated a bit and managed to turn off high spec. The world turned back to normal and he just sighed. So it is possible to turn it off then. That's quite handy. I can't actually do that. I think that's for the best in my case though. I'm not exactly human after all. Nezu spoke as he looked at Beru with a smile. Damn all conversations must be unbearably slow for you. Beru spoke these words incredibly fast, leading to Nezu gaining a larger smile. Although Beru spoke quickly, Nezu heard him as if he was speaking normally. The effect of thinking so quickly was that everything else moved slowly by comparison. Nezu was quite happy to hear someone speak normally for once. And Beru was somewhat taken by surprise by the sensation that high spec gave him. A quirk like high spec basically made Beru impossible to defeat in a fight, as if he wasn't already. He could basically read his opponent no matter what. High spec was incredibly powerful there was a small problem though. Would Yuri really be able to handle it? Well, Beru could only think that as long as Yuri absorbed high spec into his copy of All for One, then everything would be alright. Well, I guess this concludes our chat for now. I do have quite a bit of work, and we've been chatting for a while now. Nezu said as he shooed Beru out of his office. See you try sleeping tonight. Beru said as he walked out of the office and teleported back to his room. EOV Beru. Damn, that quirk is freaky. It makes me feel kinda bad for Nezu. But he seems to be used to it already. So there's no reason to pity him. That never helps anyone anyway. Now, what exactly should I do with the rest of my day? I think Toga will soon be done with her classes. But I think she said that she would be training with Izawa today. So she might not come home right now, him. I guess I'll go replenish my supplies of blood. I'll pay the chief of police another visit tomorrow. Ash 15 minutes and one small group of villains disappearing later. Well, that was refreshing. Now I guess I could go and do something else. Finding criminals and drinking a bit of their blood isn't exactly difficult. I wonder what Pinky, Mina, and Izuku are doing. Those two are in the same class, right? They should be in their last class right now, so I could visit them. Yeah, I'll do that. Wait, what class were they in? I never thought I'd activate high spec for this of all things. But I guess the first time I use this quirk is to remember what the fuck was being said at that school festival. Pretty sure their class was named. After a few seconds of searching my mind, which felt like at least an hour to me, I remembered that they were from class 1A, from the hero course. This is obvious, but hey, better be precise. So, I looked a bit through the school building. Then I walked myself at their door. I just walked in and witnessed something strange. EOV narration. What the fuck are you guys doing? Beru watched in awe as one of the students was tied up to the ceiling in a very familiar type of knot. Said classmate was the shortest one out of everyone present, and he had purple balls sticking out of his head. He could see the blindfolded female students swinging baseball bats around, trying to hit him like he was a pinata. Um, Beru. Izuku looked embarrassed, the rest of the boys in the class seemed about the same to teacher. Well, there were only 20 minutes left of their class, so Izawa decided to sleep through them after telling the class to be silent. Beru looked at the corner only to see a distinct yellow sleeping bag leaned on the chalkboard. He could make out that he was also wearing noise-canceling headphones, so he wasn't aware of anything that was happening in his class. What are you doing here, you bug freak? Bakugo was still salty at having been knocked out that one time, Beru had long forgotten about him though. Who are you again? Beru's honest question didn't help Bakugo's anger at all. Izuku and Kirishima quickly jumped in to help Bakugo cool off, although Deku didn't help much. Eventually, probably due to all of the sound Bakugo was doing, everyone turned around and looked at Beru. The girls also took down their blindfolds to see him standing there. Mina instantly turned red in embarrassment and threw her bat away. 
which hit a certain yellow head lightning quirk user straight in the head. Beiru just looked at the disaster unfold. He walked over and sat down in the teacher's chair as everyone also got back to their seats. Beiru was basically a teacher in their eyes, he was a pro hero after all. Although, he was the youngest pro hero alive. So some of the students didn't really respect him, like Bakugo. But he even talks back to All Might, so that's normal. So what's happening here? Beiru looked at the short student that was still hanging from the ceiling. He flicked a finger in that direction, and the rope was cut. Mineta hit the ground with a thud and a pain grunt. Well, it's a long story. Mina said while rubbing the back of her head. That shitty grape was perving on the girls again. For such a long story. Bakugo sure did manage to summarize it perfectly. I see should I talk to Nezu about it. Beru didn't really care about it all that much. But having a future hero perv on girls wasn't really a good sign. Well, not really. Beru just didn't like the thought that Toga might end up in the same class as him. She was going to be transferred to the hero course in the second year. No, it's mainly just joking around. It's not all that serious. The one that spoke up this time was Momo. She was the vice president of the class. And she didn't consider Mineta's pranks to be deserving of any large punishments. Everyone else seemed to agree with her as Mineta burst into tears. Only one thought was on Beru's mind. Since when do students know bondage knots? Times have really changed his thoughts were reasonable. By the way Beru, what are you doing here? Asked Izuku while scratching the back of his head. Um, I was kinder walking around and decided to come and see what you guys were doing. Ash, Beru said while he rested his legs on the teacher's desk. Yida immediately fled up forgetting any of his thoughts about Beru's actions against Stain. Please refrain from doing that. It goes against the school's protocol. Yida continued while waving his hand around. Beru just whipped his head backwards. Anyhow, how are you guys doing? Asked Beru as he took his legs off the table. EOV narration. How are you guys doing? Beru's question went unanswered for a bit as the students all looked at the insectoid with an odd gaze. Well, we are preparing to go home at this point. Classes are almost done. Momo was the one to speak up. This was their last class. That was also why they could be so relaxed. And it was also why Azawa was sleeping. Their homeroom teacher didn't actually need a reason to sleep. He was always sleepy. But it was much worse after after a full day of classes with them. Well, there are still 15 minutes left. You guys aren't really an orderly bunch, comma, Beerus said while still stretching on his chair. Stop acting all high and shit. You are only like two years older than us. Bakugo once again felt the need to speak his mind. Well, yay, but I've taken down more villains than the majority of pro heroes put together. Dash, I do have qualifications to stand in this seat, although I never actually finished high school, quote, Beerus said as he rested his head on his palms. So what if you took down a few extras? I'm sure I can do the same given the opportunity. Bakugo still insisted though. He was quite clearly trying to incite Beru. He actually hoped that he'd get to fight Beru, that he could prove himself that way. To whom exactly? Well, that was a bit more difficult to answer. It was to none other than himself. Bakugo, like most young hero students, was aiming for the very top. He wanted to be number one. And he hadn't really seen Beru in action, as he was knocked out when he had fought villains during the USJ incident. So, he needed to personally see how large the gap between him and the top actually was. Unfortunately for him, he tried provoking Beru, a person more used to people trying that than anybody else in the whole school. So, anyway, what does Izawa teach? He knew exactly how to ignore Bakugo, and he could even tune out his irritated shouts and grunts. The rest of the class just watched as Beru paid no mind to Bakugo. They all already knew how powerful he was. They all saw him fight, and they knew just how powerful he was. They saw Beru rise an entire lake, and trap that strange bird villain in it. To them, the insectoid's strength was almost surreal. Oh, he's just our homeroom teacher. Izuku was the one to respond this time. Beru could see that most students were just speaking to each other about random things. All until one of them raised her arm. Beru instantly noticed that she was invisible, which he found somewhat interesting. Beru, I've got a question for you. She waved her arm in the air a few times before Beru finally responded. Go on, not like I've got anything better to do. Are you truly as strong as All Might? She was clearly curious. There were many articles written about the strongest between Beru and the symbol of peace. But there was no real conclusive answer. That was because the question itself couldn't be answered unless the two actually fought to the death. Yay, I'm a bit more versatile though I've got a few quirks in me. That kinda make his attacks ineffective, comma, Beru said. While he waved one of his hands dismissively. Abu, wait. So you have more quirks in you? Hagika asked with some confusion in her voice. There were very few articles on Beru's powers. The fact that he was experimented on was public knowledge. But his possessing multiple quirks wasn't really all that public. Wait, was that supposed to be kept secret? Ash, ah, it doesn't matter. Beru just shrugged at his own question and moved on. Shock appeared on the faces of every student present. They didn't quite know what to make of the information. Although a few had already guessed that he had more quirks. Yay, I have more quirks, at least a few hundred. Why are you guys even surprised? I used some of them in front of you all and on the news. I use different abilities depending on the situation. It's a bit too much for a single quirk to cover, isn't it? Momo just nodded. He was seen using countless different abilities while fighting villains. 
And she was one of the people that followed Beru's exploits quite closely. In fact, only five people in class 1 and knew about Beru's multiple quirks. That was because they all followed the news and read stuff online about the youngest hero in Japan. That's awesome. How do you even train all of them? It's gotta be so difficult. The invisible girl continued talking. Oh, I kinda stopped training already. I only ever train combinations in between them from time to time at this point. Beru's words made some eyebrows raise. But aren't heroes supposed to constantly train? What if one day a villain stronger than you appear? Asked Momo. She was also a bit curious as to Beru's opinion on training and the way he managed his time. Listen, kid if, at random, a villain stronger than me appears. This country's doomed any powerful villain has already made a name for himself. A newcomer with more strength than me appearing is quite impossible in this generation. All the ones to come, considering my rate of growth, Beru's words did. Managed to give the students some perspective. Although some parts of his speech were quite sad to hear for them. To some of them, it gave them a feeling that Beru was arrogant. But, in truth, Beru was completely right. Currently, he already had enough strength to destroy Japan. If a villain stronger than him could just appear out of nowhere, then the world was simply doomed. Even then, it was near impossible for that to happen. He grew stronger and stronger each day, even when he wasn't training. And, after getting high spec, he was confident that nothing would ever be even close to matching up to him. Why would the next generations have more of a chance? Do you think we'd be able to defeat you? This one was asked by none other than Kurashima. The red-haired teen still hoped to one day be able to become Beru's equal even if he wasn't able to ever apprehend him. That's unlikely. But quirks do get stronger with each generation sooner or later. There will be a time where everyone will have as much strength as all might and they'd all die because of it. Beru left that last part unsaid. He was well aware of how dangerous the evolution of quirks was to humans. If a regular, untrained person suddenly got a strength-enhancing quirk that made him as powerful as all might well. There were a few possibilities for that person. Either all of their limbs explode when the quirk is awakened, that would be as a child. But it could also manifest later, and the user would be unable to use it properly, like Izuku. But Izuku was lucky that All Might's quirk was actually flexible in power output. Otherwise, he would never actually be able to use it. Well, he would have needed to constantly break his arms until he became able to hold back naturally. But the process would be excruciating and time-consuming. Beru looked at the discouraged students for a bit. Bakugo was about to start raging again. So the insectoid decided to offer some reassurance to the students. Don't get too sad about it. Some of you still have some chances. But if you reach that point, fighting villains will become more of a game of holding back than anything Beru obviously lied. None of the students could ever actually hope to fight him equally. But didn't need to know that. He also didn't care. If they got a bit of encouragement out of those words, then all the power to them. But otherwise, they were just empty words. Still, they made some of the students smile. But there were also those with weaker quirks. They always felt inadequate when there were talks about strength. Also to those that have quirks unrelated to fighting. Don't get too discouraged. We live in modern times. Fighting strength doesn't really matter much. You can also always be a rescue hero. Beru's words didn't quite seem to reach all of the students though. But teacher, isn't finding strength important to all heroes? The one asking this time was Yida. He had been quite interested in the conversation, and he ended up butting in when Beru's words confused him. Nah, there are plenty of heroes focused solely on rescuing civilians, and doing anything other than fighting villains. Those that fight villains are just the ones more talked about. Most of the students were quite satisfied with those answers. Well, I think classes are almost over. I'll head out now. A purplish mist slowly seeped out of his mouth and started covering his body. Hey, bug freak. Don't get any ideas about being the strongest. I'll definitely surpass you. Bakugo finally slammed his hands on his desk and shouted to the disappearing Beru. Good luck with that comma he said as he waved goodbye to the rest of the students. Beru spends the rest of the day hanging out with Toga and reading hero comics that he had borrowed from Izuku's home. EOV narration. The days passed by quickly, Beru had done what he had meant to do. He informed the chief of police that Lady Nagant would give herself up, as well as the time she was going to do so. That day also came and went exactly as planned. Lady Nagant's mother was also put under surveillance and protected by the police force. It was a precaution, just in case. The commission were to try and use her to threaten Lady Nagant. The process went rather smoothly, although Lady Nagant's capture had yet to be announced to either the public or the higher-ups in the police force. The entire arrest and interrogation were secretive to avoid giving the commission any chance to prepare for it. But, currently, none of that was truly interesting to Beru. He had done his part. There was little he could do to help Lady Nagan at this point. Although he did have a plan to avoid any phone calls that Wyama would give him when the interrogation results were publicized. That was to happen only after all of the evidence against the commission was gathered up though. Currently, Beru was just lazing around all until he remembered something. He still needed to contact Jory to give him the quirks and start actually helping him. It's not like he had completely forgotten. Beru had been speed reading quite a few science notebooks and studying a lot about quirks. Ironically, he also studied the books written by one called Ruma Yujiko, who was just the alias of Kaede Garaki. He ended up learning from the works of one of the people he hated most. So, now, Beru got out of bed for once, no need to get out of bed to read, and decided to visit Yuri, to see how that guy was doing. A few hours before that, in a different place, another person gained a piece of information. It told him that the largest research institute in Japan was holding an army of mutants with multiple quirks. 
that had been created by the most infamous villain of the past, all for one. That person was Re Destro. He looked at the information with a smile. With this, the Meta Liberation Army will have its forces enhanced greatly acquiring. The information itself wasn't exactly difficult. A member of their organization, a person posing as a hero called Sliding Go, had been a part of the raid on the place where the Gnomus were being kept. It still took a bit for them to learn where the Gnomus were taken, but they managed to find out, as Trumpet also managed to somewhat join the political rankings as the governor of a small city. It was by no means a high position, at least not for the aspirations of the Meta Liberation Army, but it gave them a platform to spread their ideas to the world. Using Trumpet's quirk building an army wasn't impossible, Trumpet just needed to lure them in. As long as people were willing to listen to him, their ideas were going to be spread throughout the public. They had plans to create the most powerful army possible, as it was necessary for them to turn their current society on its head. They had quite a few heroes to face, and Re Destro had yet to find any contingency plan in case Beru also became involved in their operation. So, for now, Re Destro needed to do his best to acquire more powerful subordinates. He was sure that he'd find a way to command the Gnomus, he just needed to think of who to send to capture the Gnomus. Thankfully, he had plenty of new members of the army to test. And, thanks to his newly appointed executive twice, he didn't actually need to lose anything during the attack, even if it was to fail. So, he had no reason not to attack that research center and take all of the Gnomus. And so, he started moving his people. He told Twice to start making copies of their strongest fighters. Jeetan, Darby, Moonfish were also on that list. But there were quite a few more. There was no reason for them to hold back since they weren't losing anything. Re Destro still didn't send any of the executive members, as those were too important to reveal so quickly. But still, their attack force was much greater than the defenses of the research center could be prepared for. EOV Jeetan. All of my life, I spend it pursuing strength. The power of my meta ability is everything to me. It's what I dedicated my life towards constantly improving. And yet, that insect has managed to defeat so many clones of mine. It's infuriating really. The leader has told us that he would send clones out once more. I don't want to remain behind at base. And just look like versions of myself lose to others. I know I am stronger than any fate could ever be. I know that I am stronger than any pro hero. I just need an opportunity to prove it. Maybe I'll get a chance this time. EOV narration. Sneaking into the large crowd of clones was by no means difficult for Jeetan to do. He even convinced one of them to remain to replace him. Their modes of transportation were quite a lot better than Jeetan had expected. A lot of the clones were going to be carried over to a close spot by helicopter. It was close. But it wasn't close enough for the helicopters to even be heard by the people inside the research center. The rest of the journey was traversed in various vans. It was pretty clear that those vans were made to hold the Gnomus, a lot of clones were going to remain behind, and hold back any heroes that were to come. Namely, all of the clones of people like Moonfish and Darby. They were both really violent and extremely combat ready. There were plenty of people cloned this time, and many of them were capable of serving as drivers too, in case they were needed. This is going to be so fun I wonder how many of them I'll be able to take down said one of the Darby clones that was sitting in the same van. The clones didn't really bother hiding their thirst for blood behind the usual cold facade of the original. Their mission was quite clear to them, take as many down as you can, and die while doing so. The clones were just like the original in both memories and appearance. But their strength was weaker. Jeetan just looked at the way the clones spoke to each other with interest. Twice as ability is truly powerful, worthy of being one of the executives. The ice ability user was one of the people that considered strength to be everything. Ever since young, all he had done was train his meta ability. And, now that he was strong, he was confident that he could help bring about a society ruled by the power of meta abilities, which was the goal of the Meta Liberation Army. He was proud of the strength he had. That's why it was frustrating for him to watch Beru just defeat so many of his clones with ease. Even if he considered Beru's ability to be powerful, he didn't think that he would lose so drastically to anyone. And, in truth, he also didn't believe that Beru would be able to actually defeat him, if he were there in person. The fact that he hadn't seen the aftermath of Beru's final attack during that first internship incident certainly strengthened his view that his chances of winning were still possible. But all of that was going to start shattering soon, as the clones all arrived at their location and jumped out of the vans. They charged the entrance with great speed, a Darby clone melting the door, and the people guarding it at the same time. The alarm was instantly sounded as the person watching the CCTVs was wide awake and prepared for such occasions. The personnel defending the facility were all highly trained. Some even managed to fight back against the clones. Some even managed to take down a few. But they were all swarmed by the army of fighters that had no fear of death. The security systems of the laboratory were also triggered, after the clones managed to melt through the door to the main lobby of the laboratory. There, the clones, as well as the original Jeetan, could all see the sum of the Gnomus were still standing there motionlessly. They could see scientists scampering about everywhere. They were all trying to flee into other side rooms, hoping to find some type of safety. Only one person was so entranced with his research that he didn't even look in the direction of the explosions or the footsteps that came towards him. Ha! Huh. Look at this idiot. He's just ignoring us. The clone of a random member of the army pointed at the scientist. The scientist was a plain-looking middle-aged man, 
he seemed to be in the middle of looking at the muscle structure of one of the gnomus. The clone that spoke sneered after seeing that the scientist still ignored it. He quickly slapped his arm onto the papers that the scientist was holding up. Yuri finally looked up, he noticed quickly that he was surrounded by villains. He had always had a habit of not paying any attention to his surroundings. After looking at the state of the laboratory he just sighed a bit. Such troublesome guests? He looked at them as they struggled to free all of the gnomus from their bindings. Most of them were bound to tables, just as a safety precaution. But the cuffs holding them were all melted. Yuri looked around the lab, he calmly got up. The villain clone that had been shouting at him instantly attacked him. It raised its fist and tried to crush his head with his punch. The original had some type of strength enhancing quirk. The fist made contact with the doctor's nose. The clone was instantly propelled backwards, as the scientist just shook his head. That's no way to greet someone. Yuri's fingers turned black, they extended and impaled as many of the clones as possible. All of the clones around him had turned into a viscous liquid, soon after Yuri swung them into the ceiling. I really hate to ruin my laboratory like this. But I guess it can't really be helped. The scientist looked at the villains as both of his arms got larger, almost like balloons. The real Jeton just smiled. Finally, someone that I can prove myself with. He didn't know what he was getting into. EOV narration. Yuri had an uninterested look on his face as he looked at the hundreds of enemies swarming his laboratory. Still, on the inside, he wasn't quite as calm. He didn't have much combat training. To begin with, he was a researcher. He disliked the brutality that came with fights. The only reason he could confidently stand his ground was that he had managed to copy every quirk that All for One had in possession. Currently, the middle-aged scientist was technically stronger than All for One was when he had faced Beru, but his lack of experience still showed in the way he used his quirks. The only thing that allowed him to be at least somewhat confident was the fact that All for One gave the user a somewhat basic understanding of the quirks that they had stolen. It was bare bones at best, and the scientist didn't even know how to make combinations with the quirks he possessed. Well, he knew how to do so in theory. But he had no actual practice doing so. Something else encouraged him. It told him that he could somehow fight back the aggressors. From his point of view, the people attacking the research center were just clones. He had seen a similar incident on the news a few months back. But he hadn't expected them to target his laboratory. The villains were clearly after the Gnomus. And, thankfully, they all seemed to be somewhat fragile in comparison to an actual human. So, the researcher enlarged his arms, charging up his air cannon, as he pointed his palms at the approaching villains. Behind him was a steel wall. He released the air cannon as soon as the clones got close to him. The compressed air blew away all of the villains that had tried to attack him. But that trick wouldn't work against the more experienced fighters. From a distance, a few Darby clones started sending streams of blue flames towards the scientist. In a panic, Yuri quickly directed a weaker air cannon at the floor. The blast hit the floor and raised a few metal tiles in front of him, but it wasn't anywhere near enough to stop the wall of flames. The flames quickly melted through that makeshift defense as well as the floor around them, and were quickly approaching Yuri. Using a flight quirk, the scientist quickly took off. He flew over the stream of flames and floated in mid-air for a bit as he charged yet another air cannon. He gritted his teeth as he watched a few of the gnomus being carried off. He was about to release another air cannon in the crowd, but from the side, dozens of razor-sharp teeth impaled his arm, directing it at a wall. As the compressed air was released, thankfully, Yori couldn't feel the pain, but he still winced when seeing his injuries. He quickly flexed his hand and broke the teeth that were impaling it. The wounds closed up quickly, but he could feel his stamina being drained. He looked at the crowd more warily this time. He realized that his chances of winning against such numbers were extremely low, but that realization wasn't a pleasant one for him. Suddenly, a pillar of ice rose towards him, freezing him and any clones that had stood in its way. Cheetan was finally done watching the fight, he entered the fray and looked at the scientist with a smile on his face. I'll prove it to you I am the strongest. His indiscriminate use of his own quirk had taken out quite a few of the clones around him. Thankfully, he wasn't exactly in the middle of them. Still, the clones weren't pleased, they were just like the real counterparts after all. What the hell are you doing you, idiot? Asked a derby clone as it melted itself out of Jeetan's eyes. Jeetan, however, chose to ignore the clones shouting at him. They weren't important to him. All that was important was the opponent in front of him. Yori was at first panicking when on the ice. But then he realized that he could still somewhat move around. He broke the ice using yet another air cannon. By now, the Jeton clones were also joining the fray. They had originally been helping with the transportation of Gnomus. But, now they had to join in, as their fighting spirit was stirred by Yuri's struggle. The scientist realized that the situation was looking bleaker and bleaker for him. Slowly, he prepared to try and combine a few quirks within his body, hoping to find something to get him out of the situation. But he wasn't going to receive any lenience. Jeton had walked on his own ice to reach him. Then he rose a pillar of ice out of the side of the glacier he had created and crushed Yuri into the wall. Once again, Yuri broke through the ice. This time, he just enhanced a regular punch with a few strength enhancing quirks. I guess you're quite resilient, huh? Let's see how long you're going to hold this up, Jeton said with a smile underneath his hood. Yuri just grit his teeth once more. He looked at Jeton, but he didn't even get to make a move before dozens of razor sharp teeth nailed him into the wall. He could see the moonfish clones raising themselves in the air with their own teeth and attacking him at the same time. For a second, a thought appeared in his mind. I'm pretty screwed, aren't I? Jeton prepared for another attack, this time preparing a spike out of his ice. Yuri just closed his eyes and braced for impact. Then he heard a loud crashing sound, then a few screams. He could feel some wind on his face. 
He opened his eyes to see Beru's wings silently flapping in front of him. He saw the giant ice spike had hit Beru on the torso, only to crack completely in all places. And what the hell is even happening here? Asked Beru as he looked at his surroundings. He had just walked himself in the research center only to run into this scene. It's this freak. Everyone get in position. Shouted one of the villain clones when seeing Beru. They had somewhat rehearsed for a plan, just in case he appeared. Instantly all of the teeth holding Yori up were cracked completely. He was going to fall on the ground. But Beru caught him by the collar and placed him down instead. The scientist panted as he touched the ground. Damn I regret not training beforehand. He said as he looked at the surrounding villains. They seemed to have taken some sort of cohesive battle formation. The ones that were more endurant were at the front while the ranged fighters raised ice platforms to shoot from afar. They took the gnomus don't let them get away. Beru's eyes widened as he heard what Yuri told him. Then his eyes narrowed, he looked at the hundreds of villains surrounding him with spite. He walked Yuri away to a hospital somewhere in Tokyo. Then he turned around to see a large pillar of ice approaching him. He didn't even bother responding to the attack. As soon as the glacier hit him, he just used impact recoil and it shattered, much like the previous spike that he had blocked. Yo Vegeta, this man why must he stand in front of me right now? I was so close to proving myself that scientist turned out to be much weaker than expected. Though no, that's just because these clones keep interfering with my fight. I guess this works too though. I'll pay him back for defeating my clones. I'll show him that my meta ability is second to none. EOV Beru, really? What the hell is even this? Why does everyone suddenly care about the Nomus? Is this really so important that they'd orchestrate this large an attack? I mean, I guess they are basically stronger than most regular quirk users. But if being able to order them was so simple then Yori would have just commanded them to fight the clones. I guess the one that orchestrated the attack has a way to control them. I can't be sure. I should take out the villains in this building for now. I can still sense survivors inside it. If there were casualties even after I arrived at the scene that would be quite regretful. So how do you dogs want to die? He asked while looking at the clones. None of them made the first move. Unfortunately for them, Beru didn't have any will to stop and chat with them. He spread his hands and flames came out of both of them. He was like a large flame drow. Beru burned through the vanguard clones quite quickly. He watched as they screamed and melted like butter. But his flames were stopped, a row of Jeetan clones had built proper defenses against his flames. And he couldn't quite raise the temperature too much, not with the survivors still in the building somewhere. He just sighed as a few dozen elongated teeth came in his direction from above. The Moonfish clones were still in raising themselves. And, accompanying them, a few Jeetan clones tried to encase him from the side, while Darby clones attacked him with fire from the other. He just stomped on the ground, the pressure created by his stomp broke the ice and the teeth approaching him. It also briefly dispersed the flames, just enough time for Beru to jump in the air, and send a punch towards the Moonfish clones. That single punch crushed the clones into the wall, breaking all of their teeth and turning them into much. A lot of the clones were also pushed back by the attack. Then, as Beru landed, dozens of clones swarmed him. A few seemed to have blades sticking out of their body, the others seemed to be strength quirks. Beru just sighed. Tails sprouted out of his body in every direction. They pierced the surrounding clones and extended all across the room. Many clones tried to dodge around and avoid them, but they weren't able to do so forever. The tails followed them, and more tails grew out of the already existing tails. It was like a tree growing more branches. Most of the clones in that room were taken out on that way. Beru slowly pulled all of his tails back. They seemed to be absorbed back into his body as he looked around. There were countless puddles of viscous liquid on the ground. The clones had mostly been killed, but one of them still walked towards him, confidently. I must say it was quite interesting to see you dispatch so many clones. Let's see how you fare against a real opponent though. The one speaking was obviously Jeetan. Beru just rolled his eyes and prepared for the fight. Why do things always have to end with fights? That was the only thought in his mind. EOV Jeetan. I walked out of the room. I did that to wait for the crowd of clones to thin out. I wasn't expecting it to be done so quickly. But this is Beru after all. He is known mostly for his strength. His past doesn't matter to me. But I will prove that I am stronger than him now. Even if I have to risk my life while doing so, I will show him that my meta ability is much stronger than his POV narration. Jeetan walked in front of Beru, staring him in the eyes. He didn't know what to expect. But he knew that Beru wasn't going to be an easy fight. So he was going to treat it seriously. But nothing could have prepared him for what was to come. As soon as he took a step to freeze the floor, he heard something strange. A thud, something heavy falling on the floor. With the corner of his eye, he could see Beru just casually passing him by. Looking down, he could see that he was missing a hand. He immediately started clutching his stump as he screamed in pain. Beru just whistled as he continued walking out. But Jeetan wasn't done. He quickly got over the shock of losing an arm. He immediately started trying to turn around, wanting to take the insectoid hero by surprise. Only to slip and fall. He directed his gaze at his legs. They were clearly cut from his knees. He had been standing on on his already dismembered legs unknowingly. Suddenly, Beru stopped. He looked at his hand, the claw he had used to slice up Jeetan was bloody. Huh? You're not a clone? He asked as he turned around. He also took a lick of the blood out of instinct. He could see the villain screaming on the ground, in a puddle of his own blood. He tilted his head in confusion. Shit, I thought he was just a clone, I wouldn't have been this brutal if I knew he was the original. Well, I doubt I'll lose too much reputation for this. It's considered a dire situation after all. Plenty of heroes have killed on the job before. Jeetan just grunted when hearing Beru, his only thoughts were. I was careless. 
I underestimated him too much. If I don't hit him with my strongest, then I will definitely get captured here. He quickly rose his wounds closed. Then he made himself prosthetic legs out of ice and shakily got up. He moved his arm around. He quickly formed a dragon out of ice cubes while looking at Beru with anger. Die. He shouted as he sent the massive dragon ice construct hurtling towards Beru. The insectoid just sighed while shaking his head. Villains never learn man. They just never know when to sit down well. I guess I can do a charitable act and remind him that sleeping on the floor is sometimes more comfortable than dying. Apostrophe Beru instantly exhaled some mist around his body. A dragon made out of fire started twirling around. It was small, but its rotation speed was great. Beru used high spec and concentrated. He could see the things around him moving so slowly. The dragon was advancing towards him so slowly that it almost made him yawn. He quickly started speeding up the dragon around him, slowly but surely. It reached a speed that Beru found satisfactory. During its last rotation, it slingshot itself towards Jitan and his dragon. It greatly expanded in the process, becoming twice as large as Jitan's. Beru turned off high spec, and just watched the clash happen in real time. The two dragons collided. The wave of steam that released for the collision made Jitan shoot backwards. Beru himself just stood still as a statue, while watching his fire completely engulf Jitan's special attack. The ice quickly started melting, turning into water, then into steam. The dragon that was built out of fire quickly advanced, losing its form, and just turning into a high-pressured stream of fire. Jitan, in a panic, erected dozens of ice walls in front of him, trying his best to block the attack. But all of the ice melted as soon as it came in contact with the flames. Beru was contemplating whether or not to let the villain turn to ash. After a few milliseconds of deliberation, he decided that letting the villain die would be counterproductive. He didn't know if he could find anyone else that he could interrogate about the group that kept harassing Japan with clones. Jitan watched as the flames approached him to his ice walls. He gritted his teeth and closed his eyes as the flames came closer and closer to burning him alive. At that moment, he regretted ever attempting something so foolish. He regretted not properly looking into Beru beforehand. He regretted that his obsessive desire for power had guided him to his death. He regretted that even with all of the time he had spent training, he was still so weak. But it was far too late for revelations. At least that was what he thought. As soon as he closed his eyes, a purple mist enveloped his body and warped the fire from around him outside. It formed a perfect shield that teleported all of the fire away from his body. But the sheer temperature left him with a few burns. In the end, he collapsed on the floor after Beru's fire attack had ended. Beru took a few steps towards him, checked on him, just to make sure he would survive. He then walked out of the building and looked around. There were still numerous clones running around. Some of them were dragging along Nomis, throwing the poor experiments into the vans, then turning around to grab more. Beru quickly jumped into the fray. Just in his appearance, he directed dozens of clones that were carrying Nomis. He then released a screech. The sound was so powerful that it made the clones stop to cover their ears almost instantly. The ones closest to Beru just turned into mush at that sound. What other attacks do I have to take care of these clones? Well, I guess I could try out my new quirk. He put both of his hands on the ground. Around him, everything was quickly covered in a layer of ice, including the cars and the clones. Even the Nomis, Beru didn't really have enough control to not hurt them yet. But he did warp all of the Nomis back into the laboratory. So, most of them just ended up with a frozen limb or two. Beru looked around the outside of the building. He could see the bodies of all of the guards that were either burned or frozen to death, crushed and paled. Beru just sighed at the sight of their bodies. He slowly turned back to the building. He proceeds to do his job as a hero, helping the rest of the surviving people inside that research center, warping them to either hospitals or the police respectively. The authorities also arrived on the scene. They were extremely happy to apprehend the unconscious Jitan, although the villain was quickly sent to a hospital to avoid his death. Beru then decided to walk outside, his job was mostly done. But the second he stepped foot outside, he could see countless camera flashes and he heard many shudder sounds. He looked at the reporters, all of them were standing in the icy landscape he had created outside, without a care in the world. Sir Beru, would you like to give us a statement about this organization that you just faced? One of the reporters made her way towards Beru, and asked him that question. Many followed after her and asked differing questions about the villains, the casualties. They all had one thing in common, they were interested in reporting on the situation. Beru responded to them the best he could. If he just ignored them he would seem rude. It was his fault that he walked outside anyway. He had hoped that the media wouldn't get there so quickly. He wanted to see if he could melt the ice around the building before he left. Now he was thinking of what walls to bang his head on to get the questions over with faster. Time passes faster when you're knocked out. However, not all questions were friendly. One reporter seemed to be quite confrontational, actually. He was trying his best to provoke a reaction out of Beru. And where were you when the attack started? And all of the hard-working guards were unfortunately killed. The middle-aged man with a bald spot in the middle of his head just got ignored at first. But then some other reporters started asking similar questions, seemingly stirred by the balding man. Beru was on the verge of rolling his eyes at them. He didn't even know what response they were expecting. But, it grew to the point where he couldn't really ignore the question anymore. So, where were you? Asked one of the reporters, repeating what the others said like a choir boy during a sermon. 
That's a stupid question that you guys are stupid for asking at this point. Why not blame all the heroes that never even appeared? Ash, I just happened to pass by at this time, that's it. Beru waved the angry gasps and the responses he got as he looked around the field. He checked on all of the frozen clones, making sure that all of them had turned to liquid before starting to melt all of the ice. The reporters cleared the field after seeing that he was working. They didn't want to stand in front of his fire after all. After he was finished, he just walked away, leaving Jeetan with the police and the reporters with a lot of things to write about. EOV Beru. It's already been two days since all of that went down. And, I must say, the situation turned out to be such a mess I was just going to give Yuri the quirks and officially start talking about our cooperation. I certainly wasn't expecting to find him fighting an army of villains. Well, villain clones, but still. Not only that, before I came, the clones actually managed to get a few of the gnomus away from the scene. I couldn't find them after searching the perimeter properly. I couldn't even find the vans to track their smell. So that kinda made me a bit mad. It's not like I took my time with the villains or anything. I think I just arrived at the scene too late. Well, it doesn't really matter if I think about it. They will get to interrogate that ice quirk guy that I accidentally dismembered. They should be able to get the location of the organization. I won't mind going there myself and fighting, but there most likely will be a raid party. I wonder why there even was an original among those guys I mean. The rest were all clones. What's the point of going there in person if you can send clones? Now that I think about it, I might want that clone quirk. Seems pretty useful well. The clones still seem to have a personality. I'm assuming they might retain the one of the original. That might make things hard for me. It would be hard to convince a version of myself to do any kind of work. But hey, I can at least try. Maybe I can coax myself into doing some work. Who knows? But oh well, look at me, already thinking what I'm going to do with their quirks before I even met them. I wonder who these guys are though. I guess I'll have to wait a bit to find out. I mean, I'm not exactly proficient in interrogation. I mean, I can make a few thugs speak and break a few fingers, but that's about it really. I'm sure the police has something to help to smooth things over in an interrogation. I'm pretty sure things went smoothly with Lady Nagant's interrogation too. But I want to actually know for sure. I'll have to pay the chief of police to learn more about it well. Why not do it now? I've nothing pressing to do right now. Yori is currently resting. The fighting took a bit of a strain on him. He's pretty strong. But he got trashed quite severely. His lack of experience is what decided the fight. I didn't realize he had all of the quirks all for one had. But if he could actually use them as effectively as all for one could well. The clones would have been the ones being thrashed around. Now that I think about it. He should already have life force one of the quirks I was planning to give him. So I don't have to worry about a way to take that quirk out of me. Really, Yori needs some combat training well. I would actually make him train some practical combat skills first. Then get into actual fighting quirks. Well, he's got a lot of improving to do. But I also am quite busy. So I might not be of much help to him. I'm sure the current Yori should be able to handle most things. But being severely outnumbered by enemies that all have decently powerful offensive quirks and experience using them is too much for him. Oh well, at least he's fine. Still, a lot of people died. And it seems that the media didn't quite like my response to their last question. They wrote some not very friendly articles about me. Some said that my negligence might have even caused some casualties. But the chief of police made a statement that cleared things up. He said that the people that survived only did so because of my interference and heroic acts. So the negative articles of the butthurt journalists were drowned out by positive ones from people that appreciated my efforts. I was honestly not even expecting to receive help from the police. The chief wasn't exactly friendly to me the last time I met him with my actual identity. This time isn't that though. I walked myself outside of the police HQ. I transformed into a random thug and started flying towards his window. EOV narration. Kenji, the chief of police, was having an extremely busy week. Not only was he preoccupied building a case against the Hero Public Safety Commission, but there was also a major villain attack towards one of the most important places in Japan. The situation was quite busy, and it only got busier as the days went by. He was also forced to give a statement to stop the attacks of the press on Beru. It wasn't out of the kindness of his own heart, truth be told, Kenji didn't quite like Beru. He considered the insectoid to be a bit too impulsive and irresponsible. But he knew that letting the media bash on him would only make heroes in general look even worse. Now, the chief was just sitting at his desk taking a bit of a breather before getting back to work. He looked down at his hands for a second only to hear the familiar knocking sound on his desk. He gulped as he felt some sweat on his back turning around slowly. He could see the window was once again open, and in front of his desk stood a very unfamiliar person. Well, at least unfamiliar in that form. The man didn't greet him with as one would a stranger. Kenji, it's truly been a while the man's voice was playful, and it didn't fit his face at all. Still, the chief of police could tell who it was. The shape-shifting giant that had contacted him for that mysterious organization. The only thing on his mind now was, why is he here? Do they want more from me? He was anxious and somewhat on edge by the appearance of the villain in his office. Don't be so on edge. I'm just here to check on our agreement this time. The voice of the villain becomes significantly higher in pitch. Kenji could recognize that it was the voice of a woman. Yet, the villain still had the body of a man. The chief of police found it quite unnerving. I see what exactly does your organization want from me. 
he said while looking at the shapeshifter in front of him with a serious gaze. Nothing more than the initial agreement to be respected. I'm sure you've already gotten the information you wanted from Lady Nagant. You probably understand why our organization started moving against the commission. Beru's words rang into that small office. They weren't loud by any means, just enough for Kenji to hear them. Kenji just sighed when he heard them. The testimony that Lady Nagant provided somewhat solidified the fact that this mysterious organization had a good reason to be going after the commission. Not only were the Hero Public Safety Commission responsible for the deaths of countless villains and corrupt heroes, but they were also engaging in what some would call preventive culling, where targets would be deemed dangerous before they even did anything, and would be dealt with appropriately. The information made Kenji harbor even more hatred towards the commission. He didn't really hate all of its employees or something, but he didn't think their leadership was innocent enough to be allowed to escape prosecution. We will proceed as agreed I only have one question. What will your B organization be doing? Kenji asked while starting the villain boldly in the eyes. For now, we had decided to wait to see how the situation unfolds. It's easy to speculate on how the commission will respond to these accusations, but we can't know what they will do for sure. Beru's words were just a roundabout way of saying he wasn't going to do anything, and Kenji could see that, but he couldn't really call them out on it, nor did he think that the organization could do much in this situation. They were basically letting it into the hands of the Japanese legal system. Kenji wasn't displeased by this. No, he hoped that the organization would stop involving itself in this matter entirely. It would make their cooperation a lot more difficult to uncover. If I may, I would like your organization to not act against the commission for the time being. He decided to voice his concerns and request. He didn't actually expect it to be accepted. Of course, that was the plan. Unless the commission tries to pull off something drastic, we won't act at all. This is in your hands from here. Don't forget the reduced sentence. By the way, the shapeshifter slowly got up and patted his trousers. I won't forget about it. I promise to get Lady Nagan a reduced sentence. Psychological tests have already been issued. We can already tell that she's not a danger to anybody. It also helps that she gave herself in. Makes my job much easier. He said while heaving a relaxed sigh when seeing that the villain was about to depart. Of course, take care, Chief. Your life may be in danger when this goes live. But I'm sure you already knew the dangers of this. We'll do our best to prevent any attacks on your life. Beru started walking towards the window and slowly leaned out. Kenji sighed and blinked once. The shapeshifter had disappeared just like that. No wonder they never managed to catch that guy. Kenji was by no means scared for his life. He was well aware that he was going to become a target when the news of this case became public and the trial date was set. He needed to pay attention to his own safety as well as that of his family and friends. Thankfully, the organization was also going to be protecting him. If anything, he found them to be a reliable ally right now. Even if he was still quite unnerved by their messenger and quite unwilling to work with them. EOV Beru. Well, Kenji's as serious as ever. Geez, when will he learn to take a joke? I was expecting a much better reaction when I used the voice of a woman. All I got was a weird gaze. Still, I'm glad I got him on my side. Well, I technically did have to pretend to be an entire organization, but hey, if it works, then it works. At least I know for sure that Lady Nagant will be safe. I just need to make sure that Kenji is also safe. If something happens to him, then I'd be left quite empty on the board, as some would say. Oh well, there's always a risk when playing chess against people like Oyama. Thankfully, she has yet to realize that the game has started, and that will be a deciding factor in this little game. I must say, for all of my distaste for Vlad, I sure picked up a lot of stuff from him. A lot of the stuff I do I know how to do thanks to him, so I guess my time with him was at least productive. Still, it would have been nice if he didn't see all of our interactions as moves on a board, striving to gain as much of my friendship points as possible. Why? Because I was useful. Well, that's how he was at the beginning. He warmed up to me in the end, at least I think so. Well, that's enough about him. I think I'll go visit the Midoriya's. It's been a while, and I did say that I would visit them more often. I feel kinda bad about it. But things were a bit awkward with Izuku after the whole Stain incident. So I kept my distance for a while. Things should be good now, so why not give it a go?
And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.